Good morning everyone. Today it's the 21st of April, the year 2004. I'm Harry Ziegler, a volunteer at the Palm Springs Air Museum here in California. Part of our mission is to report and preserve the history of our country's military conflicts, especially World War II. As part of the Veterans History Project of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C., we conduct interviews of veterans and civilians who participated in these conflicts. Today I'm here at the museum along with fellow volunteer Dave Thompson and special guest uh, Colonel Robert uh, Newman. Neiman. Neiman. Oh, I'm sorry. N-E-I-M-A-N. Rhymes with demon. Okay. <laughs> Colonel Robert Demon Neiman. <laughs> Who was well, that? My, one of my outfits was named Neiman's Demons. That's when I had 21 motorcycle platoon. My 21 <laughs> motorcycles. That's the second lieutenant platoon leader. Well, uh, Colonel Neiman was in the tanks in the Marine Corps in World War II in the South Pacific. So we're going to talk to him about that and a lot of other things. Nice to have you here, Bob. Would you please spell your name, first name and last name? Robert, R-O-B-E-R-T, M. Neiman, N-E-I-M-A-N. And where were you born, Bob? Mount Vernon, New York. And what year was that? 1918. 1918. Can you remember much about your neighborhood, where you grew up? How, what was that well, like? I grew up more or less in many different places on the east, but all on the east coast. With the exception of Vermont, uh, I was never in a state that didn't touch the Atlantic Ocean, but I was in all of them as I was growing up. And so uh, you moved around, what you're saying, quite a bit? Yes. What was your first memory of a home that you lived in? We lived, my parents continued to live in Mount Vernon, Till I was somewhere in my, well, I was two years old and plus a few months, I suppose. And I have a vague memory. We lived in an apartment on the second story. We had a sort of a terrace with trees and a Bob White bird and my, was, would fly in those trees and my mother taught me to say Bob White. That's about the only recollection <laughs> I have. We moved the next year to New York City. Now, do you know the genetics of your mother and dad were, what, where they came from and how they got? Well, my mother was born in England and arrived in the U.S. when she was about two years old from Liverpool with her parents and an older sister. My dad was born in uh, what was sometimes Russia and sometimes Poland. And he arrived uh, here about the time of the Spanish-American War as a little boy. So, historically then, your dad would have been Polish, Russian, or Russian, one well, depending on the year. On the year. Now, did they have family already in America that drew them here? Yes, my my grandfather, my dad's father, came over with his oldest son, who was about 18 at the time, just sometime prior to the Spanish-American War, which I've mentioned. Yeah. And they enlisted in the U.S. Army, and in the Spanish-American War primarily to learn English. And uh, apparently, from what I've heard, my grandmother, his, my dad's mother, uh, was left back in their hometown with several little kids. And she'd gotten a report that her husband had been killed in the Spanish-American War, which was erroneous. So she was determined to find out for sure whether he was still alive, and if so, where was the son, who was about 18, that, that went with him? Mm -hmm. And so she packed the kids. She did quite a job, I guess, packed all the little ones up. There were about seven of them, and came to the USA. One of the, the oldest of the, of the group, who was then about nine years old, was my dad. And they, they went to New England, where, lo and behold, my, my grandfather apparently had been a cobbler. And there was a big shoe center in New England in Massachusetts, I think it was Lowell, I'm not sure. And she went there and found Grandpa was there. I guess he might have been trying to get away from his wife and kids, <laughs> I don't know. And so they stayed together from then on because I remember when they had their golden wedding anniversary. And then the other side of your family? Well, they, they were in England. My, my uh, mother's father ran a, a saloon in the U.S. and later, after Prohibition, a speakeasy, and uh, 
But anyway, they they came over from Liverpool, and how my mother and father met, I I really never knew. And so, were you a, a member of more than one person? Were there other siblings in your family? No, I was the only one. My mother required a uh, cesarean operation to produce me, and in 1918 that was an extremely serious uh, surgery. And the doctors apparently informed my father, no more children because we can't save your mother or your wife the next time around. So I was the only one. Now, can you remember your family, people talking about that big influenza? Is no, I hit? don't remember that at all. That was in 1918 yeah. when I was just born. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Maybe I thought later on in your, as you grew up, they might have been talking about Not that. Not that I can recall. And so where do you start remembering then about your, your neighborhood and the house where you lived? And well, the main thing that where I really started to uh, remember our neighborhood and the surroundings and my, the kids who were my playmates, so to speak, was when I was four years old, we'd been living in Manhattan, uh, something in the economy caused my parents to move to Brooklyn, to Flatbush, to a single family home in a single family neighborhood instead of an apartment in Manhattan. And uh, I grew up there from the age of four until I went away to school, which was when I was nine years old. Apparently my parents' the economy had come back. They moved to a rather, uh, I would say, luxurious apartment hotel in Manhattan and sent me to St. John's Military School up and up the new, I went up the river, as it was, to Ossining, New York, the home of Sing Sing, but also the home of St. John's. Now, what was your dad doing at this time? He was a ma manufacturer of women's clothing. He, he actually owned the company? Yes. And did your mother then stay at home, or was she part of that? No, she had gone to work uh, in that industry, but an entirely separate from my dad. No, connect, no business connection between the two. She was. She ultimately was a for many many years a stylist, and she ran that. She was the stylist for what in those days was the principal uh, manufacturing company of uh, high-priced ladies' clothing called Maurice Rentner, and she. I guess she was Rentner for thirty or forty years as their stylist, and she used to go to Europe every year to. Uh, the Couturiers in Paris. That was before the Italians and uh, the French got, I mean the Italians and the British got too much involved in uh, women's stylish clothing. And uh, it was all in Paris. And, but at any event, uh, they were in the same general industry but in different parts of it and, and never the same company. When you use the term stylist, would you explain that a little bit? Well, as I had, I was never in the industry, so yeah. I'm not uh, too hip on it. But basically, in a uh, in a company such as Rentner, which set the fashions for for the country each year, there was one stylist who determined what kind of styles they would have, and she would, and I'm referring now to my mother, she would go to Europe in the spring with, a, with two or three of their designers who were designers for the firm. And they would go there and uh, visit the couturiers uh, who would have their, their annual fashion show, as it were. In those days, as I understand it, the women, the, the uh, couturiers who were the, the leading dress design home houses would manufacture a line of clothing, usually very expensive, only for the very rich, really. But it would set the style for the for everyone. And the U.S. firm, such as Rentner, which was one of the main, probably the leader, would send their own stylist and usually a couple of uh, designers along with her to uh, go to these couturiers and decide what they saw they thought could be more or less copied for 
manufacturing sale in the U.S. on a, on a ready-to-wear basis because Terrier stuff was all made to measure. And it's a slightly different industry, but they set the style, and the stylists had to determine what styles that they saw they liked and how they might modify them for the U.S. market. So at what age were you then when you went up the river? <laughs> I was nine. Nine, and was that selected to get you out of the house so they could not worry about where you were going to be? At well, I the day? presume that probably had something to do with it, sure. So would you say then that your neighborhood was more upscale uh, where you were living? and that was, uh, It was when they, when they moved, when my folks moved back to Manhattan this was 1927, I guess, and uh, they moved into a very upscale area in a, in a quite a fancy apartment hotel, and uh, apparently they were financially doing well, uh, well enough to send me to an expensive military school at a tender age of uh, nine. Now, what did you think of military school? Didn't I loved it. It was a great thing. I uh, I loved my parents, but I. Uh, I like the school. The school, as was customary in those days, and probably still today, I'm not sure, the main student body of cadets, as they were called, were uh, academically were high school types, from the ninth grade to the uh, through high school, through, through the twelfth, and some uh, who had even graduated from high school uh, when we're doing some postgraduate work to get into a, a particular school, maybe the uh, West Point or Annapolis or, or some other uh, civilian college, and uh, they, but there was a uh, junior school as part of it. Uh, there were the this whole student body was probably around 300 and some cadets, of which there were 20 of us in the grammar school category. We were in a separate barracks or building. We even had, believe it or not, a house mother who was there to see that we didn't miss our own mother too much. And, uh, but uh, I, I never really missed my parents. I loved them, but I enjoyed being away from them as well. So what kind of subjects, as a grammar student, in a military school would you have had? Well, of course, we had the usual, you know, the schools had to be accredited. We had whatever the academic requirements were for our particular grade level. But we also had classes in, uh, well, I, would, I don't know whether to call them classes or not. We learned all the military drills, close order drill, some extended order formations. We fired on the rifle range. By the way, all of this, the cadets in the senior school were issued rifles, which they kept through the school year. They were all the standard Springfield 03 30 caliber rifle. We in the junior school were issued wooden guns, believe it or not which were lighter, I guess that's why they did that, and they couldn't be fired. But we fired a 22 on the rifle range, nonetheless, with instructions as to how to do it and so forth. So, how long then did you stay in that particular school? Well, I stayed there two years, and one thing that, the, the, the biggest thing, there are two things about that first year that might be of some note. Students were not supposed to smoke, even in the senior school. But those kids all did smoke, and we little ones would go follow them in, in between classes. They'd go to the men's room and take a few whiffs of a cigarette. We would follow them in and sort of beg a, a, uh, a little whiff from, a, from their butt before it was to be thrown away. When, and so we decided, when I say we, my roommate, my roommate that first year, was a fellow by the name of Alan Crosland, whose father was a quite a, a an important director in Hollywood, and uh, he and I were buddies, and we shared a room together, and we decided before we had about a three-week Christmas vacation, before going home, we got all the kids in the junior school in our room, and we all decided that. We shouldn't have to beg a drag off the butt of the older boys. We should be able to have our own cigarettes. But we couldn't buy them because in those days there were no vending machines and you could only buy cigarettes in a, in a cigar store, as they were called, and they wouldn't sell them to little kids. 
So we decided we would uh, systematically raid our parents' cigarette boxes during the Christmas vacation. In those days, unlike today, every home on the coffee table in the living room, there was a cigarette box containing roughly a pack of cigarettes, and any guests that came were immediately offered a cigarette from the cigarette box. So we would take a few each day, and my roommate and I did it. None of the other kids followed through, although they all said they would. We got back to school after Christmas, first night. We had uh, all the kids in the junior school in our room, and we handed out cigarettes, and everybody was puffing away. Then call the quarters blue, and they had to go up to their own rooms, and we had to get ready for taps. And so uh, we had, take, we had a, a room at the end of, of the hall, and the, all of the faculty at St. John's, which was normal in a military school in those days, were either, uh, they were mainly reserve officers from the Army, a couple on active duty that were assigned there, the rest were just, but they were all reserve officers, and they were in uniform with their rank, because we wore uniforms all day. And uh, they would inspect sometime after taps, just to make sure you were in your sack. So we were prepared for that. We had a box of uh, cereal Rice Krispies, which made a crinkle, crackle, pop noise if you walked on them. We sprinkled them down the hall about 20 feet from our door, because we were at the end of the hall. Although we would hear a faculty member coming to make an inspection, and we lay both lying in bed, smoking away like mad. And uh, it was, of course, this was in January, the end of the Christmas vacation, and all of a sudden, we heard this crackle, crunch, pop, somebody was coming. So we immediately, in each bed, threw our cigarettes, which were on the night table between the beds, threw them under the pillow and pretended to be asleep. And the door opened, the faculty member saying, where is the fire, where is the fire? And then he quickly smelled it as tobacco smoke. And he realized what was going on. And we had the window closed because it was damn cold outside, which was a mistake on our part. My roommate's bed was closest to the door. So we picked him up, shaking him, Where, who's been smoking in here? And all his cigarettes that were, were uh, well, before the cigarettes fell, my roommate just went like that, pointing to me. <laughs> and so the faculty member dropped him, came over and picked me up, and all the cigarettes fell. He hauled me down to the commandant's office, and this was a very serious event. And even the senior school were not supposed to smoke, although they all did. But the little juniors, this was it. <laughs> this was bad. So he called. It must have been around 11 o'clock at night. He called my parents on the phone. That is the uh, commandant. Told my dad to prepare to come and pick me up the next morning and take me home. I was being bounced out. But my dad, I guess, was a good enough salesman to convince him. Besides, I suppose they liked the tuition money. Yeah. He, anyway, he convinced him to give me another chance. So they. Uh, put me under arrest, as, it, as they called it, which meant that except for classes and meals, I had to remain in my room for a two-week period. It was two weeks of rest. And I never smoked again until I was quite a bit older. But that was, that was the, an early event my first year. The first year closed on a more, well, I would say a more upbeat note. The, uh, on graduation day, when the kids from the senior school would be graduating, uh, commencement type of thing, there were all kinds of exhibits and contests and parades and whatnot as the parents came up to watch their children graduate or, if they were not graduating, participate in these various events. And in the junior school, we had an um, elimination contest in the Manual of Arms. And all of the 20 kids were lined up in two, two lines of 10 each, about maybe 10 yards or so apart, facing each other, and about a yard between each one. And uh, with our rifles, in our dress uniform, we had three uniforms, by the way, dress uniform, a regular uniform, and the fatigues for the rifle range and things like that. In any event, uh, this was to be a contest on the elimination contest on the manual of arms, and several faculty members were in the middle between the two 
two lines, judging to see who might make a mistake. And we all started out, I guess, in order on some, I don't remember what we started as. And one of the faculty members would give a command, such as right shoulder arms, or port arms, or uh, parade rest, or whatever. And we had to make the change from whatever position we were in to the new command. And we had to do it the right time. He would say, port arms. If you moved too early or too late, or you didn't move correctly from the position you were in to port arms, you were kicked out. And lo and behold, I was the sole survivor. And I won the contest and was promoted to corporal right then and there and given sets of stripes for all three uniforms and took them home with me and my grandmother sewed them on my uniforms for the next year. So the, the, those were the beginning and the end, so to speak, of the first year. I went back a second year and uh, as a corporal and I don't recall too much of what happened. But I enjoyed both years. So then, after you finish up at St. John's, where did you go? Well, apparently, my parents decided that the economy it was such that they were going to conserve a little. So they took me, kept me in. They moved from their very luxurious apartment hotel to a, a very nice apartment house. And uh, I mean, they were not in dire straits, but St. John's was expensive, and I spent the next three years at public school in Manhattan. And then, by then, my parents were very close to a divorce, and I guess they wanted me out of the way while all of this was going on. So they sent me, I was 14. My birthday is in September, so it always seemed to coincide with the beginning of the school year. So the day after my 14th birthday, I went away to Riverside Military Academy, which had two campuses. They, they had a trimester system, three semesters. The first semester ended with Christmas vacation, and it was in the, in the mountains in Georgia, at a, at a, just outside of a town called Gainesville, Georgia. And then the students would report back in at the end of Christmas vacation to the Florida home, Hollywood, Florida, just north of, of Miami, to spend the winter in Hollywood, Florida. And then uh, we went by what I would call troop train back to uh, Georgia for the third semester in the spring. Now, what year would you have gone to Riverside? I went down in September of 32 and finished up there in the spring of 33. So this was right in the Depression? It was in the, the depths of the Depression. So that probably was what influenced your parents in this kind of little downgrade they did to... Well, they didn't downgrade, but then they got a divorce instead. And can you remember much about the Depression? Was that well, ever... I remember a couple of things. My, I was with my mother one time when she was taking some kitchen utensil uh, appliance, I should say, either a toaster or some, something like that it to be repaired. And I remember the, the uh, she was asking with the guy who was going to repair it in some little shop how much it would be, and he told her, and she said, my God, this is a depression, I can't afford that. I didn't really understand what she was talking about. I was probably 11 at that time, but I never forgot that. But when we were in Florida, by we I mean the cadets of Riverside Military Academy, the bank holiday occurred. That was, I think, in February of 33, and we were there from early January in 33 until the spring of 33 for about three months. And when the bank holiday occurred, I don't know how much about the bank holiday you're aware of, but obviously all the banks were closed by the federal government temporarily to keep them from, too many of them were failing by people that would be a run on the bank and it would fail. So in order to stop that, President Roosevelt uh, issued a proclamation which closed, by federal order, closed all the banks. There was no bank in the United States open for a period of about a week. During that time, you couldn't write a check. Nobody would take it. And there were no credit cards then anyway. So everything was, by, was cash. And uh, a lot of people, despite the Depression, an awful lot had gone to Florida for the winter. And they, none of them probably had enough cash 
to last them forever. And when the uh, when the bank holiday occurred, in order to conserve their cash, I suppose, and there was no other way they could get any money to do anything, the lot roads were lined with thousands of people hitchhiking north. It was just an exodus of all of the, not all, but thousands of the uh, tourists spending the winter in Florida from the northeast were hitchhiking home. That I remember very well. And can you remember, did your family cook or did you have someone, uh, did your mother make meals? Or no, your... no, we always had a maid because my mother was working. That's what I was... And uh, we, uh, she, would, my mother was a very good cook, as, as a, despite that, and she would usually think the maid's cooking was lousy, so she would show her how to do it right. And, uh, but uh, with my mother had her own company for a while before joining Rentner. It was called Paula Neiman Davidson. Her name, first name, was Paula, and she had a partner by the name of Davidson. It was a small company, but they made clothes that were very well accepted by the, the uh, leading uh, department stores and so forth. And But during the depths of the Depression, they finally had to close. And then she got a, Rentner hired her when they closed their business. And she remained with Rentner, as I've already said, for 30 or some years. But uh, due to the fact that she was working, and working hard, I might say, in long hours, uh, we never, uh, she, she never had time to do any cooking. And I was a Boy Scout for a while, while during the three years, I was only home three years. And during that three year period, until I graduated from grammar school, uh, there was no junior high then, not in New York anyway. But during that period of time, uh, my mother always, uh, pardon me, we talked about cooking. On Sunday morning, since I was a Boy Scout, I would cook breakfast for the three of us, hot cakes and bacon and sausage and, and the likes, and uh, sometimes even with baked beans. Things I learned to cook to do in the Boy Scouts, because we did a lot of camping. In, New, in Manhattan, where I lived, it was, not, it was very much a built-up area, tall apartment houses, no single-family homes, not many places nearby where you could, where kids could be close to nature. So every weekend we would uh, cross the, uh, the Hudson River to Hoboken, New Jersey, on our ferry, and take the train up to upstate New York to the uh, Adirondacks and camp out for the weekend. And we'd do that over uh, Thanksgiving vacation, Christmas vacation, Easter vacation. And we had to do, of course, our own cooking, hunter style. And so when I was at home, I would duplicate that on Sunday morning. It's wonderful. Now, your, was it simply your mother and dad, or did you have any grandmothers or aunts living at home with you, or just mother no, and dad? No, none of them lived with us. They had their own homes. And you were still able to visit with grandfathers? Oh, yes, and, yeah. I never, I never did see as much of my father's parents, my grandparents on that side, as I did of my mother's. Uh, for, for reasons that I'm not, really don't recall why, I was much closer to my mother's parents, my grandmother, and uh, in fact, when I was at Riverside Military Academy, she was in the hospital, uh, actually dying, and uh, we used to correspond as though they were uh, sweethearts writing to one another. She was a great gal, and, and uh, I knew her well. Her husband, uh, my grandfather, died before she did. My grandfather on my dad's side lived to, to somewhere in his middle 90s, but he uh, he apparently had what we just figured it was old age, but now they call it Alzheimer's. He lived with an aunt and uncle of mine, a sister, my dad's youngest sister and her husband, in Mount Vernon, New York, where the whole family had lived when I was born, and many of them still live there. And uh, he was living with them, but he, they would be awake during the day, and if, in those days, delivery boys would come from the grocery store and the meat market and so forth. There were no supermarkets, of course, 
if you wanted a meat, you went to the butcher shop or so forth. But the, they would deliver. And when it, the, it got to be well known in, in Mount Vernon that if the delivery boy came to my aunt and uncle's house and they were away and only my grandpa was there, they better be ready to run because he was a big guy and had a big cane. And I'll never forget there was a picture, a cartoon on the front page of the Mount Vernon Daily Argus, which was the daily newspaper, one time, which the cartoon showed what was obviously my grandfather, it tended to be him, an old guy with a flowing beard and a big cane chasing some poor delivery boy who had an armful of groceries. <laughs> but, uh, now, can you remember what kind of cars your family drove? Does that ring any bell? I remember at various times when we lived in Manhattan, when my parents did live there almost all, all the time except for the four years that we lived in Brooklyn, they, uh, they didn't have a car during the year. To have a car in Manhattan was that you either had to be extremely rich or it didn't make any sense to have a car. There was a great subway system, there were cabs all over the place, there were buses, there were streetcars, and there was no place to park. The, you didn't have a house with a garage, everybody lived in an apartment house with maybe 30 or 40 stories, and they didn't have uh, garage accommodations. You could park in a uh, special parking, there were a few garages here and there, and they charged an arm and a leg. So my dad would buy a car in the spring, and the family would, uh, my mother and father, and along with generally another couple, would rent a home somewhere in Connecticut or out on Long Island for the summer. And they would, they, dad would buy a car and he would commute back and forth from our summer home to Manhattan in the car. And then in the fall, the family would move into a new apartment in Manhattan and sell the car back to the dealer. But the, uh, I remember in the summer of uh, 19, probably it must have been the summer of 1931, Ford came out for the first time with a V8, the Ford V8, and it was a convertible with windows and a frame uh, that, it re that later convertibles didn't have. The, uh, the windows, the frame stayed up, only the roof came back. Uh, but we had one of those in that summer of 31, and that's when I learned to drive. I was about 12 years old, and we had a, uh, a handyman at the place. We were, we were with another couple, uh, close friends of my parents, who lived just around the corner in another apartment building uh, that year. And then the next year, I think we lived in the same, each lived in the same apartment building together. But uh, we had a uh, handyman who taught me how to drive. My folks didn't know it, of course, because I was only 12 or 13. And uh, it was with the Ford V8. Late, many years later, my uh, mother's older sister, was. we had a Cadillac, or maybe it was not years later, it was years earlier. And I remember we had a summer home. I was very young. I don't remember too much about it. We had a summer home out on Long Island. And my mother's oldest sister and her husband had a summer home, my uncle, very close to us. And she was driving my dad's Cadillac one day. It was, she was down in, in the middle of the little town called Far Rockaway. And there were, there were streetcar tracks that came out into this little town, and she got caught between the two streetcars and squashed the Cadillac. <laughs> and that, that's about all I remember about our cars. So, you graduate then from a military academy and from high school? No, I, I just went to St. John, to a Riverside for one year. Okay. And while I was gone, my parents had gotten a divorce, as I said, and apparently there was a dispute between them as to where I should go. One of them wanted me to go to a New England prep school. The other one wanted me to, including me, wanted to stay at Riverside because I'd had a hell of a lot of fun down there. But it was decided that academically I wasn't learning as much as I should. 
So I went to uh, what turned out to be a very fine school in Connecticut. In Cheshire, Connecticut. The school was Roxbury School. And it was a, a special prep school for Yale. All of the uh, all of the faculty were not all of the faculty. All of the uh, many of the faculty were moonlighting at Roxbury, and were, were professors at Yale. All of the coaching staff of all of the athletic teams were from the coaching staff at Yale. Our head football coach was one of the assistant coaches at Yale, for instance. So had you picked a sport or sports by now? Yes, I participated in several. The one I went the furthest with was fencing. Uh, the, I, besides being going away to school in the, uh, in the fall until the spring, every summer, starting when I was only six years old, I went away for the summer to a boys' camp. I uh, went two years to a camp called Scatico, which was run and owned by a fellow by the name of Nat Holman, whose name may not mean anything to you because of your age. But Nat Holman at that time was the uh, leading pro basketball player in the United States. The NBA did not exist. But then there was only really one really top flight professional team with the Celtics, which are now the Boston Celtics, same team. And they played semi-pro teams all over the country and beat them by big scores all the time. And Nat Holman was the playing coach. He was the center and he was also the coach. And uh, he ran this summer camp because basketball season was in the winter. And he had this summer camp in the summer, which I went to for when I was six and seven. And uh, the Celtics would come up once each year, each summer, and stay about a week. Most of the counselors were, who were, were the counselors at the camp, were college basketball stars, and they would play several games during that week time against the Celtics. The Celtics always won, and Nat Holman always played with the Celtics. And I couldn't figure out when I was six years old and seven years old why our beloved director would play in the opposing team, but he did. But he, uh, later on, he sold the team to uh, Kate Smith, the singer, who lived in Boston, and she moved the Celtics to Boston, renamed them the Boston Celtics. The NBA started about that, and they were they really the linchpin of the, of the NBA initially, Nats Basketball Association. And that home, and then, got the job coaching at CCNY. Now, CCNY, the City College of New York, became one of the big college basketball powers during the days that he coached them. And when he got too old, I don't know what happened, and they're no great basketball power today, but they were during his regime. And I went to his camp for two years. Then I went the next seven summers to a camp in Vermont I mentioned earlier that Vermont was the only state I was ever in, living in when, as a kid that didn't touch the Atlantic. And it didn't, of course. But I spent four years, uh, seven summers there. And the last two summers, they had two counselors from Columbia University who were on the fencing team at Columbia. Fencing in those days was a big sport in the Eastern colleges, the Ivy League and some others, and Army and Navy. And they conducted uh, fencing classes at this camp, Camp Kokosing in Vermont, and I, I immediately took to it. I liked it. And at Roxbury, they had a fencing team, the prep school. I'm jumping around, but yes. when I went there when I was 15 years old, in the, the, summer, the fall of 1933, uh, their fencing team was coached by the, fence, the fencing master at Yale University. I've, former world champion Robert Grissom, a, a, uh, a Belgian, and uh, I went out for fencing and wound up on the Sabre team and uh, got, did pretty well that first year. Uh, our biggest meet of the, the year that I can, the one I remember most anyway, was against Army against, and against the Army plebes. 
in those days, in college, freshmen could never compete on any varsity sport. So every school had a freshman team and then a varsity team. <coughs> the freshman teams played other freshmen or sometimes prep schools and like. And we were playing fencing against the Army plebes. And they had a fellow who, who he, he was the, became the national champion in Sabre, national collegiate champion, uh, his last three years in Army. This was his plebe year, he couldn't compete there. Uh, but anyway, he was their star. And I, he was about 19 or 20 years old. And he was, a, he was about six foot four or five. I was probably about five foot eight or nine and uh, weighed about 120 pounds and was 14, 15 years old and I beat him. I wound up the next year as captain of the fencing team at Roxbury. I also played, we had three football teams. We had the varsity, which played only college freshman teams. They were, they were all on scholarships provided by the athletic department at Yale. That was before the Ivy League de-emphasized athletics. And they had Yale and Harvard and Princeton, Cornell, Columbia, those schools all had very big football teams. And, but academically, the players had to pass the college entrance board exams, which they didn't have to do for every school, but they did for the Ivy League schools. And so schools like Yale would, would sign up high school graduates in New England who they wanted for their football program, <coughs> but they were missing a few college board exams, so they'd send them to Roxbury. They would go on a scholarship from Yale. They played the varsity. You couldn't even go out for the varsity unless you were sent there by Yale. <coughs> and they also waited on tables in the mess hall to pay for part of the scholarship. And I didn't make that team, I didn't go out for it, but when we had a junior varsity, which played local, high, local prep schools in Connecticut, in New England, and I played on that team, and as a matter of fact, the highlight of that season, I scored what was the winning touchdown against Choate, one of our primary rivals among New England prep schools. <coughs> it's the only touchdown I ever scored, but I did score that one in a big game. On a, on a pass, and uh, but I never played football after that. However, I continued fencing, and, and that's a long story. I don't know if you want to go into it, but I was ultimately on uh, supposed to be in the U.S. Olympic fencing team in 19 what would have been the 1940 Olympics, which never took place. They were scheduled for Helsinki, Finland, and the Russian invasion of Finland just prior to World War II stopped that coal. They didn't get to Helsinki till eight years later, 1948. No, 12 years later, 48 was in London, the first resumption of the Olympics after the war, after World War II. Let me ask you a quick question. You mentioned fencing, and people think of the stiletto type, and you mentioned sabers. Okay. I'm glad you asked that, but I don't know how much time you want to devote to this. Well, we're we're doing good because we just thought to have you up to when you're out of high school, okay. which is where I wanted to be. Well, fencing developed as a sport in Europe. It's a much bigger sport in Europe than it is here, uh, and uh, although it's it's uh, goes on sort of uh, unobserved around the country, fencing developed as a sport by the people who. Originally, the noblemen in Europe who all carried, uh, not stilettos, that's a dagger, mm -hmm. but they carried uh, swords which had a point, and, uh, but not a cutting edge. And they, uh, that was their weapon. Every, the three musketeers were armed that way. And they wanted to, uh, the, the urge developed to become proficient without being killed learning. So some of the great swordsmen of the day opened what were called sal de arms. That's the French word, S-A-L-L-E, -L -E, de arms, which were schools to teach noblemen how to become good with a sword. 
And to do that, they developed a weapon which was called a foil, which in, in round numbers means a fake sword, foil. And what it amounted to was a, a, a weapon about the size of a rapier, which is what it was teaching you to be good at. But instead of having a stiff blade that would go through you, it had a, a flexible blade that would bend and not go through and had a button on the end instead of a point. And the, these great swordsmen who ran these various out of arms all over Europe taught people how to become proficient with a foil, actually to become proficient with a rapier by learning with a foil, and that developed the sport of fencing. Then the military carried sabers, not too different from a saber today, not only carried by the cavalry, but the infantry and all military had uh, a certain number of people armed with sabers, and it became uh, desirable to learn to be good with a saber as well as a rapier. And so that was added, and the difference between foil fencing and saber fencing was that with a foil, the object in fencing, not in real life necessarily, but in fencing, the object was to stick your opponent somewhere in this vital zone, and you had to stick him like that. You couldn't scratch him or something. So the sport of foil fencing had certain rules. And and you would uh, score touches only if you hit in that vital zone and, and the blade actually bent, indicating that it would have gone through had it not been so flexible. And also there were a lot of rules, such as who had the right of way and, and uh, whether it was a foul or fair. For instance, if you suck a man down in here and miss there, but down there, and he hit you simultaneously, or right after that. Your foul invalidated his hit because it was assumed that if it were a real weapon, even though you wouldn't kill him hitting him there, you would certainly stop him. So uh, saber fencing then developed slightly differently. You could Sabers, of course, had a point. You could run someone through as well as cut with them. So, and you would you'd do very well to cut off his arm or cut off his head. So the target was changed for saber. Everything above what was called a groin line from here, including your shoulders, your arms, your head, so forth. And touches or points could be scored either by a cut or a point on any of those areas. And so it developed as a somewhat different uh, manner of this, different type of the same general sport. And on a, then the sport of uh, the E P E E, a French word for dueling sword, developed. Not many people who were not involved in this in Europe in those days know that when someone dueled for his honor, he didn't necessarily have to kill his opponent to win. If he fought with a dueling sword, with a pistol, it was a little different. But before dueling with pistols became the norm, it was all with a dueling sword, which was a very much like a rapier, a little bigger, a little heavier. And the first one to draw blood was considered to have won and assaged his, his honor, and uh, everybody went home happy. He might run you through, but he might have just pricked your toe. The first one to draw blood won, and there was only one point. So the sport developed. The target was the entire body, and in the sport, the weapon, it was a little bit heavier and longer than a foil, and instead of a button on the end, there were three sharp barbs, which they would dip in red ink. And of course, the costume fencing uniform was white, so whoever hit somebody first, you'd see the red spot, won, and that was called epe fencing. And so those three sports developed, and the fencing team has three foil men, three epe men, and three saber men. And in a, in a duel meet between two fencing teams, it's a round robin in each of the three weapons. The, the three foil men each fence each other, and the same way with the three epe men and the three saber men. So uh, I don't know if you want to know any more about fencing. Well, <clears throat> going on now, where are you in relationship to being nearly out of high school? 
And what school are you in in high school? Well, I went from Riverside to Roxbury in Cheshire, Connecticut. Uh -huh. Stayed there two years, graduated, went back that summer for to bring up some grades. So, and then I went away to the University of Maryland on an athletic scholarship, primarily. And this is, I can tell you how that came about. The uh, University of Maryland did not have a fencing team. Did not was not involved in fencing at all, but they had a. a I think a great athletic director, Leroy, Leroy, Leroy Mackert, long since dead, and he uh, he was also the chairman of the physical education department. They had a big phys ed department because they taught high school coaches for all over the state of Maryland. They didn't have fencing, and he had decided that as the athletic director, that his graduates in physical education should know something about every sport so they could teach the fundamentals of, of virtually any sport. And that included fencing, which they knew nothing about. And so he wrote a letter to Grasson, who was the U.S. Olympic foil coach, the Yale coach, and the coach of Roxbury. Uh, he wrote him a letter because he was well, Grasson was well known as one of the great fencing masters, and one of the few great fencing masters in the country. And he said that, in effect, if you have, I know you're coaching at some prep schools besides Yale. If you have any students, or maybe was maybe Roxbury was the only prep school to coach. I don't really remember. If you have any students graduating this spring who would like to to teach fencing to phys ed majors at the University of Maryland, we will offer them a scholarship, and we'd like to know about them. So Grasson read the letter to our team. And uh, I opted for that. I was supposed to go to Yale, but I, I knew by this time I've, my mother and dad were, were no longer together. Money was harder to get. Yale was expensive. Roxbury was even more expensive than Yale, I think. And uh, I would have to go to Roxbury one more year to get more college board credits because I'd only been there two years and one summer. And uh, so I put in for that, and um, I had a roommate who was a big guy. He was on the fencing team with me. He was a big star on the varsity football team. He didn't want to go to Yale because academically I was going to be harder than he wanted to study. <laughs> so we, we both put in for this, and we were both brought down to the University of Maryland. They had a weekend to which they invited all of the high school athletes whom they were trying to sign up for scholarships for a particular sport for the following year as freshmen. They still do that, I assume. But we were invited down for a weekend. Now, I was only 16 years old, and going down to, to a college sounded pretty great. I remember my mother was on her way to Europe, and I, I stopped uh, off in New York from New Haven, Connecticut, where I got on the train to see her off on the USS Manhattan, or on the SS Manhattan, for her spring tour of the Couturiers in Paris. And I stopped and visited with her. They were having a big going away party at the, on the ship. But anyway, I went down to Maryland, and uh, they, among other things, got me a date for a big dance with a co-ed. Here I was, 16 years old, taking a college girl to a dance. And we were each uh, student, they were high school student, they were trying to sign up, was a scene assigned to a member of the varsity football team. I was assigned, just out of the hat I guess, to the quarterback. And uh, he shook us, took us all around and, and of course, you know, I was guy guy for the, here I am with a college quarterback and uh, getting a date with a college girl. So I signed up and I wound up, spent four years at the University of Maryland. Not only taught fencing to phys ed students, but uh, created a fencing team. And uh, we won the Middle Atlantic States Fencing Championship. Uh, we did very well and we won the Southern Conference Championship as well. 
the Southern Conference didn't even have fencing when I started in Maryland, but at VMI in North Carolina and William and Mary and, I, and the University of Virginia, they started fencing teams about the same time. They all had professional coaches, and I can brag a little bit. I was an amateur coach, and we beat them all. And I won. I was uh, considered pretty good. And uh, after I graduated from Maryland, I spent a month in New York prior to going to work in Washington, D.C., in the insurance and investment business. And uh, I visited the, uh, I can't think of his name now, I can probably get it for you, but the great Sabre coach of the U.S., who was an Italian, uh, had a fencing school, a sal de arms, in New York City. And uh, he had uh, some terrific amateur fencers uh, on his team, and he taught hundreds of other people who were not on a team, but just taught them how to fence. I didn't know him. I went in to see him. I had a month to spend in New York, and I wanted to get a few saber lessons from him because he was so highly regarded. So we were, he had me work out with him a few times, and finally uh, he said I could come and he'd give me a lesson three times a week, no charge. So towards the end of that month, and that was the end of June, I was supposed to report the 5th of July right after the 4th to Washington to work. He asked me if I would uh, seriously uh, consider fencing on the Sabre fencing, the Olympic fencing team, that's the Sabreman. I was sorely tempted because being on the Olympics was a big deal. Yeah. But I, I figured I, I, business comes first. So I turned him down and did not fence on the Olympic team. And of course, it was a good thing the Olympics never occurred, as I mentioned. By the time they did, I was far too old. So your, your major in college was business? And business? business yes, business administration. Business. And so was your job in Washington one of those things that came through networking from the University of Maryland? Uh, no, it came from recruiting at the University of Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, large companies despite the fact that we were still digging our way out of the depression, so to speak, sent recruiters to various business schools around the country, uh, to graduate schools of business as well as undergraduate schools of business, where they, in the undergraduate schools, they were interested in recruiting from the graduating seniors who would be graduating that spring. And we had our share of recruiters at Maryland, and there were some from the the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the U.S. that was recruiting for investment and securities and life insurance personnel. And uh, the idea was if, if, if you went with that deal, you would go to school for one year with them at their expense at a very low salary, but trained to be in your particular field back at their headquarters in New York. I didn't want, I was selected, I was the only one, as it turned out, that they got from the University of Maryland. They wanted me to go back to uh, New York. I wanted to get the hell out of New York, and I loved Washington. They had a very big office in Washington, and I finally was able to persuade them to let me work in their Washington office and take all the courses there, which is what we did. And that's what I was doing when I joined the Marines about 16 months later. So what were you, 18 or 19 when you um, left college? Or 20, let's see, you were born in 1918. Yeah, I was I? You were 38, so 1938 roughly? Or? No, I graduated in 39. 39 you graduated. And I, when I was 20 years old. I went to work for the Equitable. My birthday's in September. I went to work for them in July 5th, as I mentioned. Yeah. And uh, the following summer, I worked that whole summer, that whole year, but September of that year, Germany invaded Poland and started World War II. And by the summer of 1940, which was the following summer, uh, Germany, well, Hitler, Stalin, and Mussolini owned almost all of Europe. I'm going to, Francisco, you go back to the East Coast for tank 
uh, training in his area? No, no, never, never went back to the, to the East Coast with the Marine Corps, ever. Okay. Until uh, I stopped at Quantico unofficially for a visit. So what do you do then from, where do you go from San Francisco? To the Marine Corps Tank School in San Diego. Okay. And uh, the, I had six days delay in San Francisco, had a marvelous time. Now I get on a, uh, um, the Marine Corps gave me Pullman tickets to San Diego from, I had to go across the ferry in San Francisco to Oakland, catch the, uh, uh, the train for uh, Los Angeles and I had to change trains in LA for San Diego. Anyway, when I got to San Diego, I'm getting off the, uh, onto the platform of the, uh, what the hell, I can't think of the name of the railroad that went down there. But anyway, at their depot, where the line ended. And I see Colonel Hagaboom, whom I knew fairly well in the officer school. I knew him as a great guy, and as I mentioned earlier, he was one of our officer school instructors who retired as a four-star general years later. At this point, he's a colonel. Bobby Huggaboom, very highly regarded throughout the Marine Corps. And uh, so I just thought I'd go up and say hello to him. Saluted and said something like, Colonel, it's nice to see you. He said, I've been waiting for you. I'm just a brand new captain and he's a colonel. And believe me, in those days, colonels were relatively rare. So he informed me that he'd like to, uh, he said, would you like a cup of coffee? Let's go, let's go to the coffee shop and talk. I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. But I'm not going to argue with the colonel. Not this time. The only one, only colonel I ever argued with was Louis Jones, and, and I almost got me court-martialed. But uh, we went in and talked, and the gist of it was that I had somewhere along the line, I had written a letter to get into Marine Corps aviation flight training. And I wasn't really too serious about it, but I thought maybe I can do something. I'm sitting in New Zealand in the rear echelon. The division is in Guadalcanal, having a tough time, and I'm, I'm not involved. And I thought, furthermore, I could go back to a carrier and get sleep in clean sheets every night and get paid 50% more money that I'm now making as a ground trooper. So I, I kind of surreptitiously really put in a letter requesting flight training. At that time, there was such a shortage of pilots in the Marine Corps that it was a bit difficult without violating regulations for the Marine Corps to turn down a request for flight training for somebody who's qualified. I could qualify physically and that any other way that that they uh, that they uh, imposed. So Hockabum was concerned they needed a captain from the first tank battalion on the tank school staff. He wasn't really aware either that I had had virtually no tank combat up to that point. He just knew that the Marine Corps knew that I was a captain in the 1st Tank Battalion, being sent back from, theoretically, Guadalcanal to bring combat experience to the staff of the tank school. And they'd have to violate regulations, which for some reason they didn't want to do, to turn down my request for flight training. And meanwhile, if they, if I did, they honored my request, they'd have to start a long, slow journey all over again. Here it's been a hell of uh, probably five weeks since we got the orders to send me back, and I'm not back yet to the tank school. So uh, I said to him, uh, I was young and brash enough, I guess, I said something like, well, now that I'm a captain, if I could have command of a tank company, I'd give up the idea of going into flight training. He said, that's easy enough to do. So we went to, uh, he, he had a, a, 
command car and a driver, and we got my luggage and we put it in, and he had his driver take us to the tank school to the commanding officer, who was Major Rip Collins, who became a very good friend of mine and wound up in command of the 5th Tank Battalion on Iwo Jima. At this point in time, he was the, the commandant of the new tank school, and he was a tanker. Uh, I hadn't met him before. He was in the second tank battalion, and I had never met him. But a great guy and a great tanker. Huggaboom was in the tank school came under Huggaboom's command, along with a lot of other commands that he had. And uh, so, in effect, he was Rip Collins' boss. And the three of us are sitting down in Everett's office, and he said something, I don't remember his exact words, of course, but he told Rip Collins that uh, I'm a new captain, and I ought to have a tank company as soon as possible. And uh, we con conversed along those lines. Rip wasn't going to argue with him about it. Uh, they both knew that there wouldn't be a tank company available for about five months because the, uh, the 3rd Marine Division was just loading out from Camp Pendleton and they were going to be several weeks doing that. And then the 4th Marine Division, which was just on paper and had some small uh, uh, cadre in New River, which could then come to Camp Pendleton to take over the camp from the 4th from the 3rd Division. And they would have to train for about six months and uh, somewhere along that line, I could get a company to go with the tank battalion for the 4th Marine Division. Anyway, the way we left it, I got the sweetest deal I've ever heard of. Not only was I promised I would have command of the first tank company to be formed in approximately five months, but I could select, an, and I've never heard of anybody had an opportunity like this in the Marine Corps, I could select 100% of my personnel from among the students and instructors at the tank school. Handpick every single one of them. Huggaboom was so good to me. I, I just, I, I don't know why. Anyway, I asked a simple question. I said, how long is the course of the tank school? And Rip Collins said, I think it was something like six weeks or something. I said, well, if I don't have a company for four or five months, and I pick some people that are outstanding that I want in my company and they graduate from the course, I lose them. And uh, Hockeboom said, no you don't. You make them instructors and keep them. So that's the job I had. And the tank school, that time, we still only had light tanks in the Marine Corps. But the tank school had, as part of its equipment, about a half a dozen Sherman tanks of different designs. There, at that time, there were three main manufacturers of Sherman tanks. There were four. One was, I can't think of the name of it now, they made, their main civilian job was making locomotives. And there was Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors. And all, all four made a slightly different tank. Some, di some differences were rather substantial. GM's Sherman tanks were all powered by diesel engines that uh, were modification of, the, of the, the gray marine diesel. I think it was called an Allison, I'm not sure. But anyway, it was a very simple, very good engine was diesel. Ford had a high-powered gasoline tank and Chrysler had an abomination. They put together, they didn't, they never made a tank until all of a sudden. And they, uh, they took five Chrysler engines, put them together in sort of a circle, it had five fuel caps, I mean uh, five uh, carburetors, five fuel, five fuel pumps, five of everything. And you can imagine the problems of keeping all five of everything coordinated. From a maintenance point of view, it was a nightmare. And uh, thank God the Marine Corps never bought any of them for combat. And, and 
one of the reasons was that, that we found out at the tank school how difficult it was to maintain them. Ford and General Motors tanks were fine, and we had some of each in combat. The, uh, anyway, we had German tanks at the tank school, but none in any combat units at that point in time. Let me set this picture of the tank up here, and maybe that's what okay. I'm If you can hold that page back, we'll just sure. take, take a minute to chat a little bit about it. I'm going to focus in on that. Okay. I could give you much better pictures than that. Well, if we continue this. Okay, now, just briefly, um, to explain a little bit about the tank, about uh, the gun, how the turret worked, where okay, the... Okay, fine. The main armament of the tank was the cannon that you can see sticking out there. was a 75 millimeter high velocity, uh, low elevation gun. It was not intended for indirect fire, it was direct fire. Mounted with it was a 30 caliber machine gun called a coaxial machine gun. You could fire either one at the same target. The, uh, there was a telescopic sight that aimed both of those weapons. And normally you would only fire one at a time, but actually, of course, theoretically, they could both fire. Then in the front of the tank, there was an, the machine gun, by the way, was 30 caliber. In the front of the tank, not connected in any way with the other two guns, was a 30 caliber air-cooled machine gun that was on a swivel and the barrel stuck out of the tank and the, ins the rest of it was in, sort of in the lap of, the, of the, uh, the lap gunner, as we call him. And then he was on the right side of the front of the tank. On the left side was the tank driver. And uh, so you had two men down below, the, the lap gunner and the driver. In the turret was the gunner, who was the one who fired 75 and the coaxial machine gun, and the loader who kept the machine gun belts loaded and also kept throwing rounds into the 75 millimeter cannon, and the tank commander. Those were the five people. The, uh, the heaviest armor plate was, of course, in front. And it was a slope plate, front slope plate, with the angle helped as much as the armor plate in deflecting uh, enemy anti-tank projectiles, but the sides were flat, and, pro and most anti-tank projectiles could go through them. The, uh, the turret was kind of rounded, and uh, it had its heaviest uh, armor plate in front. The, uh, there was a little cupola above the turret for the tank commander, which had vision slots that were of some kind of clear plastic, which would def de deflect small arms fire and uh, shrapnel and things of that nature, but which gave the tank commander a, a, a view all the way around, 360 degrees. The driver and the lap gunner and the loader and the gunner, obviously, all had periscopes, which were on a swivel, and they could look anywhere through the periscope. So there was a lot of vision you could get, but you're still semi-blind in a tank when it's what we call buttoned up, when the hatches are closed and you're looking through your periscopes and this little uh, <coughs> cupola. We did a number of things to our tanks <coughs> to modify them and to make them better. To, uh, to both stop magnetic mines and other explosives from damaging the sides of the tank and to make it harder for a anti-tank projectile to come through the side, we, for, we did this in two steps over a period of about a year, or several months anyway. <coughs> in the sides of the tank, we welded three 
U channels vertically. And to those channels we bolted 2 by 12 lumber, which put them, the U channels were 2 inches deep. So the lumber was 2 inches from the armor plate. And the, the idea originally for that was to, this, to make magnetic mines or pole mines ineffective. A magnetic mine wouldn't stick to the wood, and a pole mine, even if pressed against it, the force of the explosion would be daunted by the wood and dissipated by the two-inch airspace. But the, we, used, we used that in coagulant for the first time, but it didn't deter anti-tank missiles from Japanese 47 millimeter anti-tank gun from going into the tank. So we did the next best thing, uh, or we added to what we had done and for Saipan and Tinian by uh, continuing with the wood with the two inch airspace, but we put a one but we nailed a one by four to the bottom of the two by twelves, and now we had a uh, nice fo a concrete form. We welded little pieces of uh, reinforcing steel bars to the size of the tank between the wood and the tank side, and then we poured in concrete. So now we had two inches of lumber, and two inches of concrete that a projectile would have to penetrate before it even hit the armor plate. And that was a big help. A lot of Japanese projectiles came through, but they only they stuck. They got part way through the armor plate, but they didn't have enough oomph left to go all the way through. Some bigger projectiles could go through, and some did, and we lost some men lost arms and legs by being hit by those, but it stopped an awful lot of them. One of the favorite Japanese tactics whenever we were close up, as we were most of the time, in either in jungle or in a, in, a, in a small island or in a sugar cane field or whatever, they would jump on a tank with explosives and try to blow up or damage it in some way. The favorite place was the engine compartment, which is this flat area here. If they could throw an explosive charge on there, it would probably set the tank on fire, but we outfoxed them. We put sandbags loaded with sand, of course, all across the engine compartment, and the worst thing that could happen would be an explosive charge would blow a sandbag off. We used those same sandbags at night when we were dug in and alert to infilt possible infiltrators, we put these sandbags between the bogey wheels, <coughs> take a machine gun out, and we have a great pillbox. Another thing we did the, the, with the explosive charges, the uh, Japanese would like to jump on the top of a tank or anywhere where there was a hatch where the armor plate is, where it's at sort of a critical junction and place a, <coughs> a charge on it. They were really suicide bombers, you might say, to use today's vernacular. They would jump on the top of a tank with the explosive charge on the turret uh, hatch, for instance, or some other hatch, and lay over it, blow themselves up, but intentionally also blow the hatch in, except that we welded little, <coughs> with welding iron, or welding, welding bars, we made bird cages over all of our hatches, attached to the hatch so the hatch could open and close. <coughs> you might say, why didn't we put sandbags on it like we did on the engine compartment? Couldn't do that because they open the hatch, they pull up. But we welded these bird cages about three inches high. So if a, if a Japanese, as they sometimes did, laid across the top of the turret with a, a charge under his belly to blow himself and the tank up. All it did was dissipate from the three inches of airspace from the top of that uh, birdcage, so to speak, to the turret. So those were but the most effective thing that I can think of that 
we did. Well, in addition to that, before I get to the most effective, we our our tracks were steel, and we couldn't weld something to the turret the, the way we did to the side of the tank, because the turret was round, more or less. But we could weld track around the just went, wrap it around the turret. And that gave the turret a lot of extra steel on the outside. And then on the front slope plate, we did the same thing, put extra track. But the most important innovation that we made, and it was so effective that the tanks towards the end of the war came that way, one of the problems, and I'll get to what we did in a moment, but now I'll tell why we did it. One of the biggest problems we had was always was communication between the infantry and the tankers. How, you ta how are the tanks, which are largely blind, going to know who to fire on? And how are the infantry, who are being fired upon and want a tank to fire, going to communicate that to the tank? And they had radios, of course, but the radio communication, the radio lines were often tied up and Every infantryman didn't have a radio, only one in a, maybe a whole company. We welded a little steel box in the back end of each tank, put in a Marine Corps field telephone with a line directly to the tank commanders. They had earplugs, and it went right in there. So an infantryman could crawl up to a tank, pick up this phone. He didn't even have to stand up. He could reach up for it. He could jump in a foxhole because they were on a long line with a retractable spring. And he could say, hey, Joe, there's a son of a bitch in the tree right up here, and whatever. Anyway, they could communicate back and forth, and that became standard way of communicating between the infantry and the tanks. And towards the end of the war, as I said, the tanks came off the production line with those telephones. The biggest thing we probably ever did, however, was the flamethrower. The Japanese, the, most of the time we were attacking Japanese installations, one kind or another. Some were, ha some were haphazard and nothing more than a foxhole, but oftentimes they were concrete emplacements of uh, pillboxes with machine guns, cave openings, they had caves all over the place with tunnels connecting them blockhouses, and other installations. And the, the best thing a tank could do would be to fire its weapons at, the, at those installations, at the apertures of pillboxes and so forth. And they were, tanks were a very effective weapon for that. But the flamethrower tank was the most effective. The uh, infantry used flamethrowers a great deal, but the infantry flamethrower had a number of shortcomings. I don't know which was most important, but I'll list a few of them. One is it had a short range. It was only about 20 to 30 yards at the most. Secondly, and by the way, the fuel they fired was a regular ship's fuel, some kind of diesel oil. And it, it, it was not too accurate. It would throw a ball of flame down, but you couldn't pinpoint it at anything. Another drawback, of course, was the poor infantryman who was carrying it had to be pretty badly exposed. He had to get close to the enemy, and he had no armor plate around him. And another deep drawback was the limited amount of fuel he could carry. We worked for about a year to develop a napalm spewing tank. We worked Army engineers and Marines from the 4th Tank Battalion on Maui and CBs. And uh, we developed, as a result of this joint effort, a tank that could fire a stream of napalm accurately, 150 yards. And the stream would be no bigger than this, but it would stick to whatever it hit. And the gunner could, and of course, well, first place it was accurate, and it had range, and the uh, 
tank could carry a hell of a lot of napalm fuel, and it had armor plate and mobility. So the first time those weapons were used, the first time they were available, was on Iwo Jima, and they were worth their weight in gold. And the army was so impressed with them that uh, they had a whole b battalion of them on Okinawa, and the Marine Corps didn't have any of its own on Okinawa, but the army assigned them tanks from their battalion. The, uh, and the reason that came about, I think, or a big contributing factor, was that the army was a partner of ours in developing the tanks, but they had never used them because it was towards the end of the war. And uh, prior to either Iwo Jima or Okinawa, they, nobody had used them. They had never been used in combat. The Army, when we were loading out to go to Iwo Jima, shortly before that, the Army sent a major who was going to be, he was slated to be the, the executive officer of the flamethrower tank battalion scheduled for the Okinawa campaign. They sent him to the 4th Tank Battalion. The battalion sent him down to my company to be an observer. He observed our training with the flamethrowers for the few weeks he was with us before we loaded out. And then he went to Iwo Jima with my company. And he observed everything. He, he fought just about every position the tank had, whether we were a flamethrower or a gun tank. And, uh, but he, he got all the know-how and all the experience. He's a great guy. The best thing that could have been said about him was that the men on the company, when he left to rejoin the, this Army flamethrower battalion that was in the process of being formed, the Marines in my company all said he should have been a Marine. That was the greatest compliment they could give him, and he deserved it. He was great. I'm trying to think of his name. I never saw him again after Iwo, because he was flown immediately to this battalion. And then shortly after, I went to Okinawa myself, and I wanted to look him up. And I was there a few days before I finally got hold of his battalion sergeant major. I wanted to find out if he was still there and where he was. I wanted to get together with him. The battle was, of course, raging yet, but I wanted to see him one way or another. And I was informed that he'd been wounded the day before and shipped out. I never did see him. And uh, I, I think of his name, I'm sure, the moment it has escaped me. But those were things we did to the tanks that they didn't come with originally that made them better. Now, was this the result of feedback from the tanks being used in combat or just developed in well, the tank? The, the, the flamethrower tank came about because the infantry was using flamethrowers to a great extent because we were attacking fortifications, as I said, and emplacements and whatnot. And when the uh, when the fort after the Okan after the Kwajalein campaign in the fourth tank battalion, the other two tank companies besides my own my own already was equipped with Sherman tanks, as you know. But the other two companies had light tanks, and uh, they were to turn them in for Shermans because it was decided there was no reason not to have everybody, all tanks, be Sherman tanks, but no reason to have the light tanks. We could get the Shermans a tank, the, the tanks ashore just as easily as the light uh, with the new equipment we had, and uh, there was no reason to use light tanks. So the two light tank companies had to turn in their M5, light, they, they had the best light tanks going, they still were no match for Sherman. The M5 light tank, which the 4th Tank Battalion had been equipped with from the beginning, was made by Cadillac, and it had, had or by General Motors, but it had two V8 Cadillac engines in it, fast as hell, but speed didn't really matter the way we used tanks. Uh, but it was a better tank all the way around than the old light tanks, and it had one very big advantage. It had the first, as far as I know, only automatic transmission in any tank. 
which made it much easier to operate. But anyway, the, the fourth tank battalion, A Company and B Company, turned in their light tanks for medium tanks after the Kwajalein battle when we got back to Maui. But we surreptitiously kept a few light tanks to try them out with flamethrowers. The only flamethrowers available were the infantry flamethrowers. And we soon found out the tanks had to get too close to the target. And uh, we used them on Saipan, but not too effectively for that very reason. And furthermore, they were light tanks, more vulnerable than a medium tank. But we started working immediately on ways to develop a better tank flamethrower. The Navy CBs and the Army engineers and members of Army and Marine Corps tank units. As far as I know, the only Marine Corps tank units were involved with the 4th Division. As we were in Mount Maui, very close to the Army units, were on Oahu. And uh, so, if you, you asked about feedback, it was obvious that we needed a better flamethrower. It's obvious that a good tank flamethrower would be a very effective weapon. And so we did it. And, but we only had them for those last two battles. Well, then at what point are you taken out of your, your tank training job and you go back overseas again? Well, I, I was started at the tank school on the staff in charge of field training. And I, I had two jobs. One was supervising all field training, which meant really virtually all training other than classroom stuff. But the other job I had was selecting the people for my forthcoming tank company. So I kept developing a roster. And one thing you might, it might be worth talking about. One day, well, to quickly to answer your question, in May, my company was formed and all of the personnel came from the tank school and we went to Camp Pendleton. But prior to that, by a couple of months at least, when I was composing my list of who to have in, uh, in the company, one day I was in an area, I was in a Jeep, with, I had a driver who was driving me around wherever I wanted to go, and uh, a tank came, it was a tank driving area, a tank came whirling around, made a sharp turn, and it threw a track. Not so unusual in a tank, we threw tracks frequently. Uh, what that means is this track running around the tank fell off a bogey wheel and the tank would be immobilized until you could get it back on, which was not too hard to do if you knew how to do it and weren't being fired upon at the same time. Anyway, when this tank threw a tank, and it was a light tank, two guys jumped out of the tank immediately. One was a pretty big Marine. I could hardly see them. They were covered with dust and had goggles and all. And one man w remained in the tank sitting on the, the turret so he could communicate to these two guys as well as to the driver who was in the tank. And the, the two guys that came out, one of them was uh, obviously knew what he was doing more than the other. They quickly got the tank track back on. They had to communicate to the driver and then move forward, move backward or whatever. But they got it on and within a matter of a couple of minutes and they started to go back in the tank and I called the the larger of the two over to me, and I, I said, Marine, who are you? And he said, Second Lieutenant Henry, Henry Pellman, sir. And I said, where did you, how long have you been at the tank school? And he told me it was about three or four days. And I said, well, you couldn't have learned to get the track on that fast in three or four days. How did you learn that? And he said something like, Sir, I was born and raised on a farm. We had lots of tractors. They sometimes threw a track. I've been doing this since I was six years old. So I, I said to myself, that's one guy I want in my company <laughs> as a platoon leader. So I, he was one of those I selected. He ran my second platoon until after Iwo Jima when, he, when I left the company and he became company exec. 
Some years later, as a civilian, he was elected the first Republican governor in the history of Oklahoma. He served only one term at that time because the uh, first place Oklahoma was virtually 100% Democrat. And uh, they never had an, a state elected official who was a Republican prior to his being elected governor. But there was also a statute on the books in the state that a governor could not serve more than one term or could not succeed himself, something of that nature, which would preclude Bellman from running for a second term. He was so popular that even though he was a Republican, the state legislature, which was all Democrat, voted to amend the Constitution and repeal that law, and they did. But he refused to run because he said, the law would change while I was governor, it could be construed as conflict of interest. So he went back to the farm, which he'd been on from the time he got out of the Marine Corps till he ran for governor. He didn't run for governor of his own volition, but a group of young Republicans, some of whom I got to know well, sought him out and talked him into running. He went back to the farm, and then some years later, the perennial Senator Kerr from Oklahoma, who was the fan of Kerr oil, and he'd been, governor, he'd been senator for maybe four terms, four times six, twenty-some years, Either he either retired or decided not to run for some reason for re-election, probably was ill. So the same group of young Republicans talked Bellman into running for the Senate. And by God, he wound up as the first Republican senator from Oklahoma. And he served 12 years and uh, two terms as senator. And he got a Marine aviator, I can't think of his name now, to run for governor also, and for a while they had two Republican governors, I mean two Republican senators from Oklahoma. When Henry Bellman was finishing his, what well, was his second term, he'd been a senator for almost 12 years at that point, he announced he would not run for re-election. And I called him up because we had talked quite a bit and saw each other a few times while he was governor and senator. And I told Henry that I was really disappointed that he wouldn't run again because we needed, he was a U.S. Senator, not an Oklahoma Senator, and we needed all the good people we could get in Congress, and uh, he should run, in effect. And in effect, he said to me something like, Bob, when you're in Washington this long, you lose all perspective of what's really going on. At home. He said, I don't like that. I'm not going to stay in Washington any longer than the end of this term. So he went back to Oklahoma, and at the end of his term, I forgot who was elected. And not too long after that, the same guys talked him into running for governor again. And now he ran and was reelected or was elected, and then he ran for another term because now the law did not prevent it. He served two terms. And then he retired from that. And anyway, that was a guy that I picked up for my company at Jack's Farm or Tank School. That's amazing. So, your school then, you've got your roster. Okay. And well, it, well, we, I picked another man I picked for as an officer for the company was. Uh, Max English, GM as we called him. He was, when I arrived at the tank school, he, he was a platoon sergeant in charge of driving instruction. And I soon came to realize he was damn good. He was a very, very salty NCO and he was a very good tanker. He had originally, well, I'll tell you a little bit about him. He grew up on a ranch in Texas. When he was 17, he ran away from home and joined the Army Cavalry. He served three years in the Cavalry. He liked the military life, but he didn't like shoveling manure all the time. So after his three-year hitch was over, he joined the Marines. 
And I guess for some reason, because he'd been the cavalry, they assigned him to the second tank battalion. After he got, I don't know whether he had to go through a boot camp or not, probably did. Anyway, he was in the second tank battalion. Sometime, several months prior to Pearl Harbor, but when the battle for Britain was raging still, the U.S. sent, as I'm sure you are aware, a brigade to Iceland at the request of the British. The British had, a, had, a, uh, had some troops in Iceland, but they needed them in North Africa. They are very concerned that the Germans would invade Iceland for a submarine base for the North because the uh, submarines couldn't, uh, couldn't really operate effectively in the north. North of Iceland, we were sending all these uh, freighters around north of Iceland and then they come down north of Scotland and unload in Scotland. And also they eventually were going over to, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of the port in Russia. Had. Murmansk. Murmansk. Murmansk, yeah. Yeah. So uh, that was too far north for the submarines. They couldn't, it was beyond their their, their uh, cruising range. So they wanted, it to, the Germans wanted a base on Iceland, which would have enabled them to attack all this northern route, which was really the only route torpedo-free that the British had. And so they, they requested of Roosevelt that Marines be sent to Iceland. I don't know how much, how aware you were of all this. You may know all about it. Well, I, I think the 6th Marine Division no, no, the, the, they went from the 2nd Marine Division and the 1st Marine Division. Both. What, what year, uh, Bob? It would be 1942 in the, the early spring of 42. Okay, well, I'm... No, no, excuse me, I'm wrong. That was after Pearl Harbor. No, they went in the late summer of 1942. Late summer of 1941, excuse me. I interviewed a corpsman who was in Iceland with the Marines in 1936. That's why I'm Oh, uh, that was a different operation. Yeah, that, that's so I, I'm trying to pin the dates down. Th okay, this was in probably two months before Pearl Harbor. Mm -hmm. uh, we were not yet at war, but we sent the, uh, the odd thing about it is we sent a battalion, we sent a, a brigade from the 2nd Marine Division to Iceland. The 2nd Marine Division was in in, on, in California. They had to go all the way around. Sometime later we sent a brigade to Samoa and we sent it from the 1st Marine Division which was in North Carolina and they had to go all the way around the other direction. I've never heard an explanation of why that was happening but when the brigade left the 2nd Division to go to Iceland, GM English went with them with they, the brigade had one tank company, and it was the company he was in. And he was a buck sergeant at the time, and went with the tank tank company with that brigade. And uh, they they came back sometime after Pearl Harbor. They were there for maybe six months. I'm not sure. Uh, and they came back. The uh, sometime when I was overseas in New Zealand. And I guess because English was a tanker and the tank school was being formed, he was assigned to the tank school as an instructor. And he was, when I arrived there, he was in charge of field of uh, tank driving. I was able, he was so good, I was able to get him promoted almost at once to gunnery sergeant. And he became my right hand man on the staff of the field training. And eventually, as the time came closer to my getting my company, I realized that all of my officers were going to be guys with no, you know, the green bean. They were all very good, that's why I selected them. They were all green. They'd only been in the Marine Corps a matter of months, and they'd only, they'd never been in combat, of course, they'd never been in a tank unit other than at the tank school. I wanted some officer besides myself with a little more experience. I talked it over with Rip Collins, and we both agreed to my suggestion that we try to get a field commission for English as a second lieutenant, and I would take him as platoon leader of my third platoon. 
which is exactly what we did do. And he, of course, he, was a, he stayed in the Marine Corps after the war was over, and he uh, was a captain in command of a tank company when the Korean War broke out, and the, the Marines had to send a brigade real quickly to the Pusan perimeter to keep it from, keep the army from being thrown off the, the out of Korea. And so we quickly sent a brigade that was quickly put together. And the brigade included, as usual, a tank company. And English had about the only company that was available ready to go. So his tank company went with the brigade that plugged the Pusat perimeter. And then when the rest of the 1st Division, which was really a lot of uh, reserves called up to go with the uh, what was still in the 1st Division, because the 1st Division had been emasculated after the war by the government, by the Defense Department had taken. There was, it was very small, it wasn't a full division, and all the Marine Reserve units were called up. Most of them went right into the 1st Division, and uh, fortunately for the Marine Corps, most of the reserve units at that time were veterans of World War II. They weren't guys whose only military experience was what they got in the reserves. Yeah. And they threw them together at Camp Pendleton, formed a division, less a brigade. The brigade was already at Pusan. And when the, di the division, less that brigade, sailed for the landing at Incheon, the br by that time the brigade had stabilized the Pusan perimeter and was withdrawn and rejoined the division at sea and landed at Pusan, or rather at, uh, at uh, Incheon. Incheon. And English tanks were the first Allied vehicles on the uh, Kimpo airfield at, at uh, Seoul. Anyway, he fought through the Korean War, and uh, af sometime afterwards he was a, because he had gotten a Silver Star on Iwo Jima, he was able to retire as a lieutenant colonel. The tombstone law, which enabled him to do that, was still in effect. And he retired as a lieutenant colonel. He retired only because he knew that due to his lack of formal education, he would never rise any higher. So he came to see Bob Reed and I. We, we took him into our company, <clears throat> and he was terrific. He was one of the best people we ever had. But one night, after he'd been with us for three or four years, uh, and by the way, he was elected. He, he, he built a house in a community, in a town or a community called Chatsworth in the San Fernando Valley of California, where not far from where we, our company was active. And he was elected eventually. The, the, uh, president of the Chatsworth Chamber of Commerce. Everybody liked this guy. A great personality and very, very effective fellow. Anyway, that English had a, uh, an accident that the doctor said he had a stroke, a minor stroke. He was driving his car and he came to a, a rather dangerous place. The road went on a kind of a 90 degree turn and it was a wooden fence and he went right into the fence. But according to the uh, they examined him very carefully. He was not seriously hurt, fortunately. They said that he'd had a mild stroke. Hmm. And uh, some time later, he had another accident similar to that. And <coughs> his wife got very concerned. She wanted him to uh, quit working and retire. So they did. She, she had a brother, or a couple of brothers, in Louisiana who had a, a home on a bayou that they were willing to let them have. And they went there, and GM fished and rested for the rest of his life. And unfortunately, you know, she, his wife died ahead of him. And uh, But he's been gone about five or six years. She's been dead even longer. But uh, those were two of the guys that I had in my company. Yeah. In that's my tank company. Yeah, that's interesting. So are you up to the point just about now where you're forming up to go overseas again? Well, where depends on how much detail you want. 
we, we moved to Camp Pendleton in May from the tank school as a company for the first time. And uh, we stayed at Camp Pendleton until, for six months until we went overseas. During the first three months of that time, we operated virtually alone. And we concentrated on tank training, firing the weapons, which we did a lot of, course driving, and we we had devised a few ways of of uh, sharpening up. For instance, we'd have tank battles, which we never had in combat, I might add. But we uh, we would take one platoon of tanks, put them in defensive positions behind hills and whatnot, and we'd send another platoon of tanks in down in that direction. Before we did this, we would take our machine gun, a belt of machine gun fire, or belt of machine gun bullets, and painted the uh, bullets a, a color, for one different color for each tank platoon. And we would only fire the machine guns, but we would fire them. And we would fire tank against tank, and we could tell who hit who from the color of, none, none of the bullets could penetrate, but they would leave a little scar and, uh, and with the color. Also, we would, uh, we did a lot of that and a lot of other combat training for the first several months. <coughs> then we started the first several months just alone. Then we began to work with the infantry and this is where the training really took hold. The infantry didn't know what to do with the tanks, and we weren't sure what we were supposed to do with the infantry. And, and the, the main reason is the Marine Corps had never fought a battle with a tank. And they had the senior brass, the regimental commanders, and even the battalion commanders really didn't know what to expect from tanks or how to bring tanks into a coordinated attack with them. They read from army manuals, you send waves of tanks against waves of other tanks and things of that nature. So it was up to us to try to learn on the job. And we had three months to do that. And we learned some of the things that caused us to make some of the modifications that I talked about. We learned communication between the infantry and the tank was the most important thing. We learned that the tanks had to be protected if they went way out in front by infantry rifle fire, machine gun fire from Japanese infantry that would attack in mass and try to plant explosives on the tanks. We learned, the infantry learned, the tanks could bring heavy firepower to the front and protect them in a way that they never could do without tanks. So we practiced all of that. We had to sell all of this to the brass. Sometimes it was easy, sometimes it was difficult. And Louis Jones was one of the most obstinate of the, uh, of the infantry commanders. He commanded the 23rd Marine Regiment, and my company was often assigned to work with them. And we worked with them ultimately very well. One company commander I worked with particularly well, I saw him on TV just the other night. The uh, History Channel ran a, an hour-long program on Iwo Jima. And they had brought in, a lot of it was inaccurate, but you got to expect that. But they brought in a, a, a few Marine commentators to speak. And one of them was Larry Snowden, who was a tank company commander in the 23rd Marines with whom I worked very often, his company and my tanks, in training and in combat. And we became very close friends. He retired as Chief of Staff of the Marine Corps many years later as a Lieutenant General. And uh, he, was, he was one of the guys that we worked very well together. And we did with, with the company commanders, we worked very well. Our biggest problem with the regimental commanders, and to some extent, the battalion commanders. But most of the battalion commanders the Marine Corps that I ever met, and I met a lot of them, were great. They were just, I think they were the heart and soul of the Marine Corps. They and, and the staff NCOs were what made the Marine Corps work. 
Some of them, like this one guy on Roy, Lieutenant Colonel Dillon, were not. But the majority, Joe Chambers and Colonel Hudson and, and so many, that, that, that seemed to be the age, the, the, the battalion commanders, Bill Buse was one of them at that time, were guys who would, many of them from the Naval Academy, but not all by any means, who had uh, graduated around 1934-35. They were now age-wise in their early 30s. They'd been in the Marine Corps 10 years or so. They were gung-ho. They were young enough to do everything, but they'd had so much experience, and, and uh, they were great. And I think some of these more senior brass, I wouldn't put in that category. Although some of them, like Hagaboom, were, I think, terrific. And Cates. Uh, General Cates, by the way, was one of the few Marines to fight both the Bella Wood and Iwo Jima. Well, that's an unusual. And uh, he was ter he, terrific. I know him very well. He's the guy that pinned the Navy Cross on me. And we were, we, we were very good friends. But uh, most of the brass, the real senior brass, had experience in World War One, and a lot of them had experience in Korea, in uh, Nicaragua and Haiti, and many of the battalion commanders had combat experience in Nicaragua and Haiti as well. But the uh, somehow or other, the some of the regimental commanders really didn't know what the hell to do with the tanks, and it was up to us to train them, and it's hard for a junior officer to train a colonel. But we did, believe it or not. And Louis Jones and I ultimately became very good friends, even though he fully intended to court-martial me. The only reason he didn't was that the commanding officer of the 4th Tank Battalion wanted to recommend me for a medal for Kwajalein, an inconsequential thing, but he wanted to do that. His father, General Schmidt, was commanding general of the 4th Division, of which we were a part. General Jones, or Colonel Jones, Louis Jones, wanted to court-martial me. And the, uh, my battalion commander got together with his father and said, we can't have that happen, I want to give a decoration. So the way Schmidt got the whole thing straightened out, he's a wise old guy, he called Louis Jones and his son together. He said, okay, here's what we're going to do. Son, you're going to withdraw your recommendation for a medal. Louis, you're going to withdraw your car, Marshal. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what we did there. But Louis Jones and I eventually got to be good friends. Uh, he eventually got to see the light, but it took him a long time. I don't know if we ever discussed this incident on Saipan. Listen, uh, we're at the end. Um, so, at this point then, you really don't have a successful way of getting a tank ashore. We didn't initially. The first time that the tanks were done properly, so far as the landing operation is concerned, was coagulating, as far as I'm aware. The uh, when the Navy came up with the LSDs, the Marine Corps was very anxious to try medium tanks because we'd had nothing but light tanks up till then. And the medium tank, which was the main battle tank of the U.S. Army, was the Sherman tank. And it differed from the light tank in many respects, all good once you know how to get them ashore. The uh, first place, instead of weighing 12 to 15 tons, they weighed 35 tons loaded. Secondly, instead of having a 37 millimeter pop gun as their main armament, they had a 75 millimeter high velocity gun. And they had much more armor plate. And they were much more effective than a light tank. But the question was, how do you get it ashore? Well, now the Navy had these LSDs, which the LSD, I'll explain what it, how it worked. We now have 
many advanced versions of that in the whole fleet of amphibious assault ships, the latest of which that I was on was the called named the Iwo Jima, and I was that's another story. It took place many years after the battle. But anyway, the LSDs had a well deck which would flood. It could hold 17 LCMs, which was, and each LCM could hold one Sherman tank. So the way it worked, the, L, the LSDs would be in the stream, not on, not on the harbor. They didn't have to be. And the, the, each tank would back on to one LCM off the beach. They would just back on to it. And when all 17 were on, on board, 17 LCMs, they would then swim out to the mothership, the LSD, which would have its well deck flooded, and it would take, actually there were 18 LCMs because we also had a tank retriever, which was a big crane mounted on a medium tank chassis and was used to haul disabled tanks out of the battlefield where they could be repaired and put back in action. So we had 18 of these LCMs, one with a, with, a, with a retriever and the other 17 with tanks. They would, they would back, all 18 would back into the flooded well deck, nine on either side. They would park har, uh, on an angle, angle parking. When they were all in place, the well deck, would, the stern gates would close, all the water would be pumped out, the LCMs would be chained, chained down into position so they wouldn't rock back and forth and anything. And the LSD could take off. It was a large ocean-going vessel. When it got off the beach, it was being attacked. They would open the, they would flood the well deck. Open, well, the first thing they would do would be unchain the LCMs, open the well, the flood the well deck, open the stern gates. And all 18 vehicle, all 18 LCMs would swim out, and you'd add 18 tanks, whole tank company, headed for the beach in a small landing craft. Instead of uh, having a light tank, you could have a medium tank. So the Marine Corps decided they would experiment, and they made one company in each battalion medium tank. My company was selected in the 4th Tank Battalion before the battalion went overseas. The battalion went directly to the invasion of Kwajalein. Was a, there were a couple of firsts in the Kwajalein campaign. <coughs> Kwajalein, which you may know, is the largest atoll in the world. <coughs> and it, it had a 60 mile long lagoon fringed with all these small islands. Two major islands in the north, one major island in the south. The Army, I think it was the 7th Division, was assigned to take the island in the south, and the 4th Marine Division was assigned to take the two islands in the north and a bunch of small islands around it. And uh, the medium tank company, with the two islands were Roy and Namur. Roy was the largest Japanese air base in the Central Pacific at that time and Namur was an administrative center for the Marshall Islands. And it was assumed, incorrectly, that because Roy was such an important air base, it would be the most heavily defended. So the way the division planned that operation, as it frequently, the, the, the normal was the division was divided, and it did it for this one, was divided into three regimental combat teams. The heart of each RCT was one of the three of three regiments, and it would be commanded, the RCT, by the regimental commander. But attached to the regiment to make it an RCT was an artillery battalion, an engineer company, an anti-aircraft company, a tank company. That's the part we're concerned about, of course. And uh, because it was assumed that Roy would be the most difficult, the uh, medium tank company was assigned to the 23rd Marine, to the 23rd RCT. And the light tank, the two light tank companies, the one regimental combat team, the 24th Marines, and its attached units, 
was assigned to take the moor, and the 25th Marines, with its assigned attached units, was assigned to take three or four of the small units, the small islands that were really hardly defended, mainly had natives there who were getting out of the way of the naval gunfire on Roy and the moor. But the, uh, it turned out my medium tank company had a field day on Roy because there was no place, there were no gun emplacements. There were three, there were six large uh, block houses on the north end. We, we attacked from the lagoon side, came into the lagoon and attacked from the south. And the Japanese fixed defenses on Roy were all pointed to the north. They thought the Marines would come, or whoever was going to attack them, would come from the north. And they had fixed guns that couldn't work except to the north. So we attacked from the south, and there, was, there were no fixed fortifications. We didn't know that in advance. Should have known, but didn't know. And we, uh, the way the operation was planned, this is uh, kind of interesting, the way the operation was planned, the RCT, the 23rd RCT, was to advance to the 01 line, the, the 01 meaning the first objective, which was halfway across Roy Airfield, the, where the runways intersected. That's where we were to stop, and the Navy was going to engage in some heavy naval gunfire into the second half of Roy. When they lifted that, the, the 23rd Marines would go on to the uh, and of the, and the island. That was all theory, and it was theory that was wrong. I mean, it was unnecessary. My tanks landed on Roy, and we immediately, after, there was a tank trap at the, where we landed, but we, I got out of my tank along with my gunnery sergeant. I never made a landing from a tank without my gunnery sergeant in the turret with me. Sam Johnston, he was superb. He's still alive at 96 years of age in Texas. <coughs> Best Marine I ever knew. But in any event, we, uh, we advanced up to the O-1 rather quickly because Sam Johnson and I found a way to get the tanks across this anti-tank trap and have got all tanks across. We got up to the O-1 line. There was an infantry battalion arrived there about the same time. <coughs> Colonel, Lieutenant Colonel Dillon uh, whom I don't think too highly of, was the battalion commander. And uh, he, st <coughs> he stopped his battalion there. <coughs> and I said, why are you stopping, Colonel? Let's go on. I was only a captain, so I probably shouldn't have asked that question. He said, we have orders to hold here. There's going to be naval gunfire. And then I saw these six blockhouses about a thousand yards away. I didn't know what the hell they had in them, but one of the one of the major points in tank tactics is tanks do not stop in the open because they become sitting ducks for anti-tank fire. And I said, this was wide open, just a flat airfield. I said, I can't stop here. I can't leave my tanks that vulnerable. We're going to go on until we reach the enemy. And we argued a little bit, and I finally said, well, okay, I'm on my way. Come along if you want to. And we went down to the end of the island. It turned out, we didn't know this in advance, that as I said, those blockhouses couldn't turn their guns around, and so they evacuated them. They were empty. But there were about, we estimated, several hundred, maybe three or four hundred Japanese troops in a huge trench that ran around the northern perimeter of the island. They were all in there. It was the only cover they had. We couldn't depress our, any, our tank guns long enough to get them in this big anti-tank trench, which is what it was really. They had one on each end of the island, and the first one was the anti-tank trap that I referred to. So we have all the Japanese cornered in this trench, and uh, I know if tree to take him. I, I, I radioed back. Oh, I got a radio message from my executive officer. It's with Colonel Jones, who is the RCT commander. 
and my exec, Steve Horton, who was the first lieutenant, tells me that Colonel Jones says we got to get our tanks back immediately to the 01 because the Navy wanted to put naval gunfire on the second half of Roy. And they won't do it while you're there, thank God. So uh, I, I said to him, maybe you better put Colonel jo ask Colonel Jones if I could talk to him. So he got on the line and he, he read me off pretty bad. He told me, in effect, that I, uh, well, first I told him I, that we had all of the Japanese troops cornered in this anti-tank trap. But we couldn't, we could keep in there, but we couldn't get to them. And his infantry could come up and have a field day. And you don't need the naval gun fire, there's no other Japs on the island. But if we pull back, they're going to get out of their anti-tank ditch, swim across to Namur, which is only about 100 yards. And uh, you'll have a couple hundred more Japanese to shoot at Marines, and the 24th Marines. Why can't we stay here? You send some infantry up to to get these guys. Well, I didn't cut any ice with him. He said, naval gunfire is going to start as soon as you get your ass back here, and as soon as the battle is over, you're under arrest. He very blunt about it, you're going to be court-martialed, because I was arguing with him. And so we had no choice but to pull back. And they had the naval gunfire, and when we advanced the second time, there wasn't a Jap anywhere near that trench. They're all gone. I lost one man in that operation. One of my tank commanders, against his orders actually, because everybody was ordered to remain buttoned up, because the Japanese were well armed. They were just down in there. He stuck his head out of his turret with field glasses, and he got shot right between the eyes and died right there on the spot. He was a good tank commander. I hated to lose him. He was a uh, Navajo. Uh, Indian who had enlisted in the Marine Corps, uh, Corporal, God, I I never thought I'd forget his name, I'll think of it. Anyway, he was our first killed member of the, of the, of the company. Well, let me ask a couple of quick questions and you don't need to take much time. But back when you were in uh, Paris Island, that's when Pearl Harbor happened? No, we were in New River, North Carolina. I never got to Paris Island. The Marines from Paris Island came north to New River, and the Marines from first from Quantico, Quantico went south to New River. New River. And that's where we were. And I'll tell you where I was. I was uh, on Liberty in Raleigh. We'd had, we'd had a 10-day maneuver landing at Onslow Beach the whole division, which was now together for the first time, really, and the first time the whole division had a maneuver together. We were the division special troops, which now had no longer had any tanks in it. It had a parachute battalion, and it had uh, a lot associated with it, but not part of division special troops. They had these ancient dive bombers. They weren't SPDs. They were biplanes which made one hell of a lot of noise when they came out of a dive, and they were slower in all hell. They were pretty accurate, and as long as they could hold of their dive. They were the opposition. The rest of the division was on the offensive. We landed at Onslow Beach, and uh, my, I still had the motorcycle platoon at that point in time. I'm, I, we do, didn't lose our motorcycles till a little bit after that. We're making a, we're reconnoitering the road net in front of the division, well in front of it. The road net are all sandy roads. No, it's a very poor part of North Carolina at that time. Perhaps still is. I don't know. But there were no, very few paved roads. There were a lot of sandy roads for one-lane roads. And we're going down 21 motorcycles down the sandy road, and we are what we were, the way we were operating, each, each motorcycle had a driver and a guy behind him. And we were, each guy behind, depending on the first tank, second tank, third tank, fourth tank, was scanning the skies either to the right or the left for the, our opposition, which were the 
the, uh, I don't know what make they were, I don't know whether they were buffalo bisons or what they were, but they were never used, uh, fortunately, by the first marine aircraft wing which was furnishing them, never used in combat. The, uh, we're looking out for them, and all of a sudden, the, the guy be, who's sitting behind me on this lead motorcycle hits me in the ribs and he points. And there are three of these ancient planes, oh, I don't know how many miles away, but I looked at my aerial photograph, we're about a mile from the closest town, and I wanted to get there and disperse before these planes got us. So we, I thought we could do it, but we, I miscalculated. We arrived simultaneously, more or less. We, you can imagine this little town in North Carolina, no paved roads, probably had never seen a motorcycle before, seldom an airplane. We, and all of the homes were up on uh, stilts, I guess you could call them, because there was no, no place for the water to go and it rained and it would flood. So they, they, they were all built to withstand that, but they would let the water pass under the houses. But there was no water at that point. And uh, as we arrived, well, you can imagine this little town with a general store, it was a crossroads. And it was a general store with a, about a half dozen people sitting on the front steps. It's like out of a movie. And there was a mule and a buckboard attached to a, a, a rack in front of the front steps. And all of a sudden, here comes 21 motorcycles and three airplanes converging on this poor little town. And uh, the orders I gave were scatter under buildings and take cover, and which they did. The motorcycles went under all these houses as many as they needed to. And uh, these planes came and dropped fl flower bombs. Are you familiar with them? They dropped flour all over this little town. <laughs> People in it were they naturally the ones who were on the front steps jumped into the into the general store and locked the doors. They didn't know what the hell was happening. And finally the planes had enough fun and they decided that, to leave. And they every time they made it run and dropped a bomb and then went up, they made one hell of a racket. Finally they they left. And when I was convinced that they were gone, I gave the commands of I think uh, Whatever I said, the command was for the for the most motorcycles to assemble here, and the uh, I think the the people inside heard me give that command, and uh, I heard a little voice come from inside there. It was a child's voice. It said something like, "Mama, does he mean essence?" <laughs> and because uh, I said something about you can come out now, or you know. Come on out and assemble here. <laughs> so I realized that the poor people were probably scared to death. Now we were in hoods. The uh, it was cool. It was in November, late November, and it was damp and cool. And the, the tank uniform or the motorcycle uniform, tankers as well, consisted of a of a almost a ski suit. And a, and a big hood and goggles, and each man was armed with a Tom, Thompson submachine gun. We must have looked like from out of this world to these poor people. And furthermore, they probably had never even heard of the Marine Corps, which was still very small. So I knocked on the door when I realized it was locked and said that we're friendly, we're U.S. Marines on maneuvers and so forth. Finally, they we're willing to open the door, and we hugged and shook hands and all of that. There were a lot of people inside besides the few that had been on the front steps. And they gave us all some hot coffee and some cold drinks, whatever the Marines wanted. We had a nice time together. Finally, an old fellow came up to me and asked if I knew where his buckboard had gone. <laughs> of course, the mule had broken loose and taken off. <laughs> And I had not seen it do that, but we, I know he didn't come in our direction, so he must have gone down the road in the other direction. So I, I told him that I thought that's where they were. Now we're all lined up ready to leave, having said goodbye. 
and uh, I'm sitting on my motorcycle, and my platoon sergeant standing right beside it, and this old guy, I asked him if he would like a ride down the road to find his buckboard. He said no. But with that, my, my platoon sergeant winked, picked this fellow up, stack him, stuck him behind me. My guy got off, my regular Marine and stuck him right up behind me, put his hands in front, and I clamped mine down, and we took off down the road. And sure enough, about a mile down the road, there was his mule, just peacefully munching on grass that was growing on the side of the road, and the buckboard was still attached. So I let the old guy off there. He was now, he was delighted and, and to find his buckboard, and I'm sure when he got back to the rest of the people, he had a lot to tell him about his ride on a motorcycle. Anyway, we left. But that was the last, that was sort of midweek. The General Vandegrift, who was commanding general of the division and later became commandant, got assembled the entire division after the maneuver was over, which was a day or two later, and congratulated us on everything that we, not just me, the whole division, everything we had done. And he said, because of that, he's going to do something unprecedented. Give the entire division liberty, but they can't all go at once. One half can go this coming weekend for three days, and the other half can go the following weekend. Well, New River, North Carolina was isolated. Lejeune, is, a lot of stuff has grown up around Lejeune, but there was nothing in those days. There was a little town called Jacksonville, which was really small. and nothing nearby. So a lot of guys opted to go the second weekend. They wanted, wanted a little time to prepare so how they're going to get together with their girlfriends or their wives or whomever they wanted to have liberty with. And so I volunteer. I had long since learned Marine Corps, you never take a second chance. Take it while you got it. So I volunteered to be one of the first to go. I knew two girls in uh, Richmond, Virginia two sisters, and I, uh, my buddy Tex Gillespie and I went to Raleigh. We both volunteered to go the first weekend. I called these girls up from a payphone in Jacksonville and asked them if they could meet us in Raleigh. And they, we had two phone conversations, as I recall. First they were looking into it, and they, there was a train he could take in Raleigh, which would get them there Friday afternoon. There was another train leaving at 6 o'clock Sunday night from Raleigh to Richmond. So we worked it out. They agreed to take the train. We made reservations at the Sir Walter Hotel, which was the big hotel in Raleigh. We had a great time. And Sunday afternoon, we were kind of tapering off, went to the movies. These two girls and Tex Gillespie, myself. And, uh, we're sitting in the movie theater. That the only men in the movie were Marines. There were a lot of girls there, or dates of Marines, but there were very few civilians other than the Marine States. And I don't remember what the hell the movie was that we saw, but it was over. And it's, it's going to come on again. It's continuous production. So my, my, my date and, and Tex Gillespie and his date start to leave. And as we're walking back towards the rear of the theater, a man in civilian clothing comes up onto the stage, and the lights go on, which was unusual. But what was, what was not too unusual in those smaller cities, and in the South at least in those days, was in, when in the movie sometimes they made local announcements. And I figured that's what this guy's going to do. But my, we're standing now in the back of the theater, past the last seat, but we could see. And my date said, let's stop and hear what he has to say. I didn't know why she wanted to stop, but we stopped. And what he said was not exactly correct, but it was close enough. He said something like, my friends, my friends, quiet please, and, and everybody quieted down. He said, Japan and the United States are now at war. That was inaccurate. We didn't go to Wardle the next day, but that was only a, that was technically inaccurate. And there was dead silence for a couple of seconds. And then, as though it had been rehearsed, all these Marines started singing, 
the Marines him, and they started the snake dance up over the stage and around, singing and cheering. And I thought to myself, I don't know what the hell the Japanese have done. I wasn't aware that they bombed Pearl Harbor or whatever. But I said, my God, if they could see the reaction of these Marines, they probably wish they hadn't done it. I ran across the street. The theater was across the street from the largest newspaper in North Carolina, the Raleigh News and Observer. And looking for somebody who could tell me what was going on. And I couldn't find anybody on the ground floor, so they had a stairway leading upstairs. I went up the second floor, and there was a, a room with a glass, opaque glass, with a sign, city room, or something to that effect. I went in, and there were it's like a movie again, a bunch of reporters hanging around with their ties down a bit and smoking heavily. And I said, what's going on? And they asked me what's going on. And I told them about the theater. And they said, geez, what is it? So they turned up some radios and they found, sure enough, Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. So I ran down and told Tex and the two girls. It was now maybe four or five o'clock and they had a six o'clock train reservation. So we took him to the depot, but we left him, and we headed back to North Carolina to New River as fast as we could. And we got back there, I don't remember how long it took, but it wasn't too long. And the next morning, Bill Buse has us out, has the company formation, and we're talking, you know, he's talking about what we're going to do, and now we're at war, because up till now we were a company, but we were not at war. And I remember part of what he said, I've never forgotten, almost his exact words were after his speech, pep talk and so forth, he said something like, well, if we have to go to war, there's no one we'd rather kill than those fucking little yellow bastards. And everybody cheered like hell. And that was the first day, that was the day we declared war. And Germany declared war on us before we declared war, as I recall. We declared war then on all three, Germany, Japan, and uh, Italy. We didn't declare war on Russia, uh, but uh, because Russia by that time had been invaded by Germany and they, they were sort of a half-assed ally, but we did declare war on Germany and Italy, who had already declared war on us, and of course on Japan. That's where I was Pearl, when Pearl Harbor was bombed. So then the division formed and you went to Kwajalein? Well, the division was already formed. The guys who voted to go on Liberty the next weekend never got it. <laughs> but we, we continued training until the plans were evolved for, uh, not Kwajalein, but for Guadalcanal. Kwajalein came several years later. It was the 4th Marine Division. This is the first. I may have said 4th. Inadvertently, okay. yeah. But this was all the first Marines. All the first division. Marines, okay, because they went to Guadalcanal. First, we went to Wellington, New Zealand, on board. Half a third of the division was in Samoa already. The Seventh Marine Reg Regimental Combat Team was in Samoa, where they had been sent several months before, in order to keep the Japanese from taking Samoa, both British and American Samoa. We were defending them both with a Marine Corps brigade, not a defense battalion. They also sent some defense battalions. But the rest of the Marine Division, other than the 7th RCT, was still in New River. And uh, sometime in the spring, May or June, I've forgotten which, the division shoved off for San Francisco to go aboard ship for Wellington, New Zealand on the, the uh, Swedish-American liner Kungsholm. I don't know if you're aware of that, but this was a merchant marine ship. After Germany invaded Norway, the Swedes got worried that they might be next, and they had a very large shipping line, which was partially owned by U.S. lines, but mainly by the Swedish government. And uh, they shipped their major ships to the U.S. for safekeeping turned them over to U.S. lines. The largest ship in the Swedish fleet and the largest motor ship afloat was the MS Kungsholm. And that's what the, the 1st Marine Division, 
the two, the two uh, regimental combat teams went to New Zealand on. And I was in a stateroom. It was a luxurious cruise ship. It was the pride of the Swedish American liners. We had a merchant marine running it. We had civilian. Everyone was in the crew was a civilian. <clears throat> the waiters, we had it, the officers had to tip the waiters in the dining room. The waiters were dressed in waistcoats with white bow ties and white white gloves, and they they were pretty spiffy. The food wasn't very good, but the service was pretty damn good. But we had to pay for it. We we paid our own way for food, and we had to tip the waiters. The enlisted men had a much tougher time. They were down in the holes, living on, on a very, in very cramped quarters, and their food was lousy and it was served into their mess kits. It was really a crummy way to do it, but that's the way it turned out. The Marine Corps didn't like it, but it was the, the U.S. government ruling that, that that's the way it's going to be. And uh, we got, while we were on board ship, two things occurred. The Battle of Midway, which completely changed who had control of the sea and gave us a lot more freedom of action. And MacArthur's B, some of his B-17s, or one of them, discovered the Japanese were building an airfield on the island of Guadalcanal which would put them within bombing distance of Australia and parts of New Zealand. And it was determined by whoever makes these determinations that we had to take that airfield before it was completed. And there were no troops available to do it, really, except the two-thirds of the 1st Marine Division that were aboard ship when this was discovered, and the uh, some elements of the Second Marine Division, and the Raider First Raider Battalion was somewhere in the vicinity. So we landed in in Wellington, New Zealand, which is the capital of New Zealand. But the original plan was that we would go into training, further training in New Zealand, waiting for the arrival of additional troops, then we launch an offensive against the Japanese. What that offensive was to be, I have no idea. And as you may know, there was a question of who was in command of who. But there was a, there was the Pacific was divided into the South Pacific and the Southwest Pacific. The Southwest Pacific was given to MacArthur, <coughs> which included Australia and the Philippines, which we of course the Japanese had then, and some other islands, including New Britain and all of New Guinea, and uh, the South, South Pacific included New Zealand and the Solomon Islands and Bougainville and some other islands, I don't remember exactly. So Guadalcanal was in the South Pacific, not the Southwest Pacific. So even though MacArthur had discovered it, the Navy had command of it, of, it, of the deal. So it was decided to send the 1st Marine Division, what there was of it, and the 1st Raider Battalion, <coughs> and the one regiment or part of a regiment of the 2nd Division that was in the vicinity, as I said, to take Guadalcanal, and, and not only Guadalcanal, the Raider Battalion and the, and the Parachute Battalion, and the units of the 2nd Division were assigned to take Tulagi, which was about 40 miles across what got to be known as Iron Bottom Bay from Guadalcanal itself. It was Tulagi, Gavutu, and Tanambogo, three islands. Gavutu and Tanambogo were, were connected by a causeway. And uh, Tulagi was a Japanese seaplane base. And they were very heavily defended. The uh, Guadalcanal itself was lightly defended, and the first Marine, the rest of the first Marine Division, which was really two brigades, two regimental combat teams, landed on Guadalcanal. But the Navy didn't have enough ships in Wellington to take the whole of the division. They took most of the division, 
They could only take one or two tank companies at this point, I don't remember which. I think they took one tank company, so, and they were the light tanks that weren't worth a damn anyway. Bigger than the Marmon Harringtons, but still not very good. They only had room in their transports for one tank company, and the rest of us stayed in New Zealand in the rear echelon in Wellington. And, uh, but while the whole division was there, which was about a three-week period, we had to unload the Kung so, which was not combat loaded, and it rained every damn day. Everything got soaked. We worked in the rain. Then we had to reload, combat load, the attack transports that we were being, we went in about five ships, much smaller than the Kung so, and they were combat loaded. So what you use first, theoretically, what you're going to use first, went on last, and so forth. Whereas with the Kung Song, it was just wherever there was space, they put something. That was a real mess, especially with the rain. The New Zealand was a very social, I mean New Zealand was a very socialist country at the time. And uh, the Longshoremen Union, which was very left wing, would not work they had a contract, they don't have to work in the rain. And they wouldn't lift a finger to help us. They stayed in a covered building, which, which no sides to it, just the roof, but they were dry. Uh, booing the Marine Corps, swearing all kinds of things about us as, as the Marines in the rain worked to unload and reload. The division had to post MPs with loaded Tommy guns to keep the Marines from charging up the hill getting after these longshoremen who were who were booing them and giving them cat calls and the like. Anyway, the, the transports were ultimately loaded. The division took off. They had a, a rehearsal landing at Fiji, which I understand was pretty screwed up. And then they went and landed on Guadalcanal. Unfortunately, they took the Japanese by surprise. And uh, the landing was largely unopposed. They landed very close to Henderson, what became Henderson Field, the Japanese field. They took it right away, put up a perimeter defense, and most of the rest of the battle was a defensive battle instead of an offense. They landed these, not a hell of a lot of Marines, to take this airfield and defend it. And take the Tulagi battle was much bloodier initially than Guadalcanal, but the uh, Raider Battalion and the parachutists and the second unit, the unit of the second division took it in two or three days and kept it. And finally those units, some of them were sent over to Guadalcanal, the parachute battalion and the first Raider Battalion. And I think the second unit from the second division stayed and maybe later a defense battalion was sent to Tulagi. But uh, the Guadalcanal campaign was a defensive one for the Marines most of the time. The Navy had the hell knocked out of it on the third or second or third night in the Battle of Savo Island, which you probably heard about. We had four cruisers sunk. There were no battleships to sink. They were all at the bottom of Pearl Harbor at that time. But the biggest things we had were cruisers and carriers. There were no carriers involved. But we had five cruisers, four of which were sunk. The Chicago, the Vincennes, the Quincy, and I've forgotten the other one, and the Australian cruiser, which was their flagship, the Canberra. Uh, one of those five cruisers was severely damaged and never fought the war again. And the other four were sunk, including the Can Canberra. And the Japanese had full control. Those were the only cruisers we had down there at that time. We had destroyers and, and submarines, and later got a lot of other ships. But at that point, uh, we were out of action. So, and all the, the transports that supported the landing on Guadalcanal all left, and they were only half unloaded. So we had about a third of the 1st Marine Division, uh, two thirds, excuse me, and half of their equipment landed and all the ships are gone, the Japanese have control of the sea, and from then on we fought a, a defensive operation. Successful every time, but bloody. 
until finally, uh, and the Marine Corps aviation played a very big role in it. Uh, the Cactus Air Force, as it was called, uh, quickly used Henderson Field. The Marine fighters were flown off of some carrier, I forgot which one. The uh, first squadron to land was commanded by a Lieutenant Colonel Smith, I forgot his first name. I know him from Quantico, terrific guy, and uh, they, the Joe Foss was in that group, and so were the Bauer and some of these other guys that you mentioned, and uh, including Conger. And uh, their their biggest role was not supporting the ground troops on the ground so much as attacking the Japanese shipping coming in with with troops and munitions and so forth. Because now, for the rest of the time, the Japanese were landing on the other side of the island, landing troops until they had enough troops accumulated to make a push towards Henderson Field, and, and they would run into our positions. But the, uh, the, Air, the Cactus Air Force, which included Navy and some Army units from time to time, it was mainly Marine Corps, uh, under Geiger, who was the Marine Colonel at the time, I guess. Uh, the uh, Guadalcanal campaign, I was never involved in it except in one way. I made captain the day of the landing. I didn't know about it until a little bit later. And uh, when the news came up, caught up with me, that I was now a captain, I also had, our battalion got orders to send a captain back to the tank school which had just been formed, Marine Corps first tank school in, in a place called Jack's Farm in, near San Diego. And none of the people on the staff had heard any, had been in tanks under, under fire. None had combat experience. And the first tank battalion was ordered to send a captain back with, tank, with combat, tank combat experience. Well, really, no one had had any. And I was a brand new captain, promoted out of a job, really. I was a company executive officer in, in the rear echelon now. And uh, I'm a captain, too much rank for the job, and we have to send a captain back. So I was sent back. One of the best things that ever happened to me. But I did get to Guadalcanal, and purposely and accidentally. The, uh, I, was, I got my orders, and I was to go on a very small Navy cargo ship to Auckland, well no, to back to San Francisco, excuse me, six days delay in San Francisco, which was heaven. But the, uh, the ship went to Auckland, New Zealand first before going to San Francisco. And then while in Auckland, because it was such a small transport, I was the only passenger on the ship. It only had room for one passenger, and of course the only Marine. There were only five officers plus the captain. The uh, ship was given some mission, something to take up to Guadalcanal that they needed. And because the Japanese now had control of the sea, the Navy didn't want to send any big ships in there. So they sent this little cargo vessel. And of course I got to know the captain quite well. I was, I was the only passenger. And uh, we scooted into Guadalcanal. We were there two days while he unloaded and then took some stuff back. And during that time I went to, uh, I spent most of that two days with a Marine uh, Lieutenant by the name of, uh, of I'll think of his name in a moment. Yeah, just. He was a graduate of the second candidate's class, by the way. I was a tank platoon leader of the tank company that had gone to Guadalcanal. And he'd, they'd been employed only once for about two hours. The uh, Japanese invaded. They had a special battalion commanded by the emperor's nephew that landed not too far from where the division was. Apparently he was a very cocksure guy. Figured his battalion could land anywhere in destroy the Marines that were on the island. Of course, he was dead wrong. And they landed 
to the west of us, I guess, or south. It's hard for me to, I know it was to our left while we're facing the island. There was a very large coconut grove that was owned by a New Zealand, an Australian company. Many years later, that same company wanted to buy my company, the Australian company. Anyway, they, uh, they had this huge coconut grove, and the, uh, there were two rivers. The, one of them was the uh, Tenaru River. The other one, I think it was called the Ilu, Ilu, something like that. And the, the Marines, the 1st Marines, 1st Marine Regiment, was along the Tenaru River, facing this coconut grove. And the 1st the 5th Marine Regiment was along the other river. And then there was the ocean, Pacific Ocean, on the other side, and the Japanese were coming from the fourth side. They got into the middle of this coconut grove, just a battalion, only about 800, 900 troops. And we, although we were not a full division, we had a hell of a lot more than that. And they were caught in the middle of this coconut grove. And during the camp, during the fighting, which went on for most of a day, while they were trying to hide here, there, wherever, and firing into the Marine lines. Marines took very few casualties the, in that camp, in that operation. The uh, General Colonel Cates later was commandant and uh, was at that time commanding officer as a colonel of the 1st Marine Regiment and of the RCT. Sent his tank platoon, he only had, probably only had a platoon, sent his tank platoon into the uh, coconut grove to see what they could do. And they had a field day because the Japanese had no anti-tank weapons with them. They had rifles, hand grenades, mortars, nothing you could, these were crummy light tanks. And they only had a 37 millimeter gun, but the 37 had, a, had canister ammunition as well as high explosive. And uh, canister, even in the 37 millimeter, was a very good weapon against infantry troops in the open nearby. The range was short, but it was firing these, it was like an overgrown shotgun, and very effective in certain situations, of which this was an ideal one. So they, the, the, uh, these tanks spent an hour or two just running over Japanese, shooting them with their machine guns and canister. Finally, one Japanese trooper was able to stick his rifle in, in the bogey wheels of one of the tanks and disable it. He didn't hurt anybody inside. And by the way, the light tanks had a four-man crew, whereas the mediums had five, so there were only four men in. And uh, that tank was disabled and couldn't move. So Case, Leo Case, that was the name of the, the uh, platoon leader. Leo said one, the tanks had escape hatches in the base. You could crawl from one to the other. He moved one tank up to where it was touching the, the disabled tank, and the other three tanks were circling around, like the old Western movies, the, circling around the, uh, the uh, covered wagons. And one man would leave, one of the four, th through the escape hatch, go into the next tank, and that tank would pull out and join the tanks going around and next one tank would pull in. He, he rescued all four men and sometime thereafter or right after that, Colonel Cates, I keep getting Cates and Case mixed up, but, but uh, General, later General Case, Cates, who was commanding the 1st Division, called Leo on the phone, on the radio and said, okay, you've got your men out of there, now come on back. And Leo Case, who got the Navy Cross for that action, called back or responded the way I did on Roy, but, but he got the Navy Cross instead of a court martial. He, uh, he said, Colonel, let me say I'm too busy killing Japs. And he cut him off. And he stayed and killed a few more, and then, then uh, he returned. And that was the only time tanks were used on Guadalcanal that I'm aware of. But I spent two nights with Leo Case, and he told me there 
main thing they encountered, we discussed it at some length, were Japanese infiltrators planning or trying to plant explosives on the tanks, or when tanks were moving, Japanese would plant a, a uh, magnetic mine on the, or try to on the side of a tank, and because they had no anti-tank guns of any that were any good, but they had lots of explosives. And he told me what they were doing, how they would handle the bivouac at night to keep the infiltrators away, and what had worked and what didn't seem to work, and, and ideas they had, but they weren't able to execute for falling the, uh, the magnetic mines. And we found out a way to do it when I got back to the States. We just put lumber on the sides of the tank, and magnetic mine would not stick. And if they held an explosive on a pole up against it, we had the uh, lumber two inches away from the armor plate, so the force of the explosion would be dissipated. We did a lot of things that we learned on the two days that I was on Guadalcanal. And we had a little naval gunfire from the Japanese, which was my first baptism of fire. But it wasn't too significant. And uh, I was in a foxhole with Leo. and. Uh, Nothing hit us, thank God. So the next day, the captain had to leave. I knew we were leaving, and I went to say, we got to ride back out to the ship. The next stop was we went back to Auckland and then back to Wellington. And here I am, damn near three weeks after I left Wellington for San Francisco, I'm still in Wellington. <laughs> but now we took off for San Francisco, and that was the next and final stop. And uh, it was a memorable cruise in a couple of ways. But naturally, the Navy, the five Navy officers, were giving me a lot of uh, razzing about being a Marine. And when the captain and I had gotten, he was a lieutenant commander, and I was a cap, I was a new captain, so I was the equivalent of a lieutenant. The senior naval officer, besides the captain, was a lieutenant J.G. There were, I think, there were one or two of them, and and uh, a couple of or three ensigns. So I was senior to everybody on board the ship other than the captain. So the captain and I cooked up a little deal because I wanted to get back at these bastards. So I asked him for his help and we worked out a plan. He issued an order, henceforth no officers in the wardroom would be served dinner until the order was given by the commanding officer present who would be passenger, or worse than that, I don't know how he worded it, and anyway, it would be me. So I, uh, with that, I purposely was a little late to dinner, and they're all waiting for me to come and give the order to eat, and I came in and said, gentlemen, please rise. They had to stand up. There are just five of them. And I said, now, before we serve dinner, we're going to sing a little ditty, which goes like this. 10,000 dodge, pardon me, 10,000 gobs chased one sick marine, 10,000 more stood by and swore it was the fairest fight they'd ever seen. <laughs> so I said, when you sing that to my satisfaction, we will have dinner. <laughs> so that, that ended, I mean, that, they had to wait till I gave the okay, I let them sing it two or three times, and that was the end of the razzing. <laughs> and we didn't do that anymore, and they didn't res me anymore. That's great. I did one other thing on board the ship, which was kind of fun. The, the captain told me he had an arsenal of, arsenal of about 20 Springfield rifles, O3s, which is what the Marines were armed with. And he said, but nobody knows how to handle them. Would you give our troops, my crew, instructions on the care and cleaning of the Springfield rifle and how to fire it. I loved it, so we had some balloons or something. We, I gave them all rifle instruction, how to tear it down, put it together, keep it clean, and how to aim it and fire it. And this was this helped pass the time. And then we'd go out on the deck a few at a time, and we'd put balloons over the side, or some other items, I've forgotten which, and we'd fire at them and see who could hit them and who couldn't. And it was great. 
So that's how I pass most of my time on that ship. One day, we're all alone, no convoy, going back to San Francisco. And small ship, obviously. The rudder got jammed, and we're circling. And now I think, oh Christ, they've gone through all this. Some submarine's going to come along and see us as a sitting duck and sink us. So, but that didn't happen, fortunately. A couple of guys went over the side, and they were finally able to straighten out the rudder. I don't know what the problem, I never did know what the problem was. And we stopped circling and headed on for San Francisco. The San Francisco episode is too long to tell now, but too good to miss. How are we going to handle that? Um, well, we're down to near the end of this tape. So, you want some more water and stand up and take a little break? Because we still have a little more to go if you got the time. Well, let's go ahead and, until we run out. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop. I should say always, but from about the middle 1920s on, wanted some kind of tank for landing operations. And because of the, the Navy's uh, lack of, uh, of equipment to get tanks ashore, the Marine Corps decided that they would have to have very, very light tanks, lighter than had ever been in combat. And that's when they, Marmon Harrington was making high-speed tractors, light tractors and high-speed to carry Marine Corps artillery ashore in the 1920s and 30s. And they made a deal with, with Marmon Harrington, by they I mean the Marine Corps, to build a tank out of the tractor. And they came up with the one like Marie that I burned up. That was, that was the, uh, they made ten of those, five were on the west coast and five in the east coast. And those were the only tanks that the Marmon Harrington had at that point, had made. And, uh, but those light tanks were, would not be very effective. The Marine Corps had no real experience to determine that. Uh, but those of us, but Marine Corps was smart enough to create tank units. And the tank units were trained by officers who were sent to Fort Knox to Army Armor Schools and who then had to uh, combine what they learned there with what they, the conditions that they found that existed in the Fleet Marine Force and to evolve a doctrine of their own, which is what we did. So at some point then, uh, you're, you're basically in uh, a position where you're training other Marines to be tankers, is that what you're doing? Well, when I came, that's what I was sent back from the South Pacific to do. I was sent back from the 1st Tank Battalion of the 1st Marine Division, ostensibly to bring some combat tank experience to the staff of the newly established Marine Corps Tank School. Marine Corps never had their own tank school up until that point. And sometime in the late summer or fall of 1942, the uh, Marine Corps established a tank school at a place called Jack's Farm. Jacques, J-A-Q-U-E-S, uh, but most Marines call it Jack's, just outside of, Sa of San Diego in Mission Bay. And uh, they didn't have anybody on the staff who had seen any tank action because we, had, we hadn't had any yet. Guadalcanal was the first. And the division was supposed to send a tank officer from Guadalcanal with some tank combat experience back to the staff. And that's how you ended up back in. And, so I, and I had not had any combat experience. I, but I did, uh, fortunately, I was able to spend a few days at Guadalcanal, talk to Leo Case. Yeah, you mentioned that. Who, yes, who had, uh, he really commanded the only tank action that took place in U.S. forces in World War II up to that point. Well, how long, at what point do you finish up on the staff and get ready to go back overseas again? Well, the, as I think I mentioned, when I reported into the tank school, I was given uh, General, Colonel, then Colonel Hagaboom, who was running all the schools in the San Diego area. 
uh, gave me, made a deal, amazing, that I would get command of the first tank company that would be formed, which would not be for another five, four or five or six months. And at that, and prior to that, I could be selecting people that I wanted in my company from among the students and the instructors. And if there were students graduating that I wanted, I had permission to make them instructors and keep them back. Is this what? where you found the, the lieutenant became the governor of Oklahoma? Oh, yes, yeah, yeah, we, yes it, Hank Bellman. Yeah. I found everybody for the for C Company 1st Tank, 4th Tank Battalion, which is was formed in May of 1943 at the tank school. That was my company. I, that, I was given command of that company. And yes, Bellman was some months before that, that incident that I tell you took place. So when you get orders to go back overseas, do you go over as part of a division? Yes. What, what the, each Marine division in those days, and probably still, has a tank battalion as part of the division. The, when I joined the 1st Marine Division in, the, in very early June 1941, uh, the division had a uh, conglomeration of units slumped together in what was called Division Special Troops, commanded by a Colonel Hawthorne, who was an administrative command that he had, because there were parachute battalion, the tank battalion, and uh, an anti-aircraft battalion, and a few other units all lumped together, not as a tactical unit, just administratively. And eventually, uh, the tank battalion was taken, well, the whole Division Special Troops was ultimately disbanded sometime in the summer of 1941. And the units were parceled out, or were just, they were, the units remained, but the tank battalion had not, I've gotten a little mixed up here, there was no tank battalion in the 1st Marine Division at that time. Go ahead, I'm just... The, in Division Special Troops, there was one tank company, and there was a scout company that Bill Buse, I think you said you knew him. Yeah. He was the CEO, he was a captain, and he was my commanding officer. This is where you had the motorcycles? Right. Yeah. The 1st Scout Company was a mechanized reconnaissance unit, and it included one platoon of those Marmon Harrington tanks, the only ones on the East Coast, the other five were on the West Coast. And plus there was a tank company called A Company Tanks, I think, something like that. In the fall of 41, shortly before Pearl Harbor, the first tank battalion was formed, and from that time on, every Marine division had a tank battalion composed of three tank companies and uh, the one I went out with from Jack's Farm was the 4th Tank Battalion, which was the Tank Battalion of the 4th Marine Division. And we were formed in May. We trained by we, I mean, see, my company. We trained separately from everyone else at Camp Pendleton for about three months. Trained very, very uh, extensively but not with any other troops. Then we were, the last three months of the six months that we spent at Camp Pendleton, we, we trained with the 23rd Marine Regiment because the Marine Corps had adopted a policy of creating what they called regimental combat teams, RCTs as they were known, which the, the heart of which was one of the, each division had three infantry regiments and each infantry regiment was the core of a regimental combat team. And it was commanded by the colonel who commanded that regiment. And attached to that regiment, as part of the regimental combat team, was an artillery battalion, an engineer battalion, an anti-aircraft battalion, and among other things, a tank company. And uh, for the, the theory was that in a landing operation, this is the way it was conducted. You had three, that a division was involved in, it had three regimental combat teams, 
and no loose ends. Everybody was in one or the other of the three regimental combat teams, except for division headquarters. They were kept separate, as I recall. But anyway, the second three months, starting, uh, let's see, May, April, May, June, July, maybe we had four months before we went, moved in with the infantry, but the last three months before we went overseas, and we went overseas, we left New Year's Eve between 41, 41 and 42, 40, pardon me, 43 and 44. We, uh, up until that time, we trained with the regiment that we were supporting in an RCT. But the time, at the time the 4th Tank Battalion was formed, all the tanks in the Marine Corps were now light tanks, not the little Marmon Harringtons, but standard army light tank. And we got brand new ones, a new model. Mechanically, it was a great vehicle. It was the M15 light tank made by Cadillac, or made by General Motors, but powered by two Cadillac V8 engines. And it was the only tank in the world that I know of that had an automatic transmission. One of the main things you had to teach in tank driving school was how to double clutch in changing gears in a tank because you had all that weight that you had to shift. And so gears were shifted by double clutching. Normally in a car that had, didn't have automatic transmission, had, had manual transmission, you pushed in the clutch, you moved it, the gear shift to the next speed, then you pull out, you let go of the clutch, and you're in that speed. But with a tank, you had to go down and move it, and then go down again, and it's a technique that you had to learn. But with the, with the M15 tanks, there was none of that. It was all automatic, what they called then hydromatic transmission. But about a month or so before we went overseas with the 4th Division, the Marine Corps made a decision to equip one company of our battalion with medium tanks, the Sherman tank, which was a standard army battle tank, main, the main battle tank, because the Navy now had the means to get them ashore with their new ships, I think I described the landing ship dock. Right. And so, as an experiment, since they never had, well, really were heavy tanks before, the Marine Corps decided to take just one of the three companies of each battalion and give them, re-equip them with medium tanks. And my company was selected to be the one from the 4th Tank Battalion. And so about a month before we went overseas, we turned in our light tanks for the medium tanks. And that's what we fought the war with. The medium tanks were so, proved so much more effective in their very first campaign, which was, was Kwajalein Atoll that the Marine Corps immediately decided, now that they had the means to get them ashore, it's ridiculous to screw around with light tanks, and everything shifted to medium tanks. And from then on, that's all the Marine Corps had. Now you had 15 tanks plus the XO and the CO. Right. So there were 17 tanks. Plus one other tracked vehicle, which was the tank retriever, which was a tank chassis with a big boom to pull disabled tanks out of the battlefield repair them and so forth. So you only really had a month with your new tank to learn about them and get ready to take them? Well, we we, uh, we had to learn on the fly, that's right. But fortunately, at the tank school at Jack's Farm, there we had a number of medium tanks for instruction purposes, even though there were none attached to any combat unit. And so our maintenance men we're not unfamiliar with medium tanks, as we had, we had medium tank maintenance training at the tank school, so it wasn't completely new to us. So, where did you board ship then? Where did you load your stuff? San Diego. Then? The the when the Fourth Marine Division left for the invasion of Kwajalein, there were a couple of unique things about it. It was the first time in the war. The troops loaded out in the U.S. and unloaded on a hostile shore. We went directly from San Diego to Kwajalein. 
And uh, another thing about it that was was uh, different, or that was unique, was when we captured Kawajalin, that was the first pre-World War II Japanese territory taken from the Japanese. They owned Kawajalin. The, uh, it's an interesting story, I suppose. In World War I, when the war ended, the Japanese who were on our side in World War I, although they didn't engage in much fighting, were given a mandate over German possessions in the Pacific. The Germans owned Kwajalein Atoll and Anahuitak Atoll, and uh, Kwajalein is the largest atoll in the world, and they owned a couple of others, I suppose. And the, they were turned over to the Japanese in 1918. When we took it back in uh, 1944, we weren't taking back our own territory, we were taking away from the Japanese what had been their territory for 25 years or so. So those were two rather unique things about Kwajalein. Now we, in another tape, went through the battle in Kwajalein. And what I'd like to do is go through, we know what you did at Kwajalein now, the pulling out of Kwajalein, where did you go and get ready for the next operation? Okay. The 4th Division was fortunate enough to have as its base camp overseas the island of Maui. We, had a, we, we, re, we went from Kwajalein to Maui to a camp that had been built just for us. It was like going from hell to heaven, you could say, each time, because we went back there after all three campaigns. Then. Uh, we were we were re-equipped and, re and continued training, and left Maui for Saipan. Now, having fought your first real serious battle with the, the medium tanks at Kwajalein, had you come up with new ideas about what you were going to do when you hit Saipan? I mean, it, it, had you learned some things that you? Yeah, we learned a couple of things that we we did before we we showed off for Saipan. They had to, to do, well, one of the main things we learned was our theory that the Japanese who might be attacking the tanks with infantry in, in close quarters when you're in the jungle or so forth, jump out and jump on a tank with explosives, suicide bombers in effect, we learned that we could knock them all off with a machine gun fire. The tanks created a sort of a diamond formation in close quarters. And each tank had the responsibility of, a, of protecting some tank. We, we worked that all out. So and the first time we, the, the way we did that evolved from what happened in Kwajalein with the same Hank Bellman, I think I mentioned. He had, one of Bellman's tanks was commanded by a Corporal Giba. I remember I can see him so clearly. Good Marine, good NCO. And they were in some jungle area of Namur when a whole group of Japs jumped out on their tank, on Giba's tank, which was the lead tank at that point, apparently. I was not present. I was about maybe a few hundred yards away, and I didn't see this, but I heard it all on the radio. And uh, Giba was, a, <laughs> he was pretty excited. He's, he's yelling into his mic to Hank Bellman, something like, this guy is looking at me through my periscope. And he was excited, because he thought they were placing explosive charges on his tank. And Bellman very calmly said, Relax, Mike, we're shooting them off like fish in a barrel. And that's when we sort of evolved the method of, of the tanks protecting each other with machine gun fire from just that kind of thing in close quarters. But we learned eventually to do a couple of other things to the tanks. We already talked about putting the wood planking mm -hmm. 
with a two inch airspace between the lumber and the armor plate of the tank. We had a few anti tank projectiles that went through the lumber and through the armor plate on Kwajalein, on the moor, not on Roy. And so we decided we needed more protection. And so we, we, we uh, welded a lot of little st studs, maybe just under two inches in length, of uh, reinforcing bar, welded all over the side of each tank. And we still had the uh, U-shaped uh, parts of which we bolted two by twelves. And now we, we took a one by four, nailed it to the bottom of the two by twelves. We had a perfect concrete form, and we poured concrete into the into that area. So now a projectile would have to go through. Well, it had no problem going through two inches of wood, but then it was faced with two inches of reinforced concrete before it ever hit the armor plate. We 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 learned a lot of things on on Kowachilin that we. Uh, employed, I, I think I talked about them, the telephone on the back of the yeah. tank. And the cover over the hatch that had left airspace. <coughs> so well, I, well, that was a different one. That, that's right. That's, I hadn't gotten to that yet. The, the, the armor plate, the reinforcing, or the reinforced steel, or rather concrete, the telephones on the back, the bird cages on the top, mm -hmm. and we learned to wrap our, the, our tracks were all steel, and the turret was, was round. We couldn't put tube of 12s and pour concrete on the turret. It just didn't lend itself to that. The sides of the tank were flat. So we took, we took, a, decided we could take extra track and wrap it around the sides of the uh, turrets. So the turrets now had some extra steel, and the, the tracks, there was airspace there, so we carried extra track, and at the same time gave the turret a little extra protection. And so now, you do you go in then when you hit Saipan? Are these modifications on all your tanks? Yes, all of them. They're already, and are are you in charge of a company of tanks? Is that what you're? I was in command of a company of tanks. C Company, 4th Tank Battalion, from the time it was organized at the tank school in the spring of 43 till through its, all of its campaigns, which was we fought on Roy, then Namur, and Kwajalein, and Saipan, then Tinian, then Iwo Jima. After Iwo Jima, and I had been a major for about a year at that point, and was just about to make lieutenant colonel. Today that would sound silly because you don't make it that fast. No. But, but guys are getting killed at a much faster rate than they are right now in Iraq, unfortunately. Uh, and so promotions were fairly fast. Besides which, the Marine Corps was expanding as well. So I was about to make lieutenant colonel, and after Iwo Jima, the battalion commander was transferred to a uh, headquarters job. At Pearl Harbor, and I was the senior major, and we had three majors in our tank battalion, four majors, three besides myself. The other three were on the battalion staff as the, the exec, the operations officer, and I forgot what the third one was. One of those three majors was Leo Case, the same guy that had fought the Battle of the Tanaru River, and uh, he took over Midway through the Iwo campaign, he took over one of the companies whose company commander was a casualty. But after we got back to Maui from Iwo, and our battalion commander is gone, General Kate sent for me and uh, told me that uh, he would now, uh, he, he, and I was now the battalion commander and he was delighted. And so was I, because I wanted to command a battalion. I had my own ideas on how battalions should be run, which differed from my battalion commander. 
but I, and by the way, he had asked me, Jim, uh, Dick Schmidt, he'd asked me if I would be his executive officer long before what I'm relating now, when I first made major, I guess, which was right after Kwajalein. But I, I respectfully declined. I mean, he could have ordered me to it, but he didn't, because I felt much more comfortable running a company than being the executive officer to anybody. And so, but now he was gone, and I was a senior major, and, and I had battalion, the command of the battalion for about three days, and I, I was delighted. And all of a sudden, a guy shows up, an old friend of mine, who had been in the first tank battalion with me, Louis Walseth, who was a lieutenant colonel, and I'm still a major. And I said, look, Wally, what are you doing here? He said, I'm here to take the battalion. He said, after Guadalcanal, I was sent back to the States, and I was back there for over a year at Headquarters Marine Corps, and you're not supposed to be at Headquarters Marine Corps longer than a year. Somebody looking down the record said, ah, we've got a tank officer who's been here for over a year, Lieutenant Colonel, and there's a tank battalion, 4th tank battalion, that doesn't have a Lieutenant Colonel. Out he goes. So, Wally asked me if I would be his exec. I had no choice, of course. Oh, you're, you're so dead. I said, sure. Just about two or three days later, and I was really pissed off about this, frankly, yeah. because I, I was losing my opportunity to be a battalion commander. And we were preparing for the invasion of Japan itself. And when uh, we got orders about three or four days later, uh, an order came down from division, actually from headquarters Marine Corps, ordering our battalion to send one of its four majors to Okinawa to replace the tank battalion commander who was a casualty battlefield replacement, in other words. And uh, Wally Walseth looked at the, he called the, the other three majors and myself together and read the order. And he said, I hate like hell to send you, any of you guys back into combat so soon after Iwo Jima. But he said, I have no choice, so we're going to destroy us to see who goes. And when he was saying that, I thought, my God, this is my chance to run a battalion and run it in combat, and I was delighted. So I said, Colonel, no need for that. I volunteer to go, much to the relief of the other three majors. <laughs> and so that's how I got to Okinawa. But that was all after Saipan, Tinian, and Iwo Jima. Well, can we go back then and talk about the invasion of Saipan, how sure. that went? Saipan was, uh, at the time that it occurred, was the bloodiest battle of the war up till that time, at least the war in the Pacific. It was planned to be an invasion by two Marine divisions, the fourth, the second and the fourth, with a, an Army National Guard division in floating reserve, which wasn't really felt would be needed. But they were in floating reserve, and the floating reserve, the, in those invasions in World War II, Normally, the Marine Corps was involved, depending on the size of the operation, usually there were two Marine divisions in the assault, and one division could be Marine or Army in floating reserve, and the floating reserve was just one of those things like insurance policy, you don't expect, or lifeboats on a ship, you don't really think you're going to need them, but you've got them in case you do. You may want to land a regimental combat team or maybe even two regimental combat teams from the floating reserve, seldom ever a whole division. On Iwo Jima, for instance, just to skip for a moment, the landing was the 4th and the 5th Marine Divisions in the assault, with the 3rd Marine Division in floating reserve, and two RCTs of the three in the 3rd Marine Division were ultimately landed because we were running out of troops. It's a lot, it was a great deal of discussion after the campaign that all three of the regimental combat teams should have been landed, that it would have cut the time to take the island down because we'd have more fresh 
trained troops, but that's uh, past history. But for, uh, for Saipan, you had the 4th and 2nd Divisions, and we were in the 4th. And uh, there was a big reef, even larger than the reef around Kawajanin, that the tanks had to cross before, or all troops had to cross before getting into the beach. And for that reason, we were given fording gear, just as we had been for Kawajanin, which permitted a tank to, under its own power, to go through, to cross a reef if the water was no, le no deeper than about eight feet. And uh, generally it was three or four feet. The landing craft couldn't cross the reef because there wasn't enough water. And a tank without fording gear would probably drown out. But there was a problem that had been uncovered. You asked what we might have learned in Kowajalin. I wasn't there, but we learned more in Saipan, um, Tarawa than anywhere else. And one of the main, because it was the first time that a heavily defended atoll was attacked. And the first time the attack had to go across a reef. And uh, we learned many, many things, but one of them was tanks needed fording gear. But they needed one other thing. We decided, we learned this at Kowajalin. I forgot to mention it. The reefs had what we called, I'm trying to think of the name of them now, there were holes in the reef. Some were naturally caused through events over the years, but most of which were where bombs dropped, missed the island, hit the reef, and blew a big hole. And then below the reef, maybe 8 or 10 or 12 feet, was the sandy bottom of the ocean. So if a tank was making its way across the reef, and we hit one of these potholes, that's what I was trying to think of, if it didn't have fording gear, even if it did have fording gear, it would drop down maybe 12 feet, and there was no way you could get anybody out. So that happened to uh, a couple of the light tanks on Kwajalein didn't happen to, uh, to mine, fortunately. But we decided we would guarantee that it won't happen at, at Saipan. So we were able to procure from the Red Cross goggles and fins that you use in scuba diving. And with the, also the uh, little air thing that you can chew on and breathe. And so we, we devised a system where we took, you know, there are a lot of excess tankers in a tank company, about 165 men, and you only have 17 tanks of five men each in a medium tank. So there's still a lot left over who are ma mainly, ma excuse me, mainly maintenance people and who know all about tanks. And uh, we put these were all volunteers for the job. We put one guy in front of each tank, equipped with fins and goggles and a snorkel, swimming face down about 10 feet in front of the tank. Each tank had one. Plus the guy had a roll of toilet paper. And as he would swim, <coughs> looking through the goggles, he could easily spot a pothole. And he'd just swim around it, but he'd be releasing the toilet paper. And, the, you know, you're partly blind in a tank, even with all the periscopes. The tank driver would follow the, the toilet paper. There was no surf inside the reef. We were inside the lagoon. So you could do it. <coughs> and uh, we got around every pothole. We didn't fall in a single pothole. This was just my company. Three other tanks in our battalion did fall into potholes and most of the guys drowned. But we got all of ours ashore satisfactorily. Also, something that uh, is of interest, I, I was at least of interesting to me, in every amphibious assault, each unit is assigned a place where they're supposed to land and a, a, a position in the hierarchy of when you get there. 
the first wave, the second wave, the third wave. Go ahead. The, uh, the, my tanks were assigned to go in uh, on a specific uh, timetable, but also in the in, in Saipan, where we were land, where the Fourth Marine Division was landing, was a town called Charon Kanoa, and it had the largest of the sugar mills on the island right there. And the Japanese had built a pier that went out from the beach all the way to the end of the reef. And the reef was oh maybe eight or nine hundred yards. It was a big reef. This pier went all the way out there, and then they had dug a channel on one side of the reef. Go ahead, I'm just checking. Parallel to the reef, and where ships could then come in down this channel alongside of the pier, tie up, load sugar cane, unload whatever they were bringing in, and get out. And there was a uh, concrete ramp leading from the beach to this channel. And somebody in division headquarters had decided, well, it's ready made for tanks. You get up on the beach through this concrete channel. And we were assigned, all the tanks in the 4th Tank Battalion were assigned to go, go in through this channel. You didn't have to be a genius to come to the conclusion that the Japanese would have that channel pretty well zeroed in. And we, so we declined to do that. And uh, none of, I don't think any tanks ever got ashore through that channel, but we didn't even try. We were going to go to the beach, but we were concerned about the best place to land. And uh, we were concerned, well, what I really meant to say was that we were worried about underwater obstacles that the Japanese might have erected which would t tear up a tank or tie it up or prevent it from landing. Just about the time we're trying to decide where the hell to land, a small boat came out from the beach with an underwater demolition team on board that they'd been, they'd been swimming in there and destroying the underwater obstacles. And I knew one of the officers on this boat, and I hailed him. And, uh, he pulled over and I jumped in and I said, I want to talk to you. And so I asked him, told him our problem and we're wondering where the hell we should go and is there a spot where we won't encounter these underwater obstacles close to the beach? And he said, yes, they cleared them all out. If I go, and just then there was a huge explosion on the beach, which turned out a bunch of Japanese torpedoes had been blown up unintentionally and uh, kill a few marines when it happened, but a, a huge pall of smoke. And just then this officer from the underwater demolition team said, see that smoke, head right for that, you're okay. So we did. And we got all of our tanks ashore. Now you're in what kind of a boat now? Or? Uh, well, we are in landing craft. The we were on a landing ship dock for, for Kwajalein and for Saipan both, which is where we had this new amphibious assault ship that had a well deck. They would flood. Tanks would, on the beach, the, the friendly beach, not the one we were attacking. Tanks, each tank in turn would back onto a landing craft called LCM, standing for landing craft medium. And so you had 18 LCMs, each with a tank on board. The tank facing forward, because they backed on. The LCM would then raise the ramp and swim out into the stream where the landing ship dock was anchored. They, had, they would get there and each, there was enough room for nine LCMs on each side, starboard and port side, there was a stern gate which would be open. The well deck would be flooded with about four feet of water, which is what the LCMs required. They had to have at least four feet to, not to broach. 
they each backed in on an angle. So you had nine LCMs on one side and nine on the other on, a, on an angle about like this. As soon as that all nine were aboard, the stern gate was closed, the water was pumped out, the LCMs were chained down so they wouldn't move during the Trans-Pacific crossing, so to speak. And when we got off the beach where we were going to land, the first thing it did was unchain the LCMs, then open the stern gates, flood the oil deck, and 18 LCMs would come swimming out. One tank each? One tank each. And that was the, that was the perfect way to do it. If, if, if an LCM got hit, you only lost one tank. They were spread out. They, uh, you didn't have to do any transferring. It's already done. Just swim out. But then you got to get to the beach. And the, the LCMs were low in the water, even lower yet with a tank on board. And that's, in answer to your question, that's what we were on. So on Saipan, when you hit the beach, how were you used and deployed then? Okay, I had sent in, we had devised a tactic among other things, to send a reconnaissance team of tank people ashore with the first wave. So they could do a couple of things. They could uh, reconnoiter and make sure that, that, that the tanks could actually land where we were assigned to land, it wouldn't bog down or be hemmed in by boulders or whatever. And then they were there also to provide tank liaison personnel for the battalion commanders of the infantry battalions that we were in there to support. So when we, when we got to where we landed, it wasn't where we were, where our, the troops we were supporting were, it was slightly off from them. But there were, when I, my tank landed, there were two guys from the, it was a six-man reconnaissance team. And there were two guys there from the team waiting for me because they could see us coming in. And the battalion commander of the battalion that was to take the, the sugarcane mill at Charenkanoa wanted, wanted us. So this guy guided me and the company following me to this infantry battalion commander, maybe five or six hundred yards or a thousand yards down the beach. I reported to the battalion commander, in effect, here we are, what can we do for you? Now would you get in your tank and drive there or would you? All, the, all, all, all 18 tanks, including the tank retriever, went single file down the beach to this, where we were being guided by this reconnaissance man, to the battalion commander at his command post, the infantry battalion commander. That battalion landing team, as they were known, because it had a lot of units attached to it, as it was one of the three main units of the regimental combat team. Anyway, he told me that he would like us to do a reconnaissance of force, I guess you could call it, of the, the town of Sharon Kanoa to find out what the hell is in there. So we did. It was a kind of an eerie feeling. We were all buttoned up, of course. We didn't know what the hell was in the town. It was a big town for Saipan, second biggest. Carapan, it turned out, was the main city, but this was almost as large. Carapan was several miles distant. And uh, we went all through it. We didn't see a soul. We fired into a few buildings just to see if anybody would come out. They didn't. We made a complete, well, we went down every street. What we didn't know and didn't find out till later, we didn't find it out, somebody else did. The sugar mill, which was at one edge of town, had a very high smokestack went up several hundred feet, and on top of that smokestack was a team of Japanese, uh, well they were there to, to coordinate the fire of the Japanese inland on the Marines on the beach. They had a bird's eye view of the yeah. whole operation, and a radio of course, contact, and we didn't know they were there. And they were really causing a hell of a lot of damage. 
and the uh, eventually, sometime that first day, and I don't recall even if I ever knew how it was discovered they were up there, but it was was discovered, and so we were asked if we would uh, obliterate the smokestack at one stage of the game, uh, sometime during the afternoon of the day on Saipan, and we did. And it came tumbling down. Now, when you say reconnaissance in force, are you spread out or single file, or how do you... We, went, we did that, as I recall, in single file. We just, we went, wound our way through the town, through every street. And the town was, in fact, empty? It was, yes, the town was empty. The only thing there were the two guys on the, <laughs> the smokestack, smoke which we didn't see. And, but what the, the thing that made Sa the Saipan landing as bloody as it was, was the topography of Saipan. It had the main, the highest point in the island was a mountain called Mount Tapacho, I think. And it had spreading out from it a ridge line going both north and south. The island was, ran lengthwise north and south. We actually attacked from the west going east. And, uh, but the ridge line paralleled the beach about 2,000 yards inland from the beach. And between the ridge line and the beach, there was very little cover, it was flat. And the, on the, what we call a military crest of the ridge line, the Japanese had built a road, a sunken road, and they had artillery virtually hub to hub with the, the tubes of the guns resting on the, if this is, if the road was the sunken road, was bad so deep, the road's down here, and, and this is all the side of the ridge. The tubes were just resting there. They were firing point blank at the Marines on the beach, uh, coming across the reef, trying to get from the beach to the ridge. And they were causing terrible casualties, which is why it was, uh, as bloody as it turned out to be, and the uh, go ahead. The objective was to take that ridge line, and then planning the attack. The whoever planned it had planned that the infantry would, who were going in the first wave, all went ashore in amphibious tractors to get across the reef. We learned from Traro when we did this on Kawajalin as well. But they were going to, instead of disembarking at the, the beach, they were supposed to proceed inland to this ridge. Well, they couldn't do it. They were just blowing them up right out of the, out of the ground. So the first day was a mess. And it was the uh, regimental commander, the RCT commander in the area where we were, held a conference in his command post and they planned a new attack for the following day. This was very late in the day. And what, what the plan was, was my tanks, because we were supporting this particular regiment, my tanks would go, there was a road that led from Charon Kanoa up over this ridge and to the airfield, Aslito Airfield, which was perhaps another three or four miles beyond the ridge line and the ridge was several hundred yards in from the beach. And this road went straight. And the, the uh, plan was, it didn't quite work, but the plan was that the tanks would go first. We could only go single file. It was not a, wasn't a I-10 highway. It was a relatively one-lane road, but it was a straight road. And it, where it went through the, uh, over the ridge, it didn't go all over, it went through it went up a certain distance, but then it cut through the ridge, and then it went down the other side, and went all the way to Aslito Airfield. But we were rather concerned with our tanks about, we didn't like to be roadbound, because we were concerned about mines on the road, but we were also worried when we, after we left Sharon Kanoa in the, in the first day, D-Day, when I told about the reconnaissance and force, the next thing we did 
we were ordered to head for the ridge line. The infantry would follow us. And my first platoon was in the, in the lead. Bob Reed, who was, no, he was my executive officer at that point. But he was in the lead for some reason. Right, my tank was right behind his, and his tank virtually disappeared into what was marked on the map as Lake Sussipi, but you couldn't see it because it was a marsh. And he went right down into it. Go ahead, it's just my... And we, so we, we got, we were able to pull his tank out. <coughs> but we were then, we backed off and had to find another way to get to the ridge because we were concerned about this damn lake. Tanks can't operate in a, in a marsh like that where they just disappear. So uh, the plan was for the second day that we were to go single file up this road and the infantry would follow us in amphibious tractors. Now amphibious tractors had very little, in those days, very little armor plate and they're wide open on top. Hand grenades can be lobbed in and so forth. So it wasn't, it wasn't exactly a, a plan for success. But we didn't know what was behind us. My tanks, I don't remember how many I had at that point, but probably at least 15. We're going up this road, and we had the biggest field day that we've ever had. We got into the cut through the, over the ridge line. The cut was, went through about, I'd say maybe two or three hundred yards from where it entered the ridge before it came out the other side. It was about 20 feet below the top of the ridge, and it wasn't very very wide. It was wider than the road, maybe 20 yards wide, a couple hundred yards long, and then straight up the embankment to the top was about 20 feet. <coughs> in this ridge, in this cut, there must have been several hundred Japanese troops who were sheltered more or less from the naval gunfire and, and all other fire except they didn't know that we were going to have 15 tanks confronting them. And it was, this was, we, did, we were in a line of combat after that, and a certain amount before that, but never did we kill as many Japanese as we did in that. It was, it was a very one-sided battle. They had no weapons, really, that could hurt us, other than explosive charges. We had, we didn't, if we'd had a flamethrower tank sandwich, we didn't have, it would have been even more so. But we had 75 millimeter guns, which we could fire high explosive, just dead on. We had machine guns, and we had armor protection, plus all the other protection we had added. And we went in there, and we spent about a half an hour in the cut, most productive half hour, I think, of all the time in combat that I ever spent, if you count productivity in destroying the enemy. Yeah. The, I remember one incident very well. I couldn't believe they didn't have weapons that could hurt us. And I see one guy, it's, it's you know, it's pretty, pretty noisy, cannons going off all over the place, machine guns shattering, guys yelling. My, my gunner, who uh, his name was Haddix, he was a sergeant. He was a hell of a tanker and he was a tank commander on Iwo and he lost a leg there and was a big hero in his hometown and we're still in touch today. Uh, he was the gunner in my tank on that particular occasion and he's busy firing on some Japanese over here and I see a guy straight ahead about maybe 30 feet ahead but up on top, not down in the cut, he's on the, the top, about 20 feet in the air, and he's setting up a tripod. And I'm assuming that he must have some kind of an anti-tank rocket. Otherwise, why would he expose himself like that to set up a, 
tripod in which to what, fire whatever he's going to fire. And I'm really worried about this guy, and I'm trying to get my gunner's attention to shoot him. But it was hard to do, and I finally kicked him as hard. He kicked him as hard as I could, and he turned around, and I pointed, and he saw that, and he smiled, and he swung his 75 up, and just as it turned out, this poor Japanese soldier did not have an anti-tank rocket. He just was setting up a Nambu machine gun, which couldn't hurt us at all, and he got off about two bursts before he was blown to his ancestors. But we were in there, I don't really know how long we were in the cut. Later on, I kind of figured maybe a half an hour or so. Then we got to the ed edge of the cut, and now I could see the road, could see the airfield a couple miles away. It had a marvelous panoramic view of the whole rest of the island on that side. And so we took off, continued down the road. As far as I knew, the infantry were still behind us. They were not at that point. And we went down to the road. Now we get down to the bottom, and the road is on a, I'm trying to think of a word to describe it. It's about six feet above the rest like of the... Like a dike on top of a dike? Pardon? Like a little dike? Here. Like a little dike. Good way to describe it. And I'm, I'm very much concerned from this Lake Sesape thing that maybe we'd bog down if we went, why would they have the road on a, a level six feet or so above the rest of the ground if it wasn't soft. Otherwise, they wouldn't need a road, actually. Or they wouldn't have to have it that far above. So uh, we stuck to the road, where, as it turned out, the ground was perfectly firm. The, we didn't know it at the time. The whole area was a very large sugarcane field that had already been harvested just recently. So there was nothing growing there. It was absolutely flat, no cover, nothing. But I was worried about the swamp, which was wrong, of course. So we stayed on the road, and we must have gone however far we had to go to get to the airfield. The road led right to the airfield. We circled it. The airfield was a mess. There were destroyed Japanese planes all over the place. And some hangars were still standing, others were burnt, blown over, and we, we couldn't find any Japanese there. We, we made a reconnaissance just like we had at Charon Kanoa. And there was nothing there, so we finally, now I realize we're about three or four miles behind Japanese lines, and there's no infantry with us. That I'd learned that as we went along, because one of my platoon leaders, GM English was he was the, the last tank of the group in a line a, in a column rather, and uh, he and I were talking on the radio, and I said, "Where are the infantry still behind us?" He said, "No, there's no infantry at all." So I decided after we reconnoitered the airfield, which was as far as we could see, was completely empty. We'd head back just about that time. The one of the rear, one of the tanks in the rear, not English's, but one I think right in front of his, got hit by a very high, high uh, caliber gun. It killed the tank commander, who was a corporal, and it disabled the tank. So we we evacuated the members of that tank crew, including the dead corporal, put them in several other tanks. We had to back up a railroad embankment, or rather, a ra there was a railroad track that led up to the airfield besides, the, in addition to the road. We had taken the road and back, and when this tank got hit, we were right by this railroad embankment. And we, the, tr the road wasn't big enough to turn around. We had to uh, back our tanks up a little into this railroad. That's all immaterial. Now we headed back, but we pushed the tank off to the side of the road, it was hanging the tank that had been knocked down. So, because we couldn't get by otherwise, we pushed it off. It was sort of hanging, dangling over this dike, as you call it. And we hit it back with the, uh, the body of the corporal. 
And as we get close to the ridge line, we see what we had missed on the way down. There is massed Japanese artillery firing over the ridge, indirect fire, probably being directed by that son of a bitch in the, <laughs> in the smokestack. And uh, so we, we, and they immediately focused on us, and we're getting shells all around us and on our tanks, but n fortunately, nothing that did any severe damage to any of the tanks. We fired back, knocked out s some number of their guns, I don't know how many, killed a few more Japanese and, and climbed back up the road. By the time we got up the road, here was the infantry. They had, they had made it finally with, with quite a few casualties, but they'd gotten up there. No amphibious tractors, all on foot. And we now had the ridge line. The, the infantry had secured the ridge line. We pulled up in there. We were cons I was concerned that the tank that we left behind that had been knocked out was fairly deep in Japanese territory. And we, we took the breech block of the 75 millimeter gun with us so they couldn't use that. But we didn't want them to be able to hide in there or anything. So we decided to destroy it by anti-tank fire from, from the ridge. And we found out I'm gonna have that to. It, it took them. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna have to stop this. Wood, I'm going to duck out for a second. I'm going to keep you talking. Um, I'll get your water. Um, I can get it if you don't know where. Okay, let's stop this in for a second. One thing that may perhaps might be of interest relative to the Depression. During the, the four years that I spent in college, I spent the summers as a counselor. Well, maybe it was three summers, I've forgotten now, at boys' camp. The first summer was at, uh, or one of the summers was at a YMCA camp, and uh, our pay was fifty dollars for the summer, two months, well, actually two and a half months because we went up early, stayed late, before the camp opened to get it ready, and after it closed to close it down. So it wasn't a lot of money, but, but and that's the whole point. It was fifty bucks, and. My dad's business had gotten so bad in 38, there was a, fortunately, a brief but very steep dip in the economy uh, as it was slowly coming out of the Depression and, uh, in 1938. And my dad was in such bad straits that I gave him the 50 bucks. And the only reason I mention that is it illustrates how bad things were, that $50 made a big difference. And I'm sure your dad appreciated it to mm. no end. He certainly did. He didn't want to take it, but I, I knew that he needed it. Well, you, while you're in your job in Washington, with is equitable now? Are you really getting a lot of feedback on what's going on in Europe with the Russians and with the Germans and? Are well, you? we yes, a lot. In I was in Washington D.C., as you know, which was the center of the of the politics of the country, and everything revolved around the war. We had a a situation where by the summer of 1940, all of Europe, except for the for the British Isles and Sweden and Switzerland were, well, and, and Spain and Portugal were independent countries, but they were siding with Germany unofficially. But outside of them and Switzerland and Sweden and uh, British Isles, everybody else was under the heel of either Hitler, Mussolini, or Stalin. And across the other direction, across the Pacific, the Japanese had already taken the industrial heartland of China, Manchuria, renamed it Manchukuo, put in a puppet emperor, and were now making attempts at the rest of China. So there was a very precarious situation in the world. The summer of 1940, the battle for Britain was raging, and it looked to most of us 
So it would only be a period of time before Hitler would have England as well, and then the, the whole damn European continent would be under the domination of those dictators. The country was more or less divided in its opinion as to what we should do. Something like, perhaps today with Iraq, about 50% of the people and these were the ones that lived, and they lived mainly in the Middle West, in the heartland of America, so to speak, were what we called isolationists. And they felt, and there was a lot of justification for their feeling, that only 20, few, 20 plus a few years ago, we lost a hell of a lot of men, saving the world from, for democracy, and here we are, Europe is worse off than ever, we should stay out of it. And then there was a, a the other half of the country, on both coasts, most people felt that if we don't prepare to defend ourselves, we're going to be next. Because if, if Hitler tells us we have to do this out of the other, or they'll bomb us or whatever, what are we going to do about it if we don't have the armed forces to defend ourselves? And we did not have them. The, uh, the United States Marine Corps, for instance, I don't know if you're aware how small it actually was then, but it was smaller than the New York City Police Department. There were 30,000 cops in New York and 27,000 U.S. Marines total. And Congress got a little concerned and decided the Marine Corps should increase by uh, about 8,000 enlisted men and a comparable number of officers. That was a hell of a jump from 27,000 to what would then be 35,000 or so, and uh, 36,000 actually. In order to accomplish that, the Marine Corps, besides putting in a, a big recruiting drive, would have to get a whole lot of new second lieutenants in a comparatively short period of time. The Marines in those days would get about, as I understood it, around 50 new second lieutenants each year. They'd get about 20 from the Naval Academy and 20 from college ROTC units and about 10 up from the ranks. And the Marine Corps had made a decision that they would need 600 additional second lieutenants in a period of about a year and a half. And so they uh, started the first officer candidates class. But they didn't start it, they planned it. They were, and they were going to run three officer candidates classes, first, second, and third. They hoped to have 400 men in each and to wash out 50% and graduate 200 from each. And that would give them the 600 that they needed in the three classes. Everything went pretty much according to Hoyle, except they never, they didn't stop the third class because the war was on and they've never stopped. The Marine Corps now uh, gets most of its officers through the candidates class. And upon, that's a four months course and on the, to be eligible for it, for it, in, at least when I went in, you had to be a college graduate, you had to be male, of course, because there were no women in the Marine Corps, for that matter, in any other part of the armed forces that I'm aware of. You had to be single because uh, second lieutenants were not permitted to be married in the Marine Corps in, in those days, which in my opinion was a very good thing. In fact, the, uh, it's widely quoted in the Marines, you may have heard it. Chesty Puller is supposedly to have said in regard to that question of wives for second lieutenants, if the Marine Corps had wanted you to have a wife, they'd have issued you one. So, but anyway, uh, yeah, and you had to be over 21 and under 25 to be accepted in the candidates class. So, if you met all those qualifications, you could apply. Well, I was concerned. I was the 50% of the people that thought we had to prepare. And so, I applied for the candidates class and fortunately was accepted. Now this is what, year 1940? 1940, summer of 1940. And why did you pick the Marines over all the other services? Well, in the first place, uh, the Marines 
Most people at that time, hopefully today too, consider the Marine Corps a very elite unit, the best of the best. Not that we don't think highly of the other branches of the armed forces, but I think most people, if they were asked to tell you who are really the, the tops, they would say the U.S. Marines. And that feeling pervaded those days as well. And when the Marines came out with a candidates class, it was, that seemed to me the best way to go. I qualified by being 21, single, college graduate, and in fine physical condition, except for one thing, which might be of interest. I uh, wore reading glasses when I would be reading, because my vision had deteriorated somewhat. Uh, I think in uh, looking through microscopes and biology and, and zoology courses uh, at the University of Maryland. And so uh, I wondered if the physical, I knew it was a strict one, would uh, if require 20-20 vision in each eye, because I, I assumed I didn't have that. I was in fine physical condition in every other respect. So I was discussing this with the guy who was actually my boss, an older man who was well acquainted in Washington. And he said, well, we've got to, got to find out. He called Headquarters Marine Corps. They told him, yes, indeed, it would require 20-20 vision to get in, uh, in the candidates class. And uh, my boss then said, well, I know, I have a close friend who's the leading ophthalmologist in Washington. I'm going to get him to see, look you over and see if you've got it, if you don't have 20-20 vision, if, it's a, if you could get it. So he called up his friend who was this highly regarded ophthalmologist. He said he wanted him to see me that day. The doctor said, he, you know, his appointment schedule is filled solid. But if my boss persisted, so he said, well, have him come at 5 o'clock, and after I finish my last patient, and I can't tell you when it'll be, I'll see him. So I got there at 5, and I guess maybe an hour later, he was through, and he sent for me to come into his office. And he said to me that he... Uh, that his friend, my boss, had called him, said he had to see me, but he didn't tell me why, what's it all about. So I told him, I said, I want the answer to two questions. Do I have 20-20 vision in each eye? And if I do not, is it readily available? Can I possibly get it within, I think I had to report, and my orders had come through, I had to report for a physical at the Naval Dispensary in downtown Washington, a certain hour and a certain day, which was about three weeks hence. So I said, is it obtainable in three weeks, 2020 vision? <laughs> well, like you, he laughed when I said that. He said, what in the hell for? And I told him what I've just told you. So he, he then said, well, I can answer your first question very easily. We'll give you a test. It won't take but five minutes whether I have 2020 vision. As to the second question, is it obtainable? He said, I can't give you an answer to that, but let's Let's find out. So he tested my eyes rather thoroughly, and then he said, "Okay, we've got good news. The you know, good news and bad news. The good news is you almost have 20/20 vision." And he said, "How old are you?" And I said, "I'm 21." And he said, the, "Something like, well, you're young enough, so we may be able to do something about it." And uh, but he said. The good news is not only that you're young enough, you have what we call astigmatism. He said, you're very close to 20-20 vision in one eye, you're some distance away in the other, but in layman's terms, what it means when I say you have astigmatism, and how scientifically correct this was, I'm, I've never known. He said, it's a question of the muscles to which the lens is attached in each eye the muscles are not pulling evenly, and so they've, they've uh, pulled it somewhat out of focus. And there are exercises, eye exercises, which surprised the hell out of me, I didn't know you could exercise your eye. There are eye exercises that you can do which might correct that condition, especially if you're only 21, your muscles are still <coughs> very supple. I told him I didn't know I had any muscles in the eye. 
he said that you, every organ in the body is attached to something by a muscle. That's the way he put it. <coughs> so he said, uh, if you will agree to this, I'll agree to it also. You'll be in my office for a half hour every morning and half hour every afternoon for eye exercises. And uh, he said, you'll have to be here at some early hour. It was like 8 o'clock or 7.30 before our regular patients come. And you'll have to be here when we close at 6 o'clock or whatever. <coughs> he introduced me to a technician, a lady, and a machine at about as big as this table, like, something like uh, an overgrown uh, the gadgets you could look into and see uh, pornographic movies in the old days. Anyway, there wasn't for that purpose. They uh, so, and also besides the two hours, or the two half hour sessions daily, I had to eliminate all fat from my diet for this period of time, including white bread, only eat whole wheat and rye, uh, and I had to have two glasses of carrot juice a day. <coughs> I asked him, I said, I'd never, how the hell do they get juice out of a carrot? <laughs> I said, I know you can squeeze oranges and grapefruit, but what about, I never heard of carrot juice. He said, they don't squeeze it, they press it, and you don't have to worry. There are several fruit stands in the city, I'll give you their addresses, where you can get a glass of fresh pressed carrot juice for very little money, like a quarter or something like that. And uh, you'll have to take two of those a day, and I said, why? He said, because it's very strong to vitamin A, which is a vitamin that has considerable effect on a vision. He said, well, you know, we're going to touch all the bases. Food, vitamins, I had to take a whole bunch of vitamins as well, and uh, eye exercises. And he said, I'll check your eyes starting at about the third day to see if there's any progress. The third day when he checked them, I had 20-20 vision in each eye, believe it or not. We continued, of course, because I had three weeks before the physical, and we both figured the more we did, the more likely it's going to stick. So I went past the physical and with flying colors, and I had to report to Quantico three weeks later. And so we decided we would continue the regimen for the next three weeks till I had to leave for Quantico. The last day I said to him, I've when we started this, I had two questions. I've got two questions now. The first is, how long am I going to have this 20-20 vision once we stop all this? And he said, I can't answer that any more than I could answer the first qu that question before. He said, if you were staying in Washington, staying in town, I would say to you, you come to my office for two weeks every January or two weeks once a year and go through the same eye exercise routine and you'll have 20-20 vision for many years. But he said, obviously you can't do that and I can't answer your question. We just hope for the best. When I report, oh, and I had a second question. I said, my second question is what's all this costing me? And he laughed, he said, not a dime. He said, anybody that's that anxious to get in the Marine Corps I wouldn't charge him a penny. So he didn't. And uh, when I reported into Quantico, one of the very first things that I had to do was have a physical. And I passed it easily. And I must have had two physicals a year for the remainder of my time in the Marines and never had a problem. I guess I was on inactive duty for maybe seven or eight years. I was well into my 30s, almost 40 years old, before I began to headache, get headaches if I read very much. I didn't have any classes. I'd throw, throw them all away when I, I finished that, that the stuff we just talked about. And it wasn't until then, and I went to an ophthalmologist to see if, uh, to test my eyes, and it was, was like before. I was no longer 20-20, not too far off. And he said, I'm going to prescribe reading glasses for you. And I related to him the story we just talked about. I said, what about eye exercises? 
And he said, how old are you now? And I guess I was 38 or something. He said, there's a hell of a difference in the, for in the response of muscles throughout your entire body between the ages of 21 and 38. He said, eye exercises would be of some help, and I'll give you a couple of do on your own, which he did, which I could do with a, with a pencil and an eraser and a ruler. And, but he said, you want, tw you want reading glasses anyway. So that's what we did. Anyway, that was one uh, episode leading into my getting in the Marine Corps that I thought might be of interest. Just one other thing. I was very active that year in the Junior Chamber of Commerce. To be a member of the Junior Chamber, you had to be 21 years old, and when you reached 35, you were out. And the Congress was debating a draft law for one year, a draft which ultimately passed by the Vice President breaking a tie of 48-48 in the Senate. That draft law, the first peacetime draft in the history of the country, was for men 21 to 35, not like what we had during Vietnam when they took 18, 19 year olds, or 20s even. You, uh, and it was for one year only. In fact, a popular song came out in 1941 after the draft law was passed. And the, the lead line was, goodbye dear, I'll be gone for a year, I'm in the army now. Anyway, uh, the uh, what the hell was I talking about? The uh, draft and... Yeah, oh, I, I know, the Junior Chamber of Commerce yeah. comparing the draft age, 21 to 35, both in the Junior Chamber and in the Selective Service System. The reason I mention that is the Junior Chamber, being since we were at the Washington chapter, we had access to a, a lot of high-ranking government officials as speakers. We could get almost anybody from the administration or from Congress to speak. We had weekly luncheons where we'd have two or three hundred, sometimes more, members of the junior chamber and they were re we were regarded as up-and-coming young men and important people in Washington, believe it or not. And uh, that summer of 1940, the summer that I joined the Marines, the spring before I joined, the, uh, we had almost every speaker was about the forthcoming draft law that was being debated in Congress that might or might not pass. Everybody knew it would be touch and go as to whether it passed. And as I said, it was a tie until the Vice President broke it. The, uh, the speakers got us all very concerned about should we have a draft or shouldn't we? And after the final speaker, before Congress voted, and long before the draft law went into effect, we took a straw vote in the chapter. We had about 500 members, probably. And we voted affirmatively for the draft law by 90-some percent. And I thought that was rather interesting later on. I didn't think too much about it then. Many years later, during the Vietnam War when there were all those protests about the draft and how we, the very people who would be drafted, voted for it. And I think that was an, kind of an important part of that year that I spent between college and the Marine Corps. Now, <clears throat> I'm assuming that your parents did not object or anything to your... No, they, of course they had no part in it. Yeah. I was 21 and I was away from home, and had been away from home most of my life, actually. Yeah. Uh, but no, they, uh, like all parents, I guess, they were probably concerned, but they thought it was the right thing to do. So where was basic training then for OCS? Quantico. You went to Quantico. The, the first candidate's class, and all candidate's classes ever since, were held in Quantico at the Marine Corps schools. And we, uh, it was a four-month four -month course, and 50% were washed out, and 50% went on to the officer's course. The candidate's class was to teach you to be a Marine, a glorified boot camp, really, and the second was the officer's course was to teach you to be an officer. 
but they washed out half of the candidates before you could went into the officer's class. I would assume all your schools that you had with in your younger life contributed a great deal to your... Well, I think they did, because not only the schools, but the camp. The camps that I, I went to boys camp every summer from the time I was six years old until I became a counselor when I was in college, and then I went on for another three summers as a counselor. Uh, the camps were not military, but they were disciplined. And they were, they were quasi-military quasi in many respects. Uh, for instance, you woke up to Reveille. You had a certain amount of time to brush your teeth and make your sack, and it was inspected carefully, and you had to clean up the cabin or tent, whichever it was. And then uh, you, uh, the, the assembly would blow, the regular assembly call on a bugle, and you would trot down to the flagpole where everybody would get in a formation. Uh, you had to, we did learn the difference between standing still and parade rest, for instance. And then the colors would be blown on the, on the bugle and the flag would go up. And then mess call would blow, come and get your beans, boys. And we would march into the mess hall and eat. And uh, you went to various activities during the day and, and the, you would change from one activity to another by a bugle call. And that was pretty much the same at most all boys camps, including the two that I attended. And, uh, and when I was a counselor, it was more or less the same thing. Now you're, when you go through basic school then, and you say they're washing out 50%, um, you're, I'm assuming that, then that you're being given fitness reports and, you know, they're evaluating you and... Well, I'm, I'm sure they did. Exactly how they did it, I don't know. The interesting thing that I didn't touch on is that virtually all the instructors in the candidates class were non-coms, NCOs. In fact, we were informed later on that the Marine Corps combed its ranks for the finest NCOs in the Corps. Uh, all Marines know that the NCOs are the backbone of the Marine Corps, and the, the top NCOs are the, you couldn't get better instructors. And uh, they were rough on us, but they were damn good. And we very seldom ever saw an officer, but we did have two officers to whom we came in contact with periodically. The commanding officer of the, of the uh, battalion, which was the candidate's class, was a major, Gerald Thomas, who retired many years later as a four-star four general. Great, great guy. And our, we were divided into three companies. And my company commander was a captain, Williams, who was killed during the war, as it turned out. During the coming war, we were not at war at that point and didn't go to war for a year and a half. But uh, the once we graduated, all of the instructors were officers. We were now second lieutenants, and we took our instruction from senior officers, and or what became senior officers for the most part. They were not senior officers then. They were mainly middle grade officers, majors, lieutenant colonels, and one colonel who was in command of the officer school. And uh, out of that whole group of officers who were our instructors in the officers course, we had three four-star generals later on, which is pretty unusual for the Marine Corps. They don't have that many four-stars. We had Bobby uh, Hagaboom, who uh, <coughs> retired as a four-star general. And uh, at the moment, I can't think who the other two were, but there were three four-star generals. Several other officers made other degrees of general. And in fact, in our candidates class, we wound up with three generals ultimately, including one whom we all thought would be commandant. He was, uh, even as a major general, he was the uh, executive officer to, who was the big general in Vietnam, uh, big army general, ran the Vietnam Schwarzkopf? Pardon? Schwarzkopf? No, no, the Vietnam. Oh, Vietnam. Um for Marines or for? No, for the whole operation. 
Westmoreland? Westmoreland. Westmoreland had as its executive officer a major general who was a Marine who was one of our classmates. And we, he was, he actually graduated number one in the class. Terrific guy. He was uh, at headquarters Marine Corps as a lieutenant general playing squash at a noon hour one day and collapsed and died of a heart attack. Or I think he would have made commandant if it hadn't been for that. But anyway, of our our officers who were the instructors in the officers course were very good, and the NCOs and the candidates class were just the best. Now, at some point, you are asked to elect an MOS you want to go into in the Marine Corps. I mean, you can go in artillery, you can be a, <coughs> a tanker, you can be a, a company. Well, it didn't work quite that way, but it was something like that. We were all informed that upon graduating from the officer's course, which was a three month course, which brought us up to the, to the, it was the last Saturday in June that we graduated, the last Saturday in May, pardon me, and it brought us up to the 1st of June. On the 1st of June we were all to report, we would be given orders to report to various combat units of the Fleet Marine Force. When I say combat units, not in combat, we were not at war, but they were units of the they were combat units of the Fleet Marine Force, wherever second lieutenants were needed. And so uh, we were, oh, we were allowed, given the opportunity, to elect where we might like to go without any assurance that our, our election would be granted. We'd go where we were needed, but they would give us the opportunity to say, I'd like to be assigned to such and such a unit. About three weeks before we graduated, our class was taken to the tank park at Quantico where there were five small tanks that were part of the first scout company of Division Special Troops of the 1st Marine Division. And I was, I fell in love with tanks. We spent a day with them and I just thought, my God, I've never been in a tank before but this is great. And uh, it's funny how those things happen, but it did. Furthermore, besides that, they were stationed at Quantico, which is only 30 miles from Washington. And I had lots of friends, mainly female, in Washington. And I thought this would be great to stay here in Quantico as an officer, be in tanks and be close to all the social things in Washington. So I put in for the first scout, for the first scout company, and, uh, and so did uh, my buddy, another lieutenant by the name of John Gillespie, from uh, Texas. Tex and I both put in for it, and lo and behold, we we got it. The reason we did was they were short two second lieutenants. Nobody else had applied for it. They were, two had to be assigned, and since two of us had applied, we got it. I was amazed. I really didn't think we would. So that's now the interesting thing to me about getting into tanks was when I arrived there, the, the, let me tell you a little about the scout company. It was a mechanized reconnaissance operation. It was a very large, in numbers of people, large for a company, for a Marine Corps company, because it had five platoons. Normally a company has three. It had three armored scout car platoons, it had a tank platoon, and it had a motorcycle reconnaissance platoon of 21 Harley Davidsons. I had never even touched a motorcycle in my life before, but the motorcycle platoon and one of the scout car platoons had no platoon leader, no second lieutenant. So I was assigned naturally to be the platoon leader of the motorcycle platoon. But fortunately for me, the platoon, the acting platoon leader who continued as, was a platoon sergeant, I don't remember his first name, but his nickname was Muscles, Muscles Treadwell. He was a salty Marine. He'd been in the Marine Corps ever since he was 17 years old and he was now. He'd been in about 17 years and he was, he wound up as Sergeant Major of the 1st Tank Battalion, because ultimately the scout company merged with a, another tank, with a tank company 
to form the first tank battalion, but that was a little bit later. Anyway, I had Muscle Treadwell to teach me how to drive a motorcycle, and I became pretty good at it. And he also taught me, which is even more important, how to run a platoon of Marines. So the year that I had that motorcycle, I had that motorcycle platoon for 11 months, was probably the most fun I ever had, certainly in the Marine Corps and in my life until I met my wife. So I can say about that. But the second morning that I was at the in the scout company, I got I was just having breakfast when a, a runner from company headquarters came and told me our company commander wanted to see me right away. So I went to, I gulped down a cup of coffee and tried it over to uh, Bill Buse's office. We talked about Bill Buse, who was fortunately for me my company commander. And uh, we had a conversation, which I don't know if we discussed this before or not uh, on Saturday, but his he, the conversation went something like this: Second Lieutenant report, Neiman reporting for as ordered, sir. And I was standing there at attention in front of him, and he said something like, relax, Neiman, I want to ask you if you've ever driven a tank. And I said something like, Captain, I've never even been in a moving tank. And he said, I thought so. Everybody, every officer in this company has to be able to drive each of our vehicles. He said, platoon sergeant Treadwell will teach you to drive a motorcycle but the platoon leader of the tank platoon is going to teach you to drive a tank this morning. And you will come back from that tank less driving lesson either knowing how to drive a tank or you will be transferred. It was that brief. So I said, aye, aye, sir. I bowed face and, oh, he also added that Lieutenant Matson, he was the platoon leader of the tank platoon, and his tank will be in front of our company headquarters within five minutes and you to go with him which is what we did. These were small tanks that were a mistake. They never should have been built as far as that goes. The theory was they would be fine for reconnoitering a road net. They were very fast and very small. The only armament they had was a 50 caliber machine gun. And the armor plate in the tank was relatively thin. We had stopped small arms fire, but that was about all. The uh, but they were fast. You could drive 50 miles an hour down a highway with them. And uh, the only way in and out was through a hatch on the top. I mentioned that for what comes later. So the first thing after Lieutenant Matson and I met each other, he then said, hop in, and we took off. And, and in case I didn't tell you, we first stop was the fuel dump. One of the units of the 1st Marine Air Aircraft Wing was stationed at Quantico. The rest were down in North Carolina, or, or maybe South Carolina, I don't remember. We put in 80 gallons of 100 octane aviation gasoline in this little tank, in the fuel tank of this tank. And then we took off of the combat range at Quantico. And uh, Matt, Matson, which though the tank had dual controls, it was two men driver and the gunner, but the gunner could also drive. And, excuse me, but my eyes are tearing. It's one of the problems I've had since I had cataracts removed recently. Anyway, the, uh, we were having, I was having a ball. He was, Matson was showing me how to do everything. We drove by levers, and plus a accelerator on the floor. But the brakes and the turning was all with these Levers. And I had a set, he had a set, I could duplicate everything he was doing, and he kept informing me of everything. But I was really enjoying it. We were going up and down hills that I'd hiked over so many times in the candidates class with a big pack on my back and a rifle in my hand. There I am sitting and we're driving. I thought it was great. Finally we pulled up to the high, top of the highest hill on the combat range at Quantico, and Matson stopped the tank. And he said something like, do you think you could take over? And of course I said, sure. And he said, well, on second thought, maybe I better get the tank down to more level terrain and then you take over. 
With that, he wheeled the tank around, and the next thing I know, we're rolling over and over and over down this damn hill. We, we didn't have safety belts or seat belts in those days in tanks. But we did, we were, I was given a, a tank a crash helmet, which didn't fit me too well. It was loose. And it fell off on about the second or third revolution going down. And I grabbed my head like that to sort of protect it because there was no cushioning in this tank either. It was all steel. And the next thing, when I came to, I'm lying sort of on my back with my feet up in the air. Matson is looking down at me. His head's up about here. Blood is pouring out of his something, someplace in his head onto me, which is what awakened me. And I could see immediately the tank is on fire. And I think we're upside down. And I knew the only way in and out was through the top. I don't know how the hell we're going to get out of this. I figured I'd better at least find out if, if my instructor is alive or dead, and if he's alive to wake him up. So I hit him as hard as I could a few times on the cheek with a palm of my hand, and finally he blinked. He was awake, he'd just been knocked out like I. I probably would have still been out except the blood pouring on my face what brought me to. I said something like, the tank's on fire, what do we do? And he said something like, we get our asses out of here. And uh, I said, how? And he pointed right about here from lying this way with my feet up in the air. He said, there's a hatch, open the hatch and scram. Well, I couldn't get the damn thing open, which convinced me now that we must be upside down. I must have been a little nervous. Well, he wheeled free. Turned out he had a broken nose, but the, which bled profusely, but other than that, he wasn't hurt. He opened the hatch. I could see now, thank God, we're on our side instead of upside down. The grass around it is burning for about 10 feet. And he said, move it, or words to that effect. And I don't think my feet touched the ground until I got past the ring of fire. But there I was, outside of the the tank and outside of the ring of fire. I look back and Matson steps out very nonchalantly. Then he reaches back in and there's a hissing sound. I think, my God, the tank's going to blow and I hit the deck. He trotted over to me, again, pretty nonchalantly. By that time, his handkerchief or something had stopped the blood flow. He said, what in the hell are you doing on the deck? And I said, I told him why I was there. And I said, what did you reach back inside the tank for? He said, what you heard was the activation of the fire extinguisher. I reached back in and activated it. It didn't do a damn bit of good. The reason it didn't came out very clearly in the investigation. We got, uh, we tried it into the highway, thumbed our way immediately into the post, came back out with the fire engines. They poured tons of water on this tank. The name of the tank was Marie named after the Dion Quintuplets. The, all the tanks were either Marie, Von, Yvette, or whatever the other two names were. This was Marie's last ride, of course, and my first one. The, all the water they poured on her was to no avail. The fire wasn't going to go out until the 80 gallons of 100 octane gas burned. And Marie turned cherry red and remained cherry red for a day or two, and then it gradually got black remained as a blackened hulk and a target for all kinds of things. Marine Corps F-4Fs would strafe it. Uh, Marine Corps artillery would try to damage it. Marine Corps anti-tank gunners would shoot at it. They did that for years. It was a target on the combat range at Quantico. And I don't know if it might even still be there. But there, of course, was a big investigation. I had the honor of being in the first tank the Marine Corps ever had destroyed by enemy or anyone else. <laughs> didn't have tanks in World War II, Marine Corps didn't. And they didn't have them in the in Nicaragua and Haiti and those places. So uh, they'd never had a tank in combat, nor have they had ever had one destroyed for any other reason. So they had a big investigation. And naturally, as being one of the two occupants, I was part of it, even though I was just an innocent bystander. And they, it was easy to determine what it was all, what caused it all. I don't know if you've ever followed tank tracks, but they're very easy to follow. Tanks leave a track, 
and we followed it up the hill. Turned out, on top of the hill, there was a huge stump, maybe eight feet in diameter, only about so high, tree stump. And there were weeds and grass higher than that all around. And obviously, Matson from inside a tank did not see the stump. He thought he was resting on solid ground. The tank track was very easy, assuming this is the stump. The, uh, on the right-hand side, the track was like this, was half off, half off the stump and half on the stump. And when he wheeled the, t the tank around, it just went off like that. And the tank fell down, fell off this ledge, so to speak, and tumbled down the hill. So once that was discovered, it was determined. That's why the tank rolled. There was, the, the Marine Corps wanted to know several things. Number one, what caused the tank to turn over? Two, why did it catch fire? Three, why didn't the fire extinguishers have some effect? So the first thing they found out, why it turned over. Secondly, as to why it caught fire. In designing the tank, whoever designed it, the engineers that back where the tanks were made, wherever they made these, was this company called Marmon Harrington. You may, re well, you may have heard of the old Marmon cars. Marmon and Harrington merged somewhere along the line in the 1930s, and they made these small tanks for the Marine Corps. Whoever designed the tank decided in order to reduce the chances of the tank blowing up from if assuming a projectile entered the fuel compartment with, with high octane gasoline, immediately vapors would be formed that would have to leave. Or if they couldn't leave, they would blow, theoretically. So instead of a screw-on cap on the fuel tank, it was a, a cap held in place by a spring. An arm came out from somewhere with a fuel cap on it and a very strong spring. The theory was that the tank had uh, was hit by a projectile that caused these fumes to form. This would all be a matter of split seconds. They would push this up and, exp and expand out into the air instead of blowing the tank up. That was the theory. When the tank rolled over, these, all this gasoline weighed quite a bit, 80 gallons, and they, pushed the th they just pushed the, the gas cap open and poured out all over the hot engine and it was on fire immediately. So that was the answer to question number two. Question number three, why didn't the fire extinguisher work? It was supposed to be state of the art. And it was. When the, when the tank was right side up, you had copper tubing that ran around the perimeter of the engine about so high above it, and two tubes ran down the center. And there were little holes, hundreds of them, facing inboard from each. You had these squares and then you had the two tubes this way with, with holes going out like that. So that the, the foam, which was considered the last word in fire extinguishing, the foam would blanket the, the engine and put out any fire in the engine compartment. But the problem was this tank wasn't right side up, it was on its side. So all the foam went down the side and the flames went up here. It had absolutely no effect whatsoever. So when that was determined, they, they had aboard a, a general, I still remember his name today, Major General Moses, was in command, he was the senior member of this big investigating board. And so they did, Marine Corps, first thing they did was exonerate Matson and myself. But nothing was our fault. And then they raced hell with Marmon Harrington, got them to redesign the tanks, made several changes in the design, including the fire extinguisher and the gas cap. And uh, that was my first tank ride. Little did I realize at that time that I would evacuate quite a number of tanks during the course of a forthcoming war, and some of which were on fire. Now, you mentioned then that they brought some of the units together. So a tank company, was it still with 17 tanks now? I mean, 
had you gotten to the point where the, the little tanks were disappearing? Uh, well, they disappeared a long time ago. I mean, when, when, when you're at Quantico and you're in tank school, you've gotten through the Harley Davidson for 11 months. Now you get your first tank ride. How long is it before you get into a real tank? When I, when I made first lieutenant, which was in, we're in New River, I can just digress by saying the first Marine Division was new at that point. It had been formed by increasing the first Marine Brigade, which first Marine Brigade had been based at Quantico for some years, after which was withdrawn from Nicaragua in the 1930s. It was based at Quantico. It was the major Marine Corps Fleet Marine Force unit on the East Coast. The West Coast had the 2nd Marine Brigade. 1st Marine Brigade was sent on maneuvers to Guantanamo Bay when the Candidates class started. And the Candidates class and other schools replaced them in Quantico. So there was no, there really was very little room for the 1st Marine Brigade to come back to Quantico. Furthermore, it became a division during the, on paper, during the time it was at Guantanamo. And it was at Guantanamo for 10 months, all during my Marine Corps candidates class and officer school. And because uh, they left for, for Guantanamo a couple of months before we moved into Quantico. When they were ready to come back to the States from Guantanamo, Obviously, there wasn't room for the division at Quantico. There was room for some units, and there wasn't room anywhere for the whole division. So part of the division came back to Quantico. I'll get to that part in just what part of the division it was in a moment. The rest of the division went to a tent camp hastily constructed at uh, Paris Island, temporary quarters. and. Uh, Eventually, the Navy bought a huge tract of ground, the largest Marine Corps had ever acquired, at New River, North Carolina, which is now Camp Lejeune. And in the fall of 1941, just about a month and a half or two months before Pearl Harbor, the 1st Marine Division was brought together from Quantico and Paris Island to, to New River to a tent camp that we lived in for the next seven months or so and uh, before going overseas. And at that time, the tank battalion, the first tank battalion was created by merging the first scout company and D company tanks, or A company tanks, excuse me, into one battalion and adding a third company, B company tanks, or maybe they were C Company, because the Scout Company became a tank company. And the Scout Company, after a while in New River, eventually lost its motorcycles and its little tanks and its scout cars and, and became a, a fully a tank company. Now, how did the Marine Corps decide that 17 tanks would be a company? Well, the main reason was because they had three platoons. In a, in a battalion, uh, or, or three platoons, excuse me, in a company. And each platoon had five tanks. And you multiply five times three, that's 15. And the company commander had a tank, and the executive officer had a tank. So that's how they had 17. That number varied from time to time as new ideas came, came along. But, but the during the time that I was, prime, most of the time that I was in tanks, 17 tanks in a company, and three times that number, plus two for a battalion. A battalion had three tank companies, plus a tank for the battalion commander and the battalion exec. So there were three times 17 would be 49, or I'm doing this in my head, plus two tanks for the battalion commander and he's in. So a little over 50 tanks in a battalion. Well, where would the Marine Corps know how to train with tanks if they'd never had any? How'd they get that expertise? That is a very good question. You've heard of uh, learning on the job. <laughs> when, uh, the first place, we read Army manuals. 
and they were fine for the technical stuff. And we sent, we sent uh, people to army tank schools of one kind or another. But the tactics were different because the army was training for, and so was the Marine Corps initially, for war in Europe or on a large landmass with large formations of armored vehicles. The Marine Corps was, was, that's why the scout company was created, was created for that kind of warfare. It was nothing for the jungle islands or the small coral islands that we eventually fought on. It wasn't until it was determined after the war was going, before we were not in combat yet except for what happened at Wake Island and Corregidor in the Philippines, but uh, we had not launched any offensives when it was decided the Marine Corps would be in the Pacific and most of the Army would be in, in Europe. So the Marine Corps then had to, among the many changes they made, were for fighting in jungle warfare instead of on small islands, instead of large developed land masses with lots of infrastructure. And so uh, the, it was also determined, fortunately, that the, uh, those little tanks that we had in the scout company weren't worth a goddamn. <laughs> so the, they were all sent to defense battalions mainly in Samoa and the surrounding islands. And as a matter of fact, Lieutenant Matson went with them to Samoa and then to some outlying islands as def the defense battalions had a variety of weapons. The Okina uh, Wake Island was defended by a unit of a defense battalion, but it had no tanks. But the, when, we, when we got into the war later on, after that, and we were setting up defense battalions and islands that we already occupied, and that we were thinking the Japanese might try to take from us, we sent defense battalions, which uh, were supposed to have some of each weapon, tanks, artillery, and so forth. And they gave them, the Marine Corps gave them the little Marmon Harrington tanks and some other obsolete tanks because Marine Corps really didn't think they were going to be fighting. And Lieutenant Matson, unfortunately, uh, lost a man killed in some non-combat operation down there and took it so personally that he committed suicide in Samoa or one of those surrounding islands. He's a great guy and I never saw him again after the scout company uh, went overseas. He remained behind to go with the defense battalion to Samoa. But uh, even so, the tanks that we had in the, in the first tank battalion and in the second tank battalion were light tanks and they were not very good by comparison with what we later got. And that's what we had. The Navy, one of the big problems the Marine Corps had was how do you get a big tank ashore in a, in a hostile as amphibious assault. The Navy didn't have the means to do it, and the Marine Corps was dependent upon the Navy to get our tanks ashore. That's why they designed these light tanks to begin with. The Navy didn't even have a tank lighter to take what became a standard light tank, and so we had to build something that could go on virtually on a whaleboat. They, we built ramps, the Marine Corps, when I say we, built special ramps on whaleboats and put these Marmon Harrington tanks through tests and they drove them ashore. The whaleboat would make a landing. This is all peacetime. And the, the, the carrying one Marmon Harrington tank, which would then roll off this ramp and go looking for enemy machine gun positions to uh, attack. It was all theoretical. The, uh, eventually the Navy developed tank lighters called LCM, standing for landing craft medium. And, uh, but the Navy didn't have the proper ships to take a big tank anywhere. They carried the uh, tanks in the hole of cargo ships and they only had uh, cranes that could lift a certain amount of weight. A light tank weighed about 12 or 13 tons depending on the model. 
some later at 15 tons. And that was about the maximum that the cranes could carry. And then there was a very difficult operation. The crane would have to drop down into the hole, get a tank, lift it up, drop it over the side of the tank onto a tank ladder bobbing up and down, get it into there. They lost several every time they tried it. And then the tank ladder would take the tank ashore. And when it got there, it was a light tank and not as effective as we would want. But finally, the Navy came up with a wonderful plan, ship, called a landing ship dock. And all the amphibious assault ships now are an outgrowth of the original LSD's landing ship dock. Not to be confused with the, the Navy even earlier developed an LST, standing for landing ship tank, which was a large, slow target, LST. But it was a, a big vessel and a slow one, and it had a, a tank deck inside, and tanks or other motor vehicles could back in, and when they hit a, a, a beach, it didn't have to be at a port, they could lower a ramp and you'd roll off. But they were much too big to be used in an assault on an actively defended beach, because they'd be sunk on the way in. Okay, I got it. And out it took a lot more rounds than we thought it would. They, they kept bouncing off. The, the uh, added protection we had put on our tanks did better than we thought it would do. Anyway, we eventually destroyed the tank. It burned for a couple of days because it had almost a full load of fuel. We used, expended a lot of ammo, but not much fuel. And uh, so that was the second day on Saipan. How long did that campaign last? About almost a month. So? Uh, the next day was the main battle. Uh -huh. We now had the ridge line. Now we had to get across the island. And? And uh, it was, as I've already said, absolutely flat for several thousand yards to the other side of the island, except at the, at the, at the other end of this flat, recently harvard, harvested cane field was a little high ground and coconut palms and other trees and deeply entrenched in that location were Japanese with artillery again firing point blank at anyone trying to cross that several thousand yards of wide open, no cover. They had mortars and machine guns and, and I presume riflemen as well but they had a lot of mass direct fire artillery as opposed to indirect fire, flight trajectory. And the infantry tried to get across and they just, casualties were such that it, it would never work. So there was a uh, command post meeting of the regimental combat team commander and it was decided the tanks would go and we would, when we got within maybe a hundred yards of the this position that we had to take, the artillery, the, our own artillery, would start timed fire on on the objective. That means air burst. I don't, don't know how familiar you are with timed artillery fire. Not at all. But the, uh, it's when they cut the fuses so that the artillery projectiles will explode, not on impact, but when they reach a certain level over the target, generally they were pretty good at that. About um, maybe 30 feet above the ground, they would explode because the fuses had been cut so that to go off at a certain time, a certain number of seconds from the time they were left the tube. And that would be before they hit the ground. And the idea was it would make the people on the ground all have to keep their heads down because all the shrapnel will be coming straight down at them. Now how wide an area are we talking that you're attacking? Well, we're, I suppose maybe a couple of hundred yards, mm -hmm. uh, maybe a quarter of a mile. But uh, that was the plan, but it never happened. <laughs> I don't know who screwed up, but we got there maybe before the artillery was expecting we would. But uh, that day I had a rather exciting day. 
were making this charge. It was like a charge of the light brigade kind of type thing. In line? Tanks in line? In, li in line, yes. And all of a sudden, my tank gets hit by the biggest thing that ever hit it. And a sheet of flame went through the tank. The concussion knocked everybody out. As it turned out, the flame burned out the entire electrical system immediately, shorted it. But it didn't affect the power plant of the, 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 the diesel engines that were powering the tank. And we're still moving. I can, I, for whatever reason, I came to first. And uh, we're moving, but nothing, nothing works. The, the uh, intercom doesn't work. They can't move the turret, can't fire the guns. The only thing you do is drive the tank. So everybody else came to about the same time. And I'm talking now to our Sam Johnson, our gunnery sergeant. First thing we have to do is stop the damn tank, because we're out alone now in front of everybody. And so we got the, the driver to stop the tank. Now, we don't want to turn the tank around, because then we can't fight. We, we don't want the Japs to know that we can't fire our guns. So we start backing the tank up with a gun still headed in the direction of the of our objective till we got to close to one of our other, where our tanks were in line and the, we decided I was I was go ahead it's funny okay I would uh, get into another tank and the rest of the the other four guys from the crew including my gunnery sergeant would get their butts back behind the line as fast as they could. So I, I signaled, of course, all the companies looking at me, looking at my tank, they want to know what's, you know, what happened to it, are we alive, are we dead, or whatnot. So when I left the tank first, one of the other tanks came right up to me, I jumped in, now I'm in a second tank. And we, uh, I forgot all about my old tank, because they were just they, kept, they backed up further yet, and then they got out on foot and went back to the rear. So I got in the second tank, and uh, we're driving along. We resume the attack. I'm now in touch with my three platoon leaders on the radio again. Told them I'm fine. Just let's continue to the objective. <coughs> so we did, and we continued on. And uh, <coughs> before long, a guy is calling me on the radio. <coughs> Probably before we resumed moving, when I first got into this tank, said that there was a magnetic mine on the top of the turret, resting on the birdcage. And I, I, how the hell could it be there? There was no Japanese around. But I figured I'd better take a look. And if it is there, push it the hell off. So I opened the hatch, and what was there was a Kodak 16 millimeter movie camera. The, this was the tank, as it turned out, to which I had assigned, as a gunner, an official naval photographer who was a Marine, and he was a member of my company, but he he was an Israel photographer by trade before he joined the Marines. A little older than most of the guys. Corporal Shutt. And we had fixed a bracket on his periscope that would hold the camera with a lens right up against the periscope. And it could be working automatically while he's shoveling shells under the 75 millimeter gun. This thing could be turning. We got an awful lot of pictures of the ground and the sky, <laughs> but occasionally we got some good ones. And uh, anyway, he was the guy I displaced in this tank when I transferred, and he had took his camera with him, and in his haste to leave the tank, he left the camera on the outside of the tank. So I pulled that in, and now we resumed our attack. And we'd gone another few hundred yards when the tank I'm now in hit an anti-tank mine and blew the track off and now we have we're, we have to evacuate. 
So we did evacuate, and I got in a third tank. And we continued the attack. We didn't have too much further to go at that point. We over, but the I called for the artillery time fire. It never came because it's an it was an ideal thing to do because it couldn't hurt the tanks. Yeah, the tanks can operate under the time fire. We'd experimented with that back at Camp Pendleton, and it's in a tank. It sounds like rain on a tin roof, as the shrapnel sitting all over the tank, but it does no damage. But they never some, something happened. and We didn't have it, but we were able. We didn't need it. Where there we here we were with about twelve tanks in the midst of this probably several hundred Japanese artillery people, mortar people, machine gun people, but nothing that could really hurt us. Again, it was something like in that cut through the mountain or the hill. So we we just kept rolling over the area until the infantry caught up with us. Now they could come because the Japanese couldn't do much firing. And we've destroyed, as far as I know, all of the weapons that they had, all of the artillery pieces and mortars and machine guns, as well as the Japanese themselves. We, we kept them down until the infantry arrived, and the infantry finished the job. And that was the third day. The rest of the time was kind of a blur. Of course, we had about 27, 28 more days of fighting. I remember on the 4th of July, we landed the 15th of June. The 4th of July, we had a big push, and the, uh, the Army had just flown in to that Slido airfield. Uh, a squadron of uh, P4, well, we talked about them, the, the Republic Thunderbolts. P 47s. P 47s, right. And they, we were. The first time I saw rockets fired from the wings of an airplane, and they, we, we were attacking in one direction, the whole fourth division, and the planes came in from the opposite direction, and we, we were firing artillery, and they came in very low, and they just went this way, with the wings, instead of being horizontal, were vertical, and they went right through the artillery fire. I was sure someone would get hit. They, they weren't, but they were firing rockets at Japanese possessions, positions, and I never forgot that. One other incident that I remembered very well was the, uh, we were in a little town, the tanks had gone in with an infantry battalion into a little uh, village called Cha Cha, Cha Cha Village, I think was the name of it, C-H-A, C-H-A. That's what it was on the map. And it was down in a sort of a canyon. And we were receiving uh, Japanese artillery fire going into the town, so we figured we better get the hell in there and destroy it. And we got there, the tanks with some of the infantry riding on top of them, down into this little canyon. And there was a whole village. And, and we're looking, we can't find a thing. I jumped out of my tank. And Bob Reed and his tank are right next to I'm standing about as far as from here to that the to the entrance to this room, right, you know, about mm, ten feet. Ten or feet or so. Yeah. From a house. The house is all around. I didn't see it, but there's a guy under the house rolled a hand grenade. And it Reed said I forgot what the hell he said, but it was he was telling me to get the, to move, but I didn't hear him. He jumped out of his tank and grabbed me and pulled me away. As he was doing it, this hand grenade hit my foot, but it was a dud. Never went off. Oh my goodness. If it had gone off, it would probably killed both of us, but as it turned out, it didn't hurt anybody. So we, we, that was one of the things I remember. So many things happened and that all run together, sort of. But the one thing that uh, everybody who was there, remembers is the Japanese civilians throwing themselves off the cliffs into the ocean below. Yeah. And we had it same thing on Tinian the last day of that campaign. Now um, 
when you're in the field like that, are they doing any awards in the field when the campaign's over? No, all, all that's done which is done afterwards. Uh -huh. And but certainly, with the success you had in those two uh, battles, there was some acknowledgement of how good the tank. I got the did. Navy Cross for for the first day, the second day. The no, I got it really for the the battle, the third one, in third the day, third day. The uh, third. and the, the Navy Cross sort of describes what happened. And back on Maui, I didn't know I'd gotten it, of course, but we were in Maui, on Maui, and uh, I'd been back there a couple of months. We, I think we spent three months on Maui before we went to Iwo Jima. After Tin, this was after Tinian, and Tinian followed Saipan. So that's how long it takes some of these things to, to happen. And I was, I'd been in a Jeep that had blown a, uh, had a blowout going around a steep curve called, believe it or not, Dead Man's Curve <laughs> on Maui, not in combat. Uh -huh. And it, it wrecked my left hip, and so I'd spent some time in a, in the only hospital on the island was an Army MASH hospital, one of the very first ones, MASH Danny for Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. They were on their way to the Philippines, but they were diverted to Maui to be the hospital for, uh, you have 20,000 Marines there, even though they're not in combat, they need a hospital. Some, there's always a few who need to be in a hospital. Yeah. And that's where I was, and uh, recuperating from this blowout and this, the, the hip surgery. And it's, all of a sudden, I'm, a, I'm a, on a crutch by this time, mobile. I'm, I can walk around, but only with crutches. There's a bugle blowing whatever they blow when the commanding general comes in. Uh -huh. And then there's a the division sergeant major, I recognized his voice, saying that something like, everybody attention to General Clifton P. Cates, commanding general, 1st Marine Division. And in comes General Cates with a cute little Hollywood starlet on his, his arm. He's part of a USO troop that's come out to cheer us, I guess. And he comes over. He's at the head of this ward now, and we're all standing there wondering what the hell's going on. And the sergeant major now reads from a big scroll he has that uh, the general is here to present the Navy Cross to Major Robert M. Neiman. And then he reads the, the, the whole citation. And then this, the general the sergeant major signal for me to come up, and we, General I shook hands, and he pinned the Navy Cross on me, and this cute little thing gave me a big hug and kiss, and threw it <laughs> from here to here. And the general said a few words. I've forgotten what he said now, but we were already friends prior to that. And uh, then the uh, sergeant major said something else to indicate that the event is over. The bugler blew whatever he blows. <laughs> The entourage turned around and left, and I'm standing there with this metal pinned to my shoulder or on my shirt. Good story. Well, did you train then on Saipan for the invasion of Tinian? Exactly. We we stayed on Saipan about three weeks after the battle was over, training, re-equipping as much as we could for the uh, Tinian landing. And for Tinian, we went aboard three large landing craft that are called LCTs, landing craft tanks, what that stands for. They're much bigger than the LCMs, which would take one tank at a time. LCT could take about six or so. So we had three of them. And the landing, Tinian was almost a perfect campaign. Casualties were very low. Not that the Japanese didn't have troops there but it was a very well planned and very well executed campaign. And the main thing was it fooled the Japanese. They only, there was really only one suitable landing beach on Tinian, and it was the, the, the main city, on, it wasn't a city, it was the town, it was called Tinian Town. And uh, Tinian Town, there was a lovely beach, and a, but there was a hill behind it, kind of like an amphitheater. And we, one of the things that made the landing or the campaign so great is every 
regimental battalion commander and each tank company commander had an opportunity, I think I mentioned this to you, to for aerial reconnaissance of the island. You were in SPDs or something? We, uh, yes, in an SPD. And, uh, what, no, TBM. TBM. Torpedo bomber. Okay. Um, I was lying flat on my stomach looking out the bomb hole with a map and a plastic cover and a grease pencil. Mm -hmm. And I knew before we ever landed where we could go, where we couldn't go, and that we could go to almost any part of the island. This is almost all flat, few hills, but I could, no swamps as far as I could see. Anyway, that was one reason the operation was so successful, because I've never heard of that happening on any other. Another thing was, instead of landing at Tinian Town, where most everybody would have thought we would land, the opposite end of the island, far end, there was a very, very small beach, too narrow for more than about a company at a time to get across, and a lot of coral. But the division, they decided instead of landing both divisions on D-Day, they would just land the first, the one division, 4th Marine Division would land one battalion at a time instead of four battalions. And uh, my tanks were assigned to go in a reserve position because uh, the, the regimental combat team, the 23rd RCT, was scheduled to, to be the, the reserve battalion, but they were one they were in, in, in column, one, two, three. So we didn't land early. We landed late in the day, and there was a previously designated area where my tanks were supposed to bivouac that first night. It was a wooded area, and we went in there thinking we're, we're in the first time we've been in reserve. <laughs> and we figured this is real easy. And we were in this wooded area. You couldn't see a thing because it's heavily wooded. And I'm up front. I'm out of my tank. I'm standing beside the radio jeep that my communication sergeant is in charge of. And we're, I forgot what we were discussing, but something had to do with what we're going to do at the moment. And all of a sudden, from all around us, machine guns open up. And that, that was the, one of the most perilous times, I think, that I have ever was in combat. I hit the deck, of course, as everybody else who was standing around did. But most of my tank crews are out of their tanks. And I can't talk to them on the radio anyway, because every time I put my hand up to get the mic on the radio jeep, machine gun holes would appear in the jeep. And I'm stuck. I don't know what the hell to do. I figured this is it. You know, we're, we're surrounded by Japanese machine gunners. What are we going to do about it? I can't talk to anybody because, as I said, the minute I picked myself up high enough to talk in that jeep, machine gun opened up. Fortunately, and how come I don't know, I was not hit. Finally, I was able to reach the um, microphone somehow or other. And the only guy I could get to respond was platoon leader English. But I got him. He was maybe a hundred yards further back in the woods in his tank. So we agreed in our conversation. He'd get his tank and any other tanks he could up here in a hurry. And he did in, in a matter of uh, probably a half hour, 45 minutes, we destroyed whatever machine guns were in the woods. And they were gone. But this, we were in a reserve position. <laughs> and I came closer to being killed than any other time. That night, the Japanese counterattacked with a big bonsai. We were still in reserve. The infantry took care of it. And in the morning, there were th probably several thousand dead Japanese piled up in front of the infantry, including about a half a dozen Japanese tanks. The tanks, Japanese tanks were not very effective. They, uh, you could stop them with a bazooka, and the infantry had bazookas. 50 caliber machine guns could probably hurt them. And uh, the Japanese used them at night. They made a night attack on these tanks, from these tanks, 
with with uh, Japanese officers, probably not tank officers, but infantry officers, with samurai swords riding on the tops of the tanks, waving their swords, yelling "Banzai, Banzai, death to Marines" and all that kind of stuff. And the Marines just slaughtered them. As far as I know, that was the last Banzai attack. Japanese tribe. We loved them because instead of us having to dig them out, we sat back and shot them like fish in a barrel, so to speak. And my company had no part in this. We're just, but even so, one of my men, a good Marine, lost a leg that night. Some Japanese projectile of some sort came into our positions and just by luck hit his leg. And I'll tell you an interesting story about years later. He's dead now, but uh, he survived, got married, married his Navy nurse. I had two guys that, who lost legs who did the same thing, married their Navy nurse. And he was in the insurance business in San Francisco. And one of my men, Dick Turpin, whom I may have told you about, who, who was the real, wound up as real estate editor of the LA Times. He and this guy, whose name was Carlson, were very good friends. They were at the Marines Memorial Club in San Diego, I mean in San Francisco, sometime many years later, as civilians. But as Marines, of course. And they and their wives were there for dinner, drinks and dinner. And they uh, they went to, they, he, uh, Carlson, the guy who had the artificial limb, and uh, um, that was Dick, Dick Turpin walked into the men's room and Carlson is telling Turpin, he said, this damn leg, he was referring to his artificial leg, it's got to be readjusted, it hurts like hell, I'm going to take it off for a minute. So he took off his leg, Turpin told me this later, I wasn't there, and he laid his leg against the sink and when he's standing there massaging his knee, apparently, and a guy, I guess a former Marine or a Marine, I don't know whom, a guy came in, pretty loaded, and he saw this leg sitting there up against the sink. He said, oh, and he beat it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Carlson lost that leg that night during that bonsai attack, and I never did understand how it happened, but it did. Well, with Tinian then pretty much wrapped up. Where do you go to train for Back to Maui. For Iwo Jima? Now, what things are going on with your tanks now? Have they upped the caliber of the guns yet? No, the, the guns are, they never were in World War II. They were never any bigger than what we had, which was 75s. Mm -hmm. The Army in Europe had some, 70, some very high velocity 76 millimeter guns that had a, a a uh, contraption on the end of the of the barrel, the muzzle, to uh, slow down the. Uh, there was so much power in that 76 that they had to put a muzzle brake to keep it from going through the rear end of the turret after it, after the shell was fired. Uh, we never got those guns, and actually we didn't need them. They wouldn't have helped us very much because there was nothing that. They would have penetrated that a 75 couldn't do that would that we encountered, and and we didn't have enemy tanks that a 75 couldn't destroy. But you do, when you hit Iwo Jima, have flamethrowers finally. That was the big difference. We, I think, I explained earlier that after the uh, Kwajalein, when we're back on Maui, the two tank companies in the battalion that had the M5 light tanks were given medium tanks, Sherman tanks, just like my company had. And we had decided, the, the officers, all this was unofficial, that the poor aftermen carrying those flamethrowers, wouldn't it be good if we could have them in a tank? So the two companies that, uh, my company was not involved because we didn't have any light tanks, two companies that were transferring from light tanks to mediums unofficially kept a few of their light tanks and they were able unofficially to obtain infantry flamethrowers and they put them in the tanks firing the flame out to the uh, the port that they 
normally the uh, bow gunner. You, the, in, the, in the light tank, which was a four-man crew, there was a driver and an assistant driver, also known as a bow gunner or lap gunner. He had a 30 caliber machine gun that sat in his lap, fired out through a, a, a swizzle, swivel out through the front slope plate. And we put the, uh, made him a flame gunner, when I say we, the other two tank companies, gave him a lot of extra tanks, tankfuls of fuel, and he fired through the uh, bow gunner's deal. But they weren't, there were several things still to be desired. First place, it wasn't napalm, it was diesel oil, and it was very hard to aim it just that a blob of fire came out. You wouldn't want to get in the way of it, but it was hard to aim. And secondly, the range was very short. That's one of the reasons we put them in tanks, because the poor infantryman had to crawl right up to a bunker before he could fire his flame to throw because it wouldn't reach. So they made the, the infantry flamethrower guys were very vulnerable. And another thing wrong with it was that, uh, well, it had a short, oh, the range was short, the aim was difficult, and uh, we thought, my God, wouldn't it be great if we had a flamethrower in a medium tank that could fire through the tube with a 75 millimeter gun and could reach much more than 20 yards and accurately. So we put this, we had a meeting between the Army and the Marines and the Navy, the Navy involved because the Seabees and the Army engineers and the CBs got together and did a lot of uh, engineering and experimenting. They developed uh, the, the ideal weapon. It could fire burning napalm accurately 100 to 150 yards. It would fire through the tube of the 75 millimeter gun. You couldn't fire the gun anymore because it had special uh, engineering in it now. But the, uh, it went through that tube and you, the, the gunner who would be firing it, Go ahead. the gunner who would be firing it could aim the napalm, would fire a string of napalm, oh maybe about so big in diameter, like firing from a garden, a high powered garden hose could fire at about 150 yards quite accurately, not pinpoint, but close enough that the gunner could watch for his telescopic sights where the, this napalm was landing. It wasn't lighted yet, it was just a sort of a gray stream. And when he got it, if he was aiming at the aperture of a pillbox, for instance, and it might hit the side of the pillbox, he would, you know, he's, he's, he's aiming it just like it were a 75 millimeter gun. He can move it till it's going right in the aperture, then he pulls a solenoid and it all lights up. And you've got a stream of burning napalm going from the tank right into the hole of this pillbox. It was a great weapon. And we had three in each of the companies, and we had nine in our battalion for the EWO operation. And the battalion commander gave three to each company. So I put one in each platoon. So I now had, instead of five gun tanks in each platoon, had four gun tanks and one flame tank, which we called Zippos. <laughs> and they were worth their weight in gold. So when you land then at Iwo Jima, um, what's the beach like there trying to get in? Well, that's a, you could write a book on just that one, and answering that one question. I know we don't have that much time, but the, uh, before we got to Iwo, after we left Pearl Harbor, we were permitted to open our sealed orders and found out we were going to an island called Iwo Jima, none of us had ever heard of, in the Volcano Islands, 700 miles from Tokyo, much further penetration towards Japan than anything had been done so far. It's a little island, got three airfields on it. One still under construction and two operational. It's uh, about halfway between the Marianas and Tokyo. And uh, 
the Japanese bombers would come down almost nightly from Iwo Jima attacking Tinian and Saipan and even Guam, attacking the B-29s that were based there. By this time, Tinian had become the busiest airfield in the world and uh, remained that till the end of the war. The, uh, anyway, this was the island we're supposed to attack. We don't have much information on it. We're told at the extreme southern end of the island, it's only five and a half miles long and runs also from north to south. The highest point in the island, the most visible terrain feature, is a volcano, not extinct, only slumbering, so to speak, by the name of Tsurubachi. And it's the highest point on the island by far. And it, it is the extreme southern tip of the island. From the base of Tsurubachi, north for about a mile or two, I don't remember now which, it looks like what's a very nice beach on both sides of the island, which is relatively narrow throat of the, the island's shaped like a sort of a pork chop, and this is a narrow part, and then it blossoms out. And on both sides of this narrow port, it looks like a beach. But it's, we, the intelligence report says it's all volcanic ash from Mount Suribachi. But nobody can tell us the consistency of this ash or the depth of it. So we don't know whether we're going to bog down or not. Tankers' concern, more than I think than anything else, is the terrain. Can the tanks maneuver there? Because if a tank loses its mobility, it loses its value. And uh, we didn't know whether we bogged down in this volcanic ash. Is it three inches deep? Is it a foot deep? Is it six feet deep? Is it light? Is it heavy? What's it like? Couldn't find out. And we're concerned about it. Also, along the way, we got aerial. Those, these, we had aerial photographs. Now we get a photograph taken from the periscope of a pretty gutsy U.S. Mer, mer, uh, submarine that was going into about 500 yards of the beach at Iwo and taking pictures. It's submerged, of course, taking pictures from its periscope for it had to back out. And those pictures reveal something that the aerial photos had not, that there were two terraces parallel to each other and parallel to the water line on the beach. First terrace, but there was no, there was no uh, way of gauging how, exactly how far inland they were or how high they were, except they were like giant steps. They, were, they went straight up and then straight up and then out. Two of them. It looked like they were about 10, the first terrace was about 10 to 15 yards inland, maybe 20 yards at the most, from the waterline at the time the picture was taken. And the next terrace was about the same distance inland from the first one. So now we not only are worried about are we going to bog down in the volcanic ash, but if we don't, are we going to be hemmed in onto the beach by these terraces because we couldn't tell if they're eight feet high, which would absolutely block a tank if you have an eight foot wall there, or are they four foot high, which a tank could clamber over, or are they something in between? Also, we got some late aerial photos, later than the original ones, which showed the area from the beach area to the first airfield. Um, Mo, there was an air, the airfields were named Motoyama number one, number two, number three. Motoyama number one was the first day's objective. We were supposed to get there by the end of D-Day. It's about 2,000 yards in from the beach. And the ground is much higher there than at the beach level. It's got, not as high as Sorbachi, but it's up maybe four or five hundred feet, or, or maybe two or three hundred feet. Sorbachi was about six hundred. But uh, it's a fairly steep climb, but it's also all volcanic ash. And now we see that it's full of bomb craters, which apparently were the result of the B-17 B bombings of the island. And wherever they hit in this area where the volcanic ash was, just left huge craters. B-17 
these could be serious tank obstacles as well. We have these three damn things to worry about, plus the Japanese. So I sent, as I had on Saipan, I sent two three-man reconnaissance teams ashore with the first wave. We were to land between where the, the division was going in with two, two regimental combat teams abreast and one in, in, behind. It always was like an inverted triangle. The base of the triangle was up front, the apex was in the rear. So you had two regiments up front, one in, re in reserve, normally, except on Tinian where we went in differently. But um, the, we were assigned to land where the two regimental combat teams joined and land after the third wave before the fourth wave. There's about five minutes between waves. And they never knew for sure when the first wave was going to hit the beach, depending on a lot of circumstances, but it's usually set up for around 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, heavy bombardment going on from about 4 a.m. And uh, so we sent these two reconnaissance teams of three men each, each with a corporal with a walkie-talkie radio on my geared to my command frequency. And they uh, they were to one they were well their mission was immediately on landing these were experienced tankers to tell me on the radio can we land there okay or are we going to bog down if it was the latter they were of course to let me know that and one team was to go to the right and one to the left and search for a suitable place where we could get ashore without bogging down they, they, were to, they went with the first wave, and we were supposed to be in there about 15 minutes later behind the third wave. And uh, first thing that happened, the first wave hit almost immediately. I got the one and only message I received from them. For Christ's sakes, it was like this, it may have been a little different, but something like, for Christ's sakes, don't try to land here, you'll bog down. Don't land till you hear from us. Out. That was not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> but I never got another message. The second wave went in, the third wave went in. We're supposed to go in now, but I don't know what the hell to do. Most frustrating time of my entire life was then and for the next couple of hours. I remembered, I will always remember it as being the most frustrating experience I've ever had. It's obvious that we're needed ashore. It's also obvious that if we go in where we're supposed to go, we're not going to be able to accomplish much. I'm talking Bob Reed, who was my executive officer, is with the RCT commander, a Colonel Wensinger, who had command of the 23rd RCT. At this point, Louis Jones is now assistant division commander of the 1st Marine Division and, and had that job in the Okinawa campaign, which followed this by a month or so. Anyway, uh, Reed is with Wensinger, and Wensinger is telling Reed to tell me to get my tanks in as soon as I can. And I'm telling Reed what the situation is. <coughs> Finally, Reed and I jointly decide, have no choice, just go in where we're supposed to go and hope for the best. <coughs> so we did. I told the skipper, we're on, we're, another thing, I don't know if I mentioned this the other day, we're now not on board LCMs from a landing ship dock, which was the ideal way to go. <coughs> Instead, the Navy had come up with a new ship vessel called Landing Ship Medium. It was neither a ship nor a landing craft. It was a hybrid. We got on board this thing on Maui, and we're still on board it to get off on the beach at Iwo Jima. Only it took four of them for my company, so we're all broken up into four different vessels. They would, they, uh, they were like sort of like an LST, which you probably are familiar with. They had an open well deck, but they were much smaller than an LST, and they would take six tanks in in the column. And I had 18 tanks if you include the tank retriever, so I had three of those. Plus, I had a bunch of trucks, machine, machine shops and stuff on a fourth LSM. 
with my company headquarters and my first sergeant in charge. But the other three, the other two LSMs had platoon leaders of the second and third platoon and their platoons. The third platoon also had the tank retriever. And the first platoon had me besides it. So there were six tanks on each. The second platoon had Bob Reed's tank and somebody else was in it. Reed was with Colonel Wensing in the command boat. So we were uh, circling sort of off, off the beach, well off the beach, wondering when we we're going to go in. Finally, as I said, Reed and I jointly agreed we'd go in and try it. And I tell a skipper, whom I'd gotten to know pretty well by then, Chuck Haber was his name. He was a lieutenant commander. This is his first combat mission. I suggested that he go in to roughly where we were supposed to land, but ease in slowly because we may bog down and block, the first tank might block down and you're not going to be able to get the rest of the tanks off and you don't want to be broached high and dry with five tanks on board. So in his excitement we didn't go in slowly, we slammed into the beach. And now if the Japanese had up until that time not opened up with any of their anti-boat flat trajectory artillery because they didn't want to give their positions away until they had worthwhile targets. And we're a worthwhile target. We're, although we're small for a lotion going ship, we're damn big for a landing craft. <coughs> this LSM had no armor plate and these high trajectory, these flat trajectory high uh, High velocity. High, high velocity. High velocity, thank you. High velocity projectiles going in one side out the other before they explode. So we got a lot of holes all above the water line, but very little damage, if any, other than super superficial. But they really opened up on us. Now we hit the beach hard, the ramp is down, my tank rolls off, and boom. We're right down in a hole in the volcanic ash. My gunnery sergeant and I got out. The gunner sat on the edge of the turret so he could talk to the driver. I had the best tank driver in the battalion, and uh, he was damn good, but between he and Sam Johnson and I, and we each had shovels, we're digging and digging, and he's, we're telling him, the guy who was liaisoning between us, telling him, move it forward, move it back, whatever. But all we're doing is digging a bigger hole. Shells are landing all around us now because we're the first tank to be there, and at least on that part of the beach. And uh, but the volcanic ash, although it hurt us, it also saved us. I, I'm sure because although it caused the tanks to bog down, which was terrible, it also caused the high, high trajectory mortar shells that they were loading all around us to bury themselves in the volcanic ash before they would explode. And so the, you practically had to be hit by a mortar shell to be hurt by it. You could be standing, you could land here and you could be here and it wouldn't hurt you because the shrapnel, which normally went like that, was all in the volcanic ash. That, that's the only reason I can figure that Sam Johnson and I and the guy in the turret were never hurt. Anyway, we screwed around for about 10 minutes trying to get this tank out of the hole. It was just getting worse. So I told Reed, we're going to leave, we're going to abandon the tank, we're going to take the breech block of the gun, we're going to lock the tank, we're going to go back off the beach and look for another place to land, which is what we attempted to do, except the damn LSM is broached. It just barely has propeller in water. And, but the skipper, he did a pretty skillful job. He eventually got us off the beach. In the meantime, about 20 or so badly wounded Marines have crawled aboard this LSM. And the, 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 the whole idea of the, of the handling of the wounded on Iwo Jima, the plan was each battalion aid station was on an LST 
anchored several thousand yards off the beach with pontoons on the side. And the landing craft, as they re after they discharged Marines or cargo on the beach, were to take wounded back to the nearest uh, aid station, the nearest LST that was anchored off there. And there would be people there standing on the pontoons to lift the wounded off and enter the LST. So the skipper tells me, and I couldn't argue this, before he does anything else, he's going to get these wounded Marines back to an LST. So that took about a half an hour. We went back, and I'm, I'm so frustrated. I, you know, talk about being between a rock and a hard place. This is it. I don't know what the hell to do. I want to get my tanks ashore where they're needed, and I don't know how that we're going to do it. Meanwhile, we unload the wounded, a couple of whom died en route, as I recall. Got the rest off, got them all off, even the dead ones, and headed back to the beach. Now, the skipper says, where do you think we should go? And I said, your guess is as good as mine. Just pick a spot, but ease into it this time. We're not going to run any tanks off until my gunnery sergeant and I have a chance to reconnoiter on foot. So he eased it in very slowly to some spot. I don't know where the hell we were, but it wasn't the same spot where we were originally. And Sam Johnson, the gunnery sergeant, and I got off with, with uh, shovels, and we're kind of digging around. And it's just as bad as where we bogged down before. We realized any tank that goes off the LSM is going to bog down at the edge of the ramp. And this was the, my, the point of my deepest frustration. It's hard for me to describe today how I felt then, except I was at wit's end. I didn't know what the hell to do. Just then, like manna from heaven, here comes Corporal Jewell running with a big grin on his face. He was the only survivor of the six-man reconnaissance, the two or three-man reconnaissance teams. He was the corporal in charge of one of them. He's the guy who called me, as I recall, on the phone. Don't land here. But his, his uh, walkie-talkie had been shot out of his hand. And the other, three, the other five guys were dead by this time. I didn't know it until then. But he said, he's running with a big grin, I've got a place where he can land. And the two places where you can get over these two terraces. I went from the lowest I've ever been in my life to the highest, I think, in just a flash of a couple of seconds. So I grabbed him. We went aboard the LSM. We backed, the skipper backed off. I took him up, uh, Jewel, up to the bridge. And he showed the skipper exactly where to land. And meanwhile, I radioed the, th the other two platoon leaders, besides the one who was with me, the two other LSMs on which I had my tanks, telling them exactly what we we're going to do. We're going to land where Jewel says we can land in single file. And as soon as we were, we've landed, the second platoon is to come in immediately, and then the third platoon follow us in our tracks. Don't move off of them, because you can either bog down or hit a mine. Just follow us. And that's exactly what we did. We, we uh, Jewel ran off in front of my tank, uh, down the beach to the right, I'd say maybe 50 yards, and sure enough, there was a spot on the terrace that had been blown down by probably 16 or 14 inch naval gunfire so that a tank could clamber over it. Jewel climbed over it, we climbed over it, then we went back the other direction, maybe 50 or 60 more yards, and the second terrace had a spot just like that. Jewel climbed over that when my tank climbed over it. Meanwhile, it's kind of like a snake dance. The tanks are following in single file. And the Marines all over the place, some are dead and some are alive, some are advancing, some are not. We went on for a while where Jewel is now guiding us around these damn bomb craters. And we get to a point where I see the Marines, and they're all around, are flat on their stomachs and they're not moving. And that can mean only one thing. If they do move, they're going to get shot. And we could, I could see about 200 yards ahead. It was hard to see them, but you could spot them if you look carefully. Looking through my glasses through a periscope, there's a line of pillboxes about, I'd say, 
50, 75 yards between each pillbox. And I could see seven or eight of them spread across the whole front. They're low, they're not more than about so high above the volcanic ash. They're the same color as the volcanic ash. But they're up, the, the, the grade of the hill was about like this. And they're up here and we're about down here. They could not depress the tubes of their machine guns long enough to get to hit Marines who were hugging the deck at this point. But any Marine who stood up would get it. That's why they're all down the way they were. But this was this was heaven sent. Here again, like what I described on Saipan, we're 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 made for this kind of an operation. There's nothing in those pillboxes that could hurt us, and we had everything that could destroy them. And we immediately, through the radio, we got everybody doing what they were supposed to do. Find out the, the most devastating of all were the flamethrowers, I think. We only had three of them. And uh, Shutt, fortunately, got the best picture that he took during the whole war in his movie camera. The flame tank, one of them was right behind his tank. And this was later, I saw it for the first time, many years later, on Victory at Sea, or one of those types of programs. You could see the arc of this orange clubbed flame going about 100 to 150 yards, hitting on a pillbox, going right inside the aperture. Coming out of the rear end of the pillbox were two Japanese, who were the two occupants of the pillbox. They said, we're going in this direction. The pillboxes are across here. They start running in this direction. Their, their shirts are flame. And you can see on the volcanic ash behind them, machine gun bullets that are just moving right, right behind them and up into them and down they went. Probably did before they ever hit the ground. But we spent about, I don't know how long, I don't know, even know what time of day it was, except it was still light. But we spent whatever time was necessary cleaning out these seven or eight pillboxes that were across the front that we were attacking. Then with the Marines who were on the ground, they got up and followed us up to the edge of the airfield. And by that time it was getting dark. And that was D-Day on Iwo Jima. So you made it to the airfield? We made it to the airfield. And uh, the, uh, it was a very interesting event occurred the next day we have time, I can tell you about it. The, uh, we encountered for the first time the worst weapon that we would ever run into, the worst from our point of view, against us. The uh, Japanese had removed all of their airplanes that were not destroyed before we ever landed. But they had a hell of a lot of ammunition left, particularly aerial bombs. And had our landing been two or three weeks later, we may, might never have made it, in my opinion, because they didn't have time to complete what they started to do when they moved, moved their planes. They were creating minefields of aerial bombs buried vertically with a, uh, an anti-tank mine on the nose. The, the, this, would, this would be ground level. and. Uh, they had them, they were smart enough that they had a magnificent general commanding the Japanese. And he figured out the terrain was so terrible, tanks could only go in a few places. And those are the places he buried these mines. Except in the two airfields, tanks could easily go. And he didn't have time to put a minefield across both of them. He started. And, uh, I had never heard anything about that, of course. The second morning on Iwo Jima, we're moving across the first airfield, tanks out in front, infantry right behind. And uh, we're, my tanks are in a, in a line, and in a, we had a formation, sort of a shallow inverted V. And I would be at the center of the V, which gave me observation of all my tanks. 
if it were a straight line, some of them I couldn't see. So it was something like this. And we, we just started out. Japanese, the Marines behind us, one of my best friends, a Marine, an infantry company commander, uh, was about 20 feet behind my tank as we were starting out. The mortar shell hit right next to him, and apparently he's now on the runway. If he'd been in the, in the volcanic ash, he might not have been killed. But this shrapnel just tore through him. I saw him looking at him, I saw it happen. Down he went, dead probably also before he hit the ground. But we're moving across the airfield. The Marines are taking a lot of fire, and we're looking for targets to fire at. Not too many, because you couldn't see these guys are all on the ground. And all of a sudden, I hear and see a tremendous explosion, and it's the third tank to my right. It was part of the first platoon. Platoon Sergeant Bruno was in command, Joe Bruno. And I see, I've never seen this before or since for that matter, the turret went one way, the chassis went another, and a body flew out of the turret, landed about 30 feet away, which was Bruno, by the way, who survived. He's still alive. He had a fractured skull and a broken back, but he lived, and they rescued him. But there was, of the other four men in the tank, three were dead, but the gunner of that tank was still in the turret. But the turret rolled over his leg. He was pinned inside the turret with his leg partly sticking out. And of course, in terrible, terrible pain. And uh, he's alive, too. I'm going to have to stop this for a second. Sure.